Harper Audio presents The Perks of Loving a Scoundrel by Jennifer McQuiston Performed by Lana J. Weston From the Diary of Miss Mary Channing, May the 24th, 1858. Eleanor wrote today. I should have been glad to hear from her, given that she is my twin sister and I love her dearly, but it would be untruthful to say the contents of her letter pleased me. Her new husband, Lord Ashington, has been called away on business, and she's asked me to come to London to keep her company during the last two months of her confinement. Can you imagine? Me, in London. My family says I must get my nose out of my books and begin to live in the world around me. It is true I have never been further afield than a day trip from home and that I have never slept a night outside my own bed. But why would I ever want to leave when I have my books to keep me company? And a trip to London is not without its perils, I could very well end up like one of the characters in my beloved stories, snubbed by the popular crowd, whispered about behind lace fans, or worse, led astray by a handsome villain and then abandoned to my fate. Yet how could I not go? Eleanor is my sister, and she needs me. So I shall put on a brave face, pack a trunk, smile, if I must, but I can't help but wonder which worries me more. The many things that could happen in London, or the thought of seeing Eleanor with her handsome new husband and her shining, lovely life, and everything I am afraid of wanting. Chapter 1 London, May the 29th, 1858 the smell should have been worse. She'd expected something foul, air made surly by the summer heat. Just last week, she'd read about the Thames, that great, roiling river that carried with it the filth of the entire city and choked its inhabitants to tears. Her rampant imagination, spurred on by countless books and newspaper articles, had conjured a city of fetid smells, each more terrible than the last. But as Miss Mary Channing opened her bedroom window and breathed in her first London morning, her nose filled with nothing more offensive than the fragrance of flowers. Disconcerted, she peeked out over the sill. Dawn was just breaking over the back of Grosvenor Square. The gas lights were still burning, and the windows of the other houses were dark. By eight o'clock, she imagined industrious housemaids would be down on their knees, whiting their master's stoops. The central garden would fill with nurses and their charges, heading west toward Hyde Park. But for now the city, and its smells, belonged solely to her. She breathed in again. Was she dreaming? Imagining things as she was often wont to do. She was well over two hundred miles from home, but it smelled very much like her family's ornamental garden in Yorkshire. She didn't remember seeing a garden last night, but then she had arrived quite late, the gaslight shadows obscuring all but the front steps. She'd been too weary to think, so sickened by the ceaseless motion of the train, that she'd not even been able to read a book, much less ponder the underpinnings of the air she breathed. She supposed she might have missed a garden. Good heavens, she probably would have missed a funeral parade, complete with an eight-horse coach and a brass band. After the long, tiresome journey, she'd only wanted to find a bed. And yet now, at five o'clock in the morning, she couldn't sleep. Not on a mattress that felt so strange 
and not in a bedroom that wasn't her own. Pulling her head back inside, she eyed the four-poster bed with its rumpled covers and profusion of pretty pillows. It was a perfectly nice bed. Her sister, Eleanor, had clearly put some thought into the choice of fabrics and furniture. Most women would love such a room, and most women would love such an opportunity. Two whole months in London, with shops and shows and distractions of every flavour at their fingertips. But Mary wasn't most women. She preferred her distractions in the form of a good book, not shopping on Regent Street. And these two looming months felt like a prison, not paradise. The scent of roses lingered in the air, and as she breathed in, her mind settled on a new hope. If there was a flower garden she might escape to, a place where she might read her books and write in her journal, perhaps it would not be so terrible. Picking up the novel she had not been able to read on the train, Mary slipped out of the strange bedroom, her bare feet silent on the stairs. She had always been an early riser, waking before even the most industrious servants back home in Yorkshire. At home, the cook knew to leave her out a bit of breakfast, bread and cheese wrapped in a napkin, but no one here would know to do that for her, yet. Ever since she'd been a young girl, morning had been her own time, quiet hours spent curled up on a garden bench with a book in her lap, nibbling on her pocket repast, the day lightening around her. The notion that she might still keep to such a routine in a place like London gave her hope for the coming two months. She drifted down the hallway until she found a doorway that looked promising, solid oak, with a key still in the lock. With a deep breath, she turned the key and pulled it open. She braced herself for knife-wielding brigands, herds of ragged street urchins, hands rifling through her pockets, the sort of London dangers she'd always read about. Instead, the scent of flowers washed over her like a lovely, welcome tide. Oh, thank goodness. She hadn't been imagining things, after all. Something hopeful nudged her over the threshold of the door, then bade her to take one step, then another. In the thin light of dawn, she saw flowers in every colour and fashion, blood-red rose blooms, a cascade of yellow flowers dripping down the wrought iron fence, her fingers loosened over the cover of her book. Oh, but it would be lovely to read here. She could even hear the light patter of a fountain beckoning her deeper. But then she heard something else above those pleasant, tinkling notes. An almost inhuman groan of pleasure. With a startled gasp, she spun around. Her eyes swam through the early morning light to settle on a gentleman on the street, some ten feet or so away, on the other side of the wrought iron fence. But the fact of their separation did little to relieve her anxiety, because the street light illuminated him in unfortunate, horrific clarity. He was urinating. Through the fence onto one of her sister's rose bushes. The book fell from Mary's hand. In all her imaginings of what dreadful thing she might encounter on the streets of London, she'd never envisioned anything like this. She ought to bolt. She ought to scream. She ought to... Well, she ought to at least look away. But as if he was made of words on a page, her eyes insisted on staying for a proper read. His eyes were closed, his mouth open in a grimace of relief. Objectively, he was a handsome mess, lean and long-limbed, a shock of dishevelled blonde hair peeking out from his top hat. But handsome was always a matter of opinion, and this one had villain stamped on his skin.
As if he could hear her flailing thoughts, one eye cracked open, then the other. Oh, oh, would you look at that, Grant? I've an audience, it seems. Somewhere down the street, another voice rang out. Piss off! A snigger followed. Oh, wait, you already are. <laughs> Cork it, you sodding fool! The blonde villain shouted back. Can't you see we're in the presence of a lady? He grinned. Apologies for such language, love. Though, given the way you are staring, perhaps you don't mind. He rocked back on his heels, striking a jaunty pose, even as the urine rained down. If you come a little closer, I'd be happy to give you a better peek. Mary's heart scrambled against her ribs. She might be a naive thing, fresh from the country, and she might now be regretting her presumption that it was permissible to read a book in a London garden in her bare feet, but she wasn't so unworldly that she didn't know this one pertinent fact. She was not, under any circumstances, coming a little closer. Or getting a better peek. Mortified, she wrapped her arms about her middle. I, that is, couldn't you manage to hold it? She somehow choked out. There, she'd managed a phrase, and it was a properly scathing one too, as good as any of her book's heroines might have done. A grin spread across his face, much like the puddle at the base of the rose bush. Well, love, the thing is, I'm thinking I'd rather let you hold it. The stream trickled to a stop, though he added a few more drips for good measure. He shook himself off and began to button his trousers. But, alas, it seems you've waited too long for the pleasure. He tipped a finger to the brim of his top hat in a sort of salute. My friend awaits... Perhaps another time? Mary gasped, or rather, she squeaked. She could manage little else. He chuckled. It seems I've got a shy little mouse on my hands. Well, squeak, squeak, run along then. He set off down the street, swaying a bit. But I'll leave you with a word of advice, Miss Mouse, he tossed back over one shoulder. You're a right tempting sight, standing there in your unutterables. But you might want to wear shoes next time you ogle a gentleman's prick. Never know when you'll need to run. Geoffrey Westmore, West to his friends, and that damned Westmore to his enemies, sauntered down the sidewalk, still chuckling over the brown-haired mouse of a woman he'd frightened back into her house. West hadn't recognised her, but then Lord Ashington had only established his household there a few short months ago. West tended to sleep during the hours domesticated souls roamed the streets, which meant he had no idea who she was. Certainly not Lady Ashington, who was reported to be somewhat increasing. Although, could anyone be somewhat increasing? It was really rather an all-or-nothing phenomenon. This woman had most definitely not been increasing. He might still be drunk from last night's misadventures, but he wasn't so deep into his cups he had overlooked the lithe little form lurking beneath that virginal white cotton. Lady Ashington's maid, most likely, given the early hour probably charged with filling the vases with fresh flowers before her mistress awoke. No one who could reasonably avoid it would be up at this hour. No one except him, that was. He had yet to find his bed. He sidestepped a lamplighter, extinguishing the gaslight flames along the square, then followed the vocal trail of his good friend, Charles Grant, who was singing loud enough to wake the dead, not to mention the good citizens of Mayfair. Ye rake hell so jolly, who hate melancholy, and love a full flask and a doxy. He found Grant standing in front of Cardwell House, pissing on an azalea bush.
Damn it! Have a care where you aim. West growled, shaking his head in disgust. Who ne'er from love's feats like a coward retreats? Grant. But Grant was swinging into his favorite part of the chorus now. No matter that he sounded like a wounded dog, he lifted his face to howl at the now absent moon. Afraid that the harlot shall pox ye. Annoyed for reasons that had little to do with either of their gloriously drunken asses, West careened into him, sending Grant staggering straight into his puddle of piss. What was that for? Grant cried, shaking off his shoes. That is my family's bush you're pissing on. Well, then consider yourself fortunate. I didn't crap on it instead. Grant grinned. Although speaking of bushes. He craned his neck down the street, squinting against the new sun. What was that you were saying about a lady? West frowned. Usually, he found his friend's drunken antics and irreverently foul mouth amusing, a side effect he supposed of having survived their Harrow boarding school bullies and an ill-advised turn in the Royal British Navy together. One tended to bond over months spent on board a ship in the Crimea, commiserating about the bloody purpose of that terrible war. With a friend like Grant, you learn to enjoy your amusements where you could find them. This, however, was not one of those times. She's not interested in either of us, you stupid sod. Whoever she was, West hoped she would learn from this little experience and make sure she was properly dressed for her next turn about the garden. He'd done her a favor, teasing her like that. Not every drunken soul she met on the street could be counted on to act the gentleman. Grant took a reeling step backward in the direction of Lord Ashington's house. I reckon I could change her mind. Christ, haven't you had enough of women tonight? West squinted at his friend. You've just spent six hours in one of the most exclusive brothels in London. You didn't come out of that last room for three hours. I should know, given that I was forced to wait for you. Grant swept his top hat from his head, revealing tangled black hair in need of a barber's shears. Ah, yes, the fair Vivian. He placed his hat across his chest and raised his eyes in a parody of prayer. Lovely feet she had. West snorted. He might be a bit torched himself, but it wasn't a woman's feet that usually interested him. Perhaps Grant was drunker than he thought. So surely you are sated by now. He took Grant's arm and pointed him toward home. Off you go then. Time to sleep. My friend, tomorrow's another day. You're a good chap, West. Grant nodded, as if coming to this conclusion for the first time. Though in truth, it was an oft-repeated soliloquy, usually launched from the bottom of a bottle. The very best. You deserve better than a friend like me. So you keep saying. West grinned in spite of his annoyance. Friends forever, eh? Friends forever. Grant pulled a rolled cigarette from his jacket pocket and waved it about. But just in case forever ends too soon, before I go, do you think you could give me another light? West dutifully reached into his jacket pocket and produced the small silver case that contained his matches. He rarely smoked himself, not that anyone knew it, reeking of Grant's cigarettes as he so often did. His sisters were always haranguing him about the habit, one he and Grant had picked up in Crimea. But an occasional cigarette with Grant was a welcome source of camaraderie when his demons closed in. Grant was one of the few people who understood West. They knew each other's faults and tolerated each other's vices. Each owed the other his very life. One couldn't ask for a better friend, unless that was it was a friend who remembered to carry his own matches.
Then again, he supposed he took enough swigs from the hip flask Grant always carried about to call it an even trade. Grant lit his cigarette and took a long, enthusiastic pull, then tipped his head back, exhaling a grey stream of smoke. Shall we meet up at White's later this evening? Of course. West hesitated. But we'll have to fit two nights of carousing into one. Tomorrow night I've promised my sister Claire... something. Something important to do with the hospital charity she and her physician husband Daniel supported. And as soon as he sobered up, he felt sure he would remember what it was, too. Seems to me we always fit two nights of carousing into one. Grant laughed like a maniac. Then again, we've our fulsome reputations to maintain. He staggered on his merry way down the sidewalk, a fine trail of smoke lingering behind him. West climbed the front steps of Cardwell House, weariness dragging him by the stones. He fumbled in his pocket for his house key, but before he could unlock the door, it swung open. Wilson, the Cardwell family butler, loomed in the doorway, an old-fashioned candlestick in one hand. Wilson, old chap! West leaned against the doorframe. You are up bloody early. The butler frowned. Pity we cannot say the same about you, Master Geoffrey. Well, aren't you full of piss and vinegar this morning? West looked from right to left, then leaned closer. Not me, though. I left all my piss on Ashington's roses. I see you've been out drinking with Mr. Grant again. Wilson lifted the flickering candle higher, as if he was assessing the state of what had shown up, again on the doorstep. No visible blood, I can see. An improvement over last week, at least. Grant spent the evening bedding, not brawling. West fought off a yawn. And as we've long discussed, I don't need you to wait up for me. Someone must. Wilson's frown deepened. Otherwise, you'll be sleeping on the steps again. The neighbours are still talking about that. Although he was close to seventy and starting to stoop, the butler shoved a shoulder beneath West's arm and began to steer them both toward the dark staircase, the guttering candle held out to light their way. I'll just get you upstairs, then wake the scullery maid and have her bring you up a pot of coffee. No. West's boot fumbled on the first step. Not coffee. God, no. He was finally, finally tired enough to contemplate sleep. No need to wake anyone. I would prefer to just close my eyes for a few minutes, if you don't mind. Sleep away the day again, you mean. West gave Wilson a pitiful look as they began to climb the stairs. The old butler held West's furtive ability to sleep in one gnarled, aging hand. With one word, the man could have the drapes in West's bedroom drawn tight and order all household activity near his bedroom to cease, or he could direct an entire army of servants at Cardwell House to troop in. Time to clean the chimney, or beat the rug, as the man had ordered last week. He held his pout until Wilson offered a long-suffering sigh. As you wish. Shall I wake you later, Master Geoffrey? Yes, please, half past three, per usual, if you would. He fought off a yawn. I'm to meet Grant at White's again tonight. Yes, Master Geoffrey. West concentrated on placing one foot in front of the other. You do realise you are the only one who calls me that, Master? Geoffrey. Only my family still calls me by my given name. Although Wilson surely qualified as family. He'd been butler to West's father, Viscount Cardwell, for as long as West could remember, and had faithfully served West's grandfather before that. I think I've earned the right to call you whatever I wish.
the butler said, beginning to puff a bit as they neared the top of the staircase. After all, I wiped your nose and your bum when you had your nursemaid too terrified to come near you with your pranks, and I'm the one who waits up worrying for you now. Your parents have long since given up. Wiped my bum? West managed a laugh. Wilson, I am a grown man. One day I shall be Viscount Cardwell. He managed to lift a drunken brow. You ought to treat me with a little more respect. Yes, well, if you would act like a future Viscount, I feel sure I might find it easier to remember you are a future Viscount, Wilson replied in his dry, judging manner. That stung a bit, however well deserved. And so, as they neared the top of the long flight of stairs, West set his foot on the exact right spot on the third step from the top, pressing the heel of his shoe down hard. A long, unmistakable flatulence echoed through the otherwise silent house. The butler jerked still. Wilson, West chortled, you might need to see a doctor about that. The butler heaved a sigh and began to move them upward again. That one was fairly juvenile, Wilson said, even for you. Oh, it's just a bit of fun. That West had painstakingly inserted the inflated bladder beneath the boards yesterday and then waited for the perfect opportunity to unleash its brilliance was something he was somewhat proud of at the moment. Wilson, however, appeared unimpressed, per usual. They reached the top of the staircase and turned left down the dark and silent hallway. If I might speak plainly, Wilson huffed, you need to find something useful to do with your waking hours. When I think of the time you waste planning and executing these ridiculous pranks, cavorting about all night with your friends, stumbling home, reeking of smoke and perfume, he made a disgusted sound. Just imagine the good you could be doing instead. Good, West snorted. Now there's a word one doesn't often hear attached to my name. He stumbled a bit, leaning heavily on Wilson's stooped frame, then laughed. Unless it is used in association with certain nocturnal activities. As they staggered toward his bedroom door, relief swept through him at the thought of his mattress. He half aimed, half fell in the door's direction. Then he threw himself toward his bed, falling face down into the feathered softness with a muffled oomph. It was tempting to just lie there and let the mattress have its way with him, but he rolled over with a groan and hopefully lifted his boot. Wilson stood immobile at the foot of the bed, staring down at him. Why are you still glowering? West protested. I made it home. He tapped the eye he knew was still faintly blackened from last week's pub brawl. Safely, this time. He waved his foot around, but the servant made no move to help him, and the boot remained firmly in place, fitting West's calves as tightly as any glove. Perhaps if you are refusing to offer a hand with my boots, you could summon my valet. And wake the poor man from a sound sleep? Wilson snorted. I think not. He placed the candlestick down on top of the bureau. You terrorize him enough with your laundry, slinking about the gutters and burning holes in everything with those filthy cigarettes. The older man lifted something up from the top of the bureau, fisted in one hand. I want to speak plainly for a moment. After a moment of squinting in the servant's direction, West could see that Wilson was holding up the damned Victoria Cross he had been awarded by the Queen last June for nothing more than stupidity and honest-to-God luck. Grant had nearly wet himself laughing when West had received it, and West was inclined to agree with the sentiment. He needed to stop leaving that bit of frippery out on the bureau top. Made people think he cared about it. 
What do you want with me, Wilson? He groaned. You've been home from Crimea for nearly two years now. Wilson waved the bronze cross about. Returned a proper hero, the world at your feet. But it seems as if you have become one of your own jokes. Don't you care what your family thinks of you? What the world thinks of you? What happened to the boy I knew? The interest you once showed in architectural design when you were at university? You could do, you could be anything you wanted. West closed his eyes and let his head sink back onto his pillow. All I want is sleep, he moaned. And if Wilson refused to help, he would sleep with his boots on. Thank you very much. It wouldn't be the first time, and likely not the last. Master Geoffrey. The voice was stern and disapproving. But West refused to open his eyes. He was a grown man in charge of his own actions, and Wilson was supposed to be his servant. And what was this nonsense about Crimea? His year of service in the Royal Navy was scarcely more than a prank, a glorious, ill-conceived frolic he and Grant had undertaken to impress past and future lovers. Not that he had ever spoken of it to any of them. And he didn't want to talk about it now. What exactly is your point, Wilson? He muttered, wanting only to forget. It was difficult enough to sleep most days without being reminded of the war. You've not resumed your studies since you came back. Mr. Hardwick has sent his assistant around, asking when you might return to your apprenticeship. I had thought you might wish to send him a reply. West rolled his eyes beneath his closed lids. The mention of Philip Hardwick, one of the city's most prominent architects, reminded him too much of his present uselessness. He'd once imagined he might create beauty from chaos, build the sort of soaring ceilings and useful structures that Hardwick designed with such ease. But Crimea had changed all that. West didn't see beauty in such things any more, and destruction was easier to embrace. There is no need, he mumbled, but his words sounded slurred and pathetic, even to his own ears. I'm going to be a viscount, not an architect. Then you might act like it on occasion. You've responsibilities, Master Geoffrey. Your father is no longer a young man, and if you aren't going to resume your education or your apprenticeship, he could use some assistance managing his affairs. You could be learning how to be this viscount you speak of. Instead, you're out carousing every night. Right, making myself useful. Useful to whom, exactly? West cracked open one eye and offered the servant a cheeky grin. Why? To the female species, of course. And I'm a heroic friend to barkeeps and brothel goers everywhere. Now, be a good man and close those drapes. It's getting bloody bright in here. From the Diary of Miss Mary Channing, May the 31st, 1858. How am I to survive these two miserable months? My hope to occasionally escape to the garden and read my books in peace has been sorely dashed. I can't even open my bedroom window now. Every time I smell flowers, I can't help but think of the man from the garden. There is no doubt in my mind I have met a real-life villain. He probably steals from the tithing tray at church, kicks at innocent chickens, and eats small children for breakfast. Well, if I have learned nothing else from books, it is that villains, particularly the handsome ones, must be avoided at all costs. A heroine must be true to herself. Unless her true self can't stop thinking about handsome villains, then she must lock herself inside and pull the drapes. Chapter 2 Must we read another chapter? Mary sighed. 
Normally, she would rather bite off her own tongue than say such a blasphemous thing. The book she was reading aloud to her sister, Villette, by Charlotte Bronte, was interesting enough, but it was difficult not to pray for an end to the current torture, because three feet away on a bedside table, a vase of fresh-cut flowers sneered at her. Every time she took a breath, her nose filled with the scent of roses. Eleanor struggled to find a comfortable sitting position on her bed. Not if you do not wish it. She lowered her bare feet from the pillow, a necessary concession, given that her house slippers had purportedly ceased to fit some time last week. I confess I have already read it. Ashington bought me the book before he left. She smiled dreamily. He thought it would help me pass the time until his return. The sweet dear. He really is the most thoughtful husband. Mary schooled herself not to react to the sound of her brother-in-law's name. It had been this way for two exasperating days: Ashington, this; Ashington, that. Good heavens! The way her sister nattered on about her absent husband, one would think Lord Ashington hung the moon each night and single-handedly paved streets of gold. Mary herself was less than impressed. She couldn't help but think that a properly thoughtful husband might have timed his business trip to avoid his new wife's final days of pregnancy. Irritated by her own irritation, she looked down at her ink-stained fingers, rubbing at a particularly persistent spot on her thumb. She'd spent more time than usual writing in her journal since her arrival, and her fingers bore witness to her boredom. But writing in her journal was preferable to sitting here breathing in rose-scented air. If you have already read it, you should have told me. She felt more than a little cross. We might have chosen to do something different. But I thought you would enjoy it. It is by one of your favourite authoresses, Eleanor. Mary interrupted, her voice coming out sharper than she intended. How long had she been here in London? Two days. It felt. Like a year, since her brief, ill-advised foray into the garden yesterday morning, she'd stayed safely and miserably inside the townhouse. She spent most of her time with her sister, who spent most of her time in bed. And Eleanor's bedroom was beginning to feel as though there ought to be bars on the windows. She looked up, not even sure why she felt so out of sorts. I appreciate your thoughtfulness, Eleanor, but you shouldn't be worrying about me. It is my job to worry about you. I am supposed to be your companion during this confinement. But she wasn't proving very good at it, snapping over kind gestures, unwilling to read a perfectly pleasant book. An apology was needed. Of that, she was sure. But before she could find the words to beg forgiveness for her churlish behaviour, her sister gave a low moan from the bed. Mary jumped from her chair, the book and the flowers and her irritation forgotten. Is everything all right? She placed a hand against Eleanor's forehead, her mind racing with all the things that could be wrong: ruptured spleen, cholera, poisoned by the beef served at luncheon. But one possibility needed no imaginative embellishment to send her stomach twisting. It was at least two months too early for the baby to come. Should I ring for a maid? She asked, worried. Call the doctor. No, the doctor is due to stop by this afternoon anyway, and I. Oof. Eleanor breathed out through her nose, then took up Mary's hand and pressed it against her abdomen. I think the baby is just feeling a bit vigorous today. Mary felt a violent kick beneath her palm and gasped at the force of it. Eleanor offered a thin smile. He is going to be as strapping as Ashington, I fear. Mary hovered, afraid to keep her hand in place, afraid to pull it away. The thump came again, hard enough to startle her. Even though she was anticipating it now, good heavens! How was her sister surviving such an internal assault?
it suddenly occurred to her that a ruptured spleen might not be such a far-fetched notion, after all. She looked up at her sister, studying her face. Eleanor tried to hide her exhaustion behind a veil of happy smiles and rice powder, but the powder couldn't hide the dark smudges beneath her eyes or the way her shoulders hunched forward. Mary was reminded in that moment of how much she didn't know, how much she would never know. She was twenty-six years old, unmarried, and only permitted this terrifying glimpse into impending motherhood because her sister had sought to share it with her. She pulled her hand away from her sister's stomach as the maid came in to announce the doctor's perfectly timed arrival. She still felt shaken by the strength in that kick. She'd read enough about heroines who died in childbirth to know what was at stake here. As they waited for the doctor to be shown up, Eleanor pursed her lips, seeming to sense the shift in her mood. What is the matter? Mary shook her head. Eleanor always teased her about her vivid imagination, and she'd learned long ago to keep such thoughts to herself. It is nothing. Don't lie to me, Mary. Eleanor wagged a finger at her. I've always been able to sense when something is bothering you. That's because you were usually the one doing the bothering. Tell me. Eleanor wiggled her fingers or I shall have to tickle it out of you, as I did when we were children. As if you could catch me in your condition, Mary scoffed, softening her sarcasm with a smile. It is just, aren't you worried about the coming birth? Goodness, what a question! Eleanor shook her head hard enough to set her diamond ear bobs swinging, another gift from dear Ashington, no doubt. Why should I be worried? Mary swallowed her immediate response. Not to put too fine a point on it, but why shouldn't her sister be worried? Books were full of morbid examples of women dying in the most terrible, gruesome ways. Childbirth was but one of the ways a heroine could meet her end. There was also gunshot, consumption, carriage accidents, summer colds, not to mention the ever-popular pox. But those were not the sort of things one said out loud, especially not to a woman in the final stages of her confinement. You could have twins, Mary improvised, trying to steer her own mind away from the worst possible outcome. Or triplets, she leaned forward. I recently read an article in the newspaper where a woman had four babies at once. Eleanor gaped up at her. Honestly, Mary, four babies? At once? I am not a dog delivering puppies, you know. Your imagination is given too much free reign. She rolled her eyes. Too many books, I should say. It isn't that imaginative of an idea, Mary flushed. Multiples are not uncommon. We are twins, after all. She hesitated, wanting to say more. She couldn't tell Eleanor the full direction of her thoughts, not when her imagination always active, thanks to reading so many gothic tales, was insisting on conjuring the spectre of a future without her sister. But she couldn't quite leave it alone, either. She picked up her sister's hand and squeezed it gently. In all seriousness, aren't you afraid of complications? Why must there be complications? Eleanor looked pained by the notion. Childbirth is a very natural process, nothing to fear. I am young and healthy and, most importantly, determined to deliver this child with all due haste. She looked up at the sound of the door opening, a genuine smile replacing her frown. Isn't that right, Dr. Mariel? Mary turned her head to see a handsome man stepping into the room, a light dusting of grey hair peppering the dark hair at his temples. Surprise and dusty memories swept through her. Dr. Mariel had been her family's doctor when she was younger, but he'd moved his practice to London over a decade ago. She hadn't seen him in an age. Dr. Mariel, she gasped. 
The physician set a leather bag down on the bedside table as he smiled at Mary. Miss Channing, what a pleasant surprise to see you again. I trust Lord and Lady Havisham are doing well. The mention of her brother and sister-in-law untangled Mary's tongue and reminded her that this man was a close family friend, no matter that it had been some time since she had seen him. Uh, yes, Patrick and Julianne are doing very well, thank you. She shot her sister an accusing glance. It is just... That is, Eleanor didn't tell me you were her doctor. If you ever came to London, you would have already known it without me telling you, Eleanor answered dryly. I see many patients in Mayfair, Dr. Marriott explained. My wife's family lives just down the street, so it is convenient to check in on Lady Ashington regularly. He turned to Eleanor and picked up her wrist, measuring her pulse. It is good to see you are properly following my orders for bed rest, Lady Ashington, especially after that fainting business last month. Eleanor shrugged meekly. Ashington told me I must follow my doctor's orders, and I always do what Ashington tells me. Mary frowned, and not because of the mention of Lord Ashington's name again. Eleanor had fainted last month, and was under orders for bed rest, good gracious, that was the sort of information one really ought to share with one's companion. Dr. Merriel, she blurted out, as if she and Eleanor were ten years old again and telling on each other for every imagined transgression. You should know she greeted me at the front door when I arrived and climbed the stairs to personally show me to my room, and she takes breakfast downstairs every morning. From the bed, Eleanor rolled her eyes. Need I remind you, dear sister, that you are here as my companion, not my jailer? Still arguing, I see. Dr. Mariel chuckled as he loosened his hold on Eleanor's wrist. Never did see a pair of twins less alike. Well, I suppose an occasional turn about the upper floors won't do you any harm, Lady Ashington. He looked sternly down at his patient. I would not recommend you attempt the stairs without a sturdy footman to support you, however. It's easy enough to take your breakfast a bed, and given your recent fainting spells, you risk a fall too easily. He moved on to place a hand on Eleanor's swollen middle, pressing gently. As we have discussed at length, you need to avoid undue excitement and surprises, at least until after the baby is born. Yes, Dr. Mariel, Eleanor said meekly. Too meekly. Mary's eyes narrowed. Eleanor had never been one to accept her lot in life without argument, and that meant Mary was going to need to watch her sister more closely. Dr. Mariel completed his examination and took a step back, relief evident on his face. Well, the good news is the baby has started to turn. I don't think you'll need to worry about the possibility of a breech birth. He picked up his bag. In fact, I think you might need to be prepared for the possibility you may deliver early, perhaps as early as July. Eleanor blushed, prompting a faint suspicion to take root. Mary began to count in her head. It had been seven months since Eleanor's whirlwind October wedding, so hastily arranged no family from Yorkshire had even been able to attend. An eight-month baby was not unheard of, but then shouldn't such a baby be small? It felt as if there was a cricket player batting about inside her sister's stomach. Perhaps dear Ashington wasn't nearly the saint her sister had painted him to be. It was a notion that nearly made her smile. As Dr. Merriel turned in the direction of the door, his gaze drifted toward the discarded book that still lay on the chair beside the bed. Still reading, I see. His eyes met Mary's. I recall you always had your nose in a book as a child, but it seems you have moved on from fairy tales. Are you enjoying Miss Bronte's novel? Yes, she is quite a gifted authoress. Mary hesitated. Given that thinking of Miss Bronte's eventual dismal fate in childbirth made fresh worry crawl beneath her skin, 
But I prefer Mrs. Gaskell as an authoress. Truth be told, she added, thinking of the novel Ruth, which she had read just last month, and which was waiting above stairs to be read again. Of course, the heroine of that particular story had been pregnant as well, led astray by a handsome, dastardly villain. Goodness, why couldn't a book's heroine lead a staid, bookish life once in a while? Probably because no one would ever want to read about a character like that. For example, she doubted anyone would ever write a biography about her, not unless they meant it to be an aid. For insomnia, Mrs. Gaskell is an acquaintance of my wife's, Mr. Dickens as well. Doctor Marial's eyes met hers. Would you like to meet them? The question made Mary squirm. Meet them, she stammered. An image flashed through her head of Mrs. Gaskell personally signing her cherished copy of Ruth. Or Mr. Dickens signing her well-worn copy of Bleak House, but in spite of those exhilarating notions, other possibilities stirred in her mind. She might also collapse in a heap at Mr. Dickens' feet, so overcome with excitement as to forget to breathe, or she might trip over the hem of her gown and careen into Mrs. Gaskell, making her collapse in a heap at Mr. Dickens' feet. She suddenly realized both Eleanor and Doctor Merrill were staring at her expectantly, waiting for her to say something. I, ah,、uh, that is, she flushed. Oh, good heavens! Perhaps she might collapse in a heap right now. You must excuse my sister's reaction, Doctor Merrill. Eleanor finally laughed from the bed. You see, she quite worships books and their authors. Doctor Merrill smiled kindly. My wife is hosting a salon tonight, a charity event at Saint Bartholomew's Teaching Hospital, to benefit injured soldiers and see to their long-term care. A good many have settled in London since the war, and so many of them are damaged, some in ways you can't even see. I understand Mrs. Gaskell will be reading from her latest work, and Mr. Dickens will be there as well. If you enjoy reading even half as much as I remember you did as a child, you should go. Go, Mary echoed weakly. No matter how exciting the notion of meeting someone like Mrs. Gaskell, the idea that she might well make a fool of herself made her shake her head instead. I am afraid, I couldn't. Of course you could. You will, Eleanor interjected. You must. Mary shot her sister a glare that, properly interpreted, meant they would talk about this later. I am afraid it isn't possible. I am here in London as your companion, and I need to be here to make sure you follow Doctor Merrill's orders. What if you faint again? I don't need you to hover over me. Eleanor gave her head an impatient shake, setting those diamond ear bobs flashing. I've plenty of servants to see to my every need, and besides, I am usually asleep with the sunset these days. And stop trying to change the subject. We are talking about you at the moment, not me. You must go. I quite insist. Mary spread her hands, but I am unmarried. She protested, knowing enough about rules and etiquette to at least understand the impossibility of it. I don't have a proper chaperone. And whose fault is it that you are still unmarried, given that you refused to have a season? Eleanor shot back, her cheeks growing pink with agitation. Doctor Merrill stepped in between them, his hands raised in a conciliatory fashion. Now, ladies, surely there is no need to argue about this. My wife would be happy to serve as chaperone, as well as provide a personal introduction to Mrs. Gaskell and Mr. Dickens. And Lady Ashington, I am sure, will promise to stay a bed tonight. He looked between them as if the matter was decided. Shall I send the carriage around at seven? She is pleased to accept. Eleanor answered firmly. Doctor Merrill turned back toward the door, then seemed to think of one more thing. Oh, and Lady Ashington, 
he called over one shoulder. Yes? It is all well and good to always listen to your husband, though I have yet to meet a female who actually does. But do try to do everything I tell you as well. No more arguing with your sister. He winked in Mary's direction. It isn't good for the baby. Eleanor nodded meekly from her bed. Of course. But as soon as Dr. Mariel pulled the door shut behind him, she swung her legs over the side of the mattress, her eyes rounded with excitement. Now, first things first, we need to find you a proper dress. She began to waddle toward the wardrobe, one hand pressed against the small of her back. Mary trailed behind, her hands fluttering in objection. Should you... Uh, that is, shouldn't you be in bed? That brown serge you are wearing is hideous, Eleanor said, flinging open the doors to the wardrobe. Even by Yorkshire standards, my good blue silk should do for you, I think. She pulled a cerulean swathe of fabric from the depths of the overflowing closet, regarding it with pursed lips. Thank goodness at least one of us will still fit into it. Mary wrung her hands, desperately wanting her sister safely back in bed. I can't go, Eleanor, she countered. It wasn't that she couldn't imagine it. Her imagination was nothing if not vivid. She might go and have a lovely time, meet a dozen authors, and confess her secret desire to write her own stories. But none of that was going to happen. Nothing exciting ever happened, not to her. Exciting adventures were for fictional characters, not real life. And that was why she was going to decline Dr. Mariel's kind invitation and fall asleep reading a book tonight. Thank you very much. Her sister turned, her hands full of blue silk. Oh, and I suppose you think it would be more fun to stay home tonight and read about your favourite authors. Mary cringed. Drat it all. Eleanor had always been able to see into her mind. Her sister's brow rose high. Or perhaps you think it would be more fun to write in your journal about all the things you aren't doing. Mary gasped. How did you know I write in a journal? For heaven's sake, your hands are always covered in ink. Eleanor sighed in exasperation. Honestly, Mary, can't you see why this is important? You can't spend the rest of your life hiding behind other people's stories. I am not hiding. I am just... shy. Shy? Eleanor snorted. I should say spineless. She held the dress up like a threat. You didn't used to be this way, you know. You used to be eager for a fun adventure. Do you remember when we were nine years old and I fell in the duck pond? You told me there were fairies imprisoned at the bottom and said they needed to be rescued. And when I tried to save them and lost my footing, you waded in and hauled me out? She narrowed her eyes at Mary. That girl would be brave enough to go to a literary salon. I, that is... Mary hesitated. What was she supposed to say to that? She well remembered the day Eleanor was describing, but she remembered it a bit differently. That wasn't a fun adventure, she protested. You nearly drowned. That is neither here nor there. The point is that it was your idea to save the fairies. You always had good ideas, endless lists of things we might do, adventures we might find. But something changed after Eric and father died. Eleanor's face grew pinched. You lost the spark that used to define you. The spark I know is still hiding in there, somewhere. Mary winced, as much at the reminder of that dark time in her life as the criticism in her sister's voice. Eric and father. It was too much to hear Eleanor say their names, especially so soon on the heels of seeing Dr. Mariel again. She could still remember the day Dr. Mariel had sat them both down, his face ashen, to tell them of Eric's death. And then, not even a year later, he'd had to do it again,
telling them of their father's sudden, unfortunate passing. Don't you want to meet a nice gentleman some day? Eleanor went on, apparently oblivious to the dusty memories she was stirring. Fall in love, have children. It is what father and Eric would have wanted, you know. I, that is. But the thought wouldn't form. Mary's head was spinning in reverse now. Their brother, Eric, had been killed when the girls were nine, not even two months after their adventure in the duck pond. He'd been shot in cold blood, and for a time everyone had believed his killer was their older brother, Patrick. Then their father, the Earl of Havisham, had been poisoned to pave the way for a cousin to inherit the title. If they had been ordinary deaths, influenza or consumption, for example, they might have been easier to understand, to accept. But they had been violent deaths, the stuff of nightmares, and to Mary, the world had been painted in perfect, stark relief by those experiences. Books had become her refuge, a far safer way to learn about the world. But it was clear Eleanor thought they had become her crutch instead. The point is, Eleanor went on, life is something you have to live, and husbands are something you have to seek. Neither falls willy nilly into your lap, and you can't do either of those things if you keep reading those unrealistic novels. My books aren't that unrealistic, Mary protested weakly, and I do intend to eventually marry. At Eleanor's dubious frown, she trotted out the same tired argument she always gave when her feet hesitated to follow her imagination. I do. I just need more time. Time to rediscover that mysterious spark her sister was nattering on about. Time to find a husband who might have a hope of measuring up to the heroes in her books. More time? Eleanor snorted. For heaven's sake, you're nearly on the shelf. It's been over fifteen years since father and Eric died, but you still act and dress as if you are in mourning. Life isn't a fairy tale, and you don't need more time, Mary. You need more opportunities, and I intend to see that you take them. She draped the dress she was holding across the wardrobe door, then placed her hand on the rounded shelf of her abdomen. Don't you realize this is why I asked you to come to London? I am here because you need me, Mary said slowly, stupidly. Your husband was called away on business, and you required a companion during your confinement. Not only that, Eleanor frowned. I have plotted this for months with Julianne and Patrick's help. We knew you wouldn't come to London for yourself, given that you refused to even have a season. Mary blinked, her imagination helpfully filling in the blanks. Julianne and Patrick helped you plan this, she whispered. She could well imagine Eleanor meddling in the tedious chapters of her life, but it hurt more somehow to know that her sister in law and brother were tied up in all of this too. Embarrassment bloomed as she considered what it all meant. Her family pitied her, pitied her boring, bookish days and her looming, lonely life. And God help her. She was beginning to see why. Yes. Eleanor, at least, had the good grace to look uncomfortable about her confession. We knew my confinement was our only chance to get you away from home, to help you see something of the world. You are generous to a fault, Mary. I knew you would not refuse my request, not if you thought I really needed you. But I did not ask you here to be at my beck and call. I want you to enjoy these two months with me, and this is the perfect occasion. You may never get another chance to meet Mrs. Gaskell and Mr. Dickens. You will regret it if you do not take this opportunity. I know, 
Mary breathed, and in spite of her irritation with the notion that her family was plotting against her, she found herself leaning toward the idea of going. Perhaps it was her sister's harsh words, or perhaps it was an acknowledgement of her own failings, but she felt a restless shifting inside her. No matter what Eleanor thought of her, she did want to imagine her future held something brighter than books, that she might one day be something more than a timid spinster reading about someone else's adventures. But it is my choice whether or not to go, not yours. Mary crossed her arms about her middle. I will agree to think on it. Eleanor, though, played her final winning card. No. She pressed her hand against her stomach, wincing. You will do it. No thinking allowed. Arguing about it only threatens to push me closer to a premature labour, and you heard what Dr. Mariel said about that. So you are going, dear sister. She picked up the blue silk gown again and thrust it toward Mary like a weapon. And I won't hear another word against it. From the Diary of Miss Mary Channing, June the 1st, 1858. It is nearly seven o'clock, and although I can scarcely believe it, I am dressed in Eleanor's good blue silk and waiting for the carriage to arrive. In spite of my earlier agreement, I am a bundle of nerves. I want to be brave, but I am having second thoughts. How could Eleanor demand this of me? Didn't we read the same books growing up, educational tales, where the moral lesson was always the same? I can see my demise clearly, too. The moment I leave this house, I'll be trampled by a runaway carriage on the streets of London. Or else I'll fall into one of the sewers and be washed away into the Thames. Honestly, what was Eleanor thinking? She knows, as well as I do, the best heroines always meet a tragic end. Chapter 3 the foyer of St. Bartholomew's Teaching Hospital smelled faintly of chloroform and carbolic acid, no doubt from the countless medical students such scents usually clung to. But tonight it also smelled of perspiration and perfume, and the odd combination of scents made Mary wish for the comforting smell of a library instead, with its books and leather covers and aging paper. Good heavens, even a flower garden and the scent of peed upon roses would be better than this. Her feet hesitated, twitched to turn around. But she couldn't embarrass herself or Mrs. Merrill by bolting for the carriage so soon, not when they'd scarcely gone ten steps inside the hospital. Are you excited about this evening, Miss Channing? Her chaperone asked over one shoulder. Mrs. Merrill began to thread her way through the crowd, beckoning for Mary to follow. It seems to be quite a crush. It is quite exciting to see so many people turn out for a benefit for St. Bartholomew's. Er, uh, yes, Mary swallowed. Quite exciting. At least she hoped the skittering of her stomach was excitement over the thought of hearing her favourite authors speak. It could also be dyspepsia, or the fact that Eleanor's blue gown and tightly laced corset made her feel dreadfully exposed. She glanced down at the swell of her breasts, pushing rudely up above the neckline of Eleanor's gown. Her mind promptly began to catalogue all the ways she might embarrass herself tonight. She could trip and fall on her face. She could bend too far to the right and give someone a peek down this disastrously low-cut bodice. She could... she could die. All right, perhaps that was less her overactive imagination and more wishful thinking, but she could faint, and in a crowd such as this, that was very nearly the same thing as dying.'
In fact, the dreadful pinch of her sister's whalebone corset made fainting seem like one of the more pleasurable prospects for the evening. She wished for the tenth time since leaving Eleanor's house to be wearing her own serge day dress and her ordinary front lacing stays. But there was no help for it now, so she drew as deep a breath as she could manage and forced her feet to follow Mrs. Mariel down the teeming hallway. As they stepped into the lecture hall, she cringed to see the number of people already there. Still more poured in behind them, pushing them forward. A crush, Mrs. Mariel had called it. How appropriate. She'd never before seen anything grander than a Yorkshire house party, and the knowledge of just how many people surrounded her here tonight made something akin to panic bloom, bright red in her chest. Smells pushed in, silks heated by warm bodies, a dozen different perfumes applied by two liberal hands. She closed her eyes. She'd never faced such a mob. Before, couldn't imagine surviving it, and yet she must. Eleanor and Julianne and Patrick pitied her. Worse, she was beginning to think she ought to pity herself, and that meant tonight she needed to prove she was capable of a fun adventure, or two. Even if her dinner ended up splattered across her borrowed silk slippers. Miss Channing, Mary opened her eyes, startled, as Mrs. Mariel placed a steadying hand on her arm. You look a bit pale. The kindly woman cocked her head. Are you all right? Yes, Mary tried to find a smile. Just excited, as you said, and suffocating in this corset. Mrs. Mariel studied her, a concerned pinch to her brow. Perhaps you should sit down now. Catch your breath. She motioned to a nearby seat. I'll need to leave you here. I'm afraid my duties as hostess require me to introduce the authors tonight, which means I must be down at the front by the lectern. Mary swallowed. She was to be left alone. A protest hovered on her lips. She wanted to follow Mrs. Merrill down to the front, or else ask her to stay up here, where the crowd was thinner and the air was likely less toxic. But even as those thoughts swirled, she felt ashamed. For heaven's sake, she was twenty-six years old, a grown woman. Mrs. Merrill was the hostess of the event tonight, a role that came with a good deal of responsibility, and she didn't look the least bit nervous. The least Mary could do was muddle her way through without complaint, no matter how her palms were starting to perspire beneath her gloves. Yes, please go on," she blurted out. "I will be fine." She jumped as someone bumped into her from behind. Crowds just make me a little nervous. Mrs. Merrill's eyes softened. It should settle down in a moment once the authors take the stage. But if you find you need a quiet moment, the hospital library is just down the hallway to the left. It is one of my favourite spots at St Bartholomew's, full of the most amazing old books. She hesitated, and it should be safe enough for you to be there, as long as you keep the door open. Mary nodded. The knowledge that there was a book-filled room somewhere to which she might retreat. Or hide if need be, made her feel a little better. But as Mrs. Merrill headed toward the front of the room, the skittering of her stomach intensified, because in the space of that brief conversation, the empty chair Mrs. Merrill had pointed out was now taken. Mary turned in a circle, looking for a seat that wasn't already occupied, seeing none nearby, and then. It was too late. Mrs. Mariel was addressing the crowd, offering a warm welcome. A gentleman who could only be Mr. Dickens stood just behind her, his beard full and bushy, his curly hair in wild disarray. People who had yet to find a seat began to fight their way down to the front. Mary felt an elbow in her back, vicious and sharp. 
a stranger's hand flailed too close, ripping a patch of lace off the sleeve of her borrowed dress. Suddenly, it was all too much. She may have come here tonight to see her favourite authors and to prove to Eleanor that some spark still flickered inside her, but the thought of what she must endure first was overwhelming. She needed to breathe. She needed to leave. And, as it had nearly her entire life, the library posed her only chance for sanity. West arrived late, not an unusual feat, given his propensity to sleep the day away, but a fact for which his sister, Claire, would likely have his hide. But instead of taking his seat, which would seal his fate, he stood morosely at the edge of the crowd, wishing for something more interesting in his immediate future than the gaggle of authors down front and the misguided fools who had come to adore them. God's teeth, but it was crowded here tonight. The room was packed elbow to elbow, giving him no hope of recognising anyone, even should he know them intimately. If Grant were here, he was sure his friend would have ideas for how to liven the place up, pass about a flask, flirt with an ageing dowager, and tweak her on the bum. Catcall a pompous author or two, but West wasn't going to embarrass his sister like that. Not in public, at any rate. Grinning to himself, he scanned the swollen crowd, tripped over an isolated whisper of rich blue silk, swung back for a second look. Well now, this was more interesting. One woman stood apart from it all. He had no idea who she was, but he hoped to remedy that in due course. She was standing about thirty feet away, too far to make out her features, but he could see shining brown hair and a gentle curve of hip flaring out from a slim waist, all things that quite begged for a man's undivided attention. There was no gentleman on her arm, no scowling chaperone hovering close by, which meant she was a widow, perhaps, safe for proper pursuit. Grant would have already been heading toward the woman in blue, sniffing out her availability, turning on the rakish charm. But in spite of his own marked interest in furthering an acquaintance, West hesitated. He had come here tonight because his sister had asked this favour of him. There was also the small matter of guilt. A good many former sailors and soldiers sought much-needed care at St. Bartholomew's charity wards. By being here tonight, by purchasing his ticket and showing his support, he was doing what he could to ease his conscience. He certainly hadn't come to indulge some non-existent appreciation for the fine arts or to chase a pretty set of skirts. Bolstering the coffers of the hospital was the real point in his participation tonight, not actually listening to the authors. But now that he'd seen the woman in blue, he was torn between very different loyalties. Like a moth drawn to a gaslight, he moved toward her, even as the author readings began in earnest down at the front of the room. He might go to hell for this singular distraction and would likely earn his sister's ire and a cuff on the ear. But he was willing to risk it if it eventually earned him a spot in the mysterious woman's bed. Although, if the woman was here, it stood to reason she liked books as much as his sister did. Well, he'd pretend to have read some of Mr. Dickens blathering books if he needed to. Recite a line of terrible poetry or two, and pretend they weren't actually drinking songs he'd learned from Grant. As he drew closer, however, the woman turned and hurried out of the lecture hall. Perplexed, West followed, his top hat tucked beneath one arm. A sense of unease settled over him as he stepped out of the doorway.
the hall was devoid of a single other soul save the woman in blue, and she was drifting away from him, deeper into the bowels of the dark building. West frowned. A woman alone could not be too careful. Someone who understood the ways of the world would not drift toward the hall's shadowed edges, oblivious to her surroundings. And now that he was closer, her shape looked familiar. Odd, that. She turned into an open doorway, just to her left. West was confused and intrigued enough to follow. As he stepped through the door, his nose caught the distinctive smell of aging paper and leather bindings. The open curtains of the room draped the space in late evening shadows and illuminated shelf after shelf of books, but he scarcely needed more light to realize their location. They were in the medical library. A sense of anticipation returned. Perhaps she knew what she was about. He did love a tryst in a library. And it could fit, he supposed, with the theme of the evening. If this was a woman whose romantic yearnings were stirred by Charles Dickens, perhaps she might wish to be pleasured against a shelf of books. She was facing away from him. "'staring up at one of the thick shelves of books, "'running a finger across their bindings. "'He moved closer, until he could see the long curve of her neck, "'the delicate knob of each small bone "'marching down to disappear into that temptation of a dress. "'He cleared his throat. "'She whirled around, a book clutched in her hands. "'Her eyes widened as she caught sight of him. And she jerked backward, bumped into the bookshelf, jumped forward two feet and dropped the book in her haste. West fought back a sympathetic chuckle as she scrambled to find both her balance and a proper distance from him. But he felt no guilt in the matter. Her surprise could be laid at her own feet. She really ought to pay more attention to her surroundings. He hadn't exactly been silent as he'd followed her down the hallway. The sense that he knew her sunk its claws in more deeply. He let his eyes trail across her curves, probing the delicate swell of her décolletage. Grant might catalogue memories of women's feet, but West nearly always remembered a woman's breasts. All signs pointed to this one's bosom being of the ordinary variety, and the gentle rise of flesh sparked little by way of memory. Yet the sense that he knew her had hold of him now. Had he already had her on another night, in another life? It pained him that he couldn't remember. Perhaps he and Grant had been on a few too many binges of late, what good was drunken revelry if one didn't remember the good parts? Do I know you? he asked, genuinely curious. He took a step toward her, and then another, and then followed her as she edged away from him toward the window. It was getting dark enough he'd have liked to light one of the lamps on the reading tables, but then the evening shadows seemed to suit her. No. She choked out. Would you like to know me? He teased. That seemed to pluck a string inside her. That is quite close enough, sir, she said, her voice terse and angry. Have you come to urinate on the books, too? Awareness flared. God's teeth, he remembered now, how the white linen of her nightclothes had draped against her body how he had teased her, and how she had squeaked in protest. It was the woman from Ashington's garden, and whoever she was, she was no one's maid. A servant would have said piss or piddle, not urinate. This one's words were too polished to belong to a servant.'
and her tongue seemed intent on lashing him with insults instead of kisses. You are the girl, he said stupidly, from the garden. Scarcely a girl, older than you, I'd wager. West took a step away from her, intending to give her space. Even angry, her voice was close to trembling. It was obvious he made her uncomfortable. He probably ought to leave her alone. Only, some devil made him stop short of actually leaving. His hand reached for the library door. He glanced back at her, speculatively. Something about the set of her lips made him want to soften them. To do that properly, he needed a bit of privacy. The door swung shut with a flick of his wrist. Her gasp echoed in his ears. The colour had fled her cheeks, but her eyes, ah, those were a reckoning, narrowed in his direction, and spitting fire. You, sir, she said, her voice gaining in strength and confidence, are no gentleman. Strong words, coming from the lady who just led me on a merry chase down a deserted hallway. He waited a beat, then let his smile spread across his face, and who even now waits for me behind a closed door. I did not! She stopped abruptly, clenching her fists. I am not! She drew a breath, and then lifted her sharp chin. I did not lead you anywhere, and you well know it. And do not suggest that you are doing this to teach me a lesson, as you did yesterday morning in the garden. I did not ask you to close the door. Open it, please. Her chin poked higher. Or someone might form a misimpression of our association. The understanding that she didn't want him did little to assuage the fact that West wanted her. Worse, it was hard to countenance the impulse. Up close, she was hardly a great beauty, pretty enough, in a plain sort of way. But then, London was full of plainly pretty girls, who hardly turned his head. He usually preferred women who were a bit more generous in their curves, and less pointed with their barbs. But she was interesting. He'd give her that. More interesting than Dickens certainly. Bugger it all, what was he doing? He had followed a plain and innocent mouse into the library, and then shut the door on the world outside. And in spite of the idiocy of such an action, he wasn't quite ready to open it yet. Chapter 4 Did you hear me, sir? Mary demanded, her chest tight with what she assumed was fear. It had to be fear, making her heart tear about in her chest like a frightened rabbit. Anything else was unconscionable. Although, perhaps he wasn't a mere sir. Unlike his dishevelled appearance outside the garden fence yesterday morning, tonight his cravat was perfectly tied, not a wrinkle to be seen anywhere on his clothing. But it scarcely mattered if she noticed the way his tailored evening jacket clung to his lean body, or if he carried a title about on those handsome shoulders. He was a bona fide, dyed-in-the-wool villain. He appeared young, two, perhaps three years younger than herself, Old enough to be a proper man, though, and larger than her by far. He stared back at her, silent, a wave of longish blonde hair falling into his eyes. She began to form an impression from his silence that he might be stupid. Thank goodness, stupid villains tended to fare poorly. It was the smart villains one needed to avoid. Are you deaf as well as incorrigible, she asked, growing bolder now. She tried to call to mind her favourite heroines and how they stood their ground when finally facing their villains. 
But while such examples gave her courage, she needed to remember that while he might be young and stupid, he was also still dangerous. I asked you to open the door, she said, repeating her demand. But he didn't open the door. He stepped away from her, which made her breathe a bit easier, and set down his top hat on a table, which made her throat close tight. He pulled a book down from the nearest shelf and hefted it in one hand, as if testing its weight. Mary stared, frozen by the sight of that book in his hand. Her imagination took hold of her thoughts. A book could be an effective weapon if wielded with enough force. She recalled a novel she had once read, where the villain had merely threatened to use force, and the heroine had capitulated her very innocence. She'd marked the passage and returned to it over and over again each night for a month. She was horrified by the tale, to be sure, but there was also something of curiosity lying below the surface of that terror. The heroine, a silly girl, to be sure, had strangely enjoyed the things she had done, though she'd suffered for her sins and died of the pox by the end, as all proper heroines must. Do you mean to threaten me with that? she asked warily. With a book? He turned it over, as if examining it. You think I intend it to be a weapon? His gaze lifted and held hers. I assure you, I have never in my life threatened a woman. I do not have to, you see. He smirked. They all beg me for a kiss. Mary flushed. Good heavens, the man was insufferable, in a curious, heart-pounding sort of way. Then what are you doing with it? Perhaps I am reading. He opened the cover and offered her a flash of teeth against the growing dimness of the room. It is, after all, what one does in a library. He waited a beat, then closed the cover. Unless you have something else in mind. She was reminded in that moment that he might be stupid, but he was also very handsome. In too many books, the handsome ones could be stupid and still cause a good deal of trouble. Stop lying to me, she snapped, feeling flushed for reasons that unfortunately had little to do with panic or timidity. Why did you follow me into the library? I enjoy a good novel. Then you should try Bleak House or Wuthering Heights. She strained her eyes in the direction of the book he was holding, trying to read the gold-embossed lettering along the spine. Not the prescriber's pharmacopoeia. His laugh caught her off guard, and Mary felt a blooming of heat in her abdomen at the sound. She should not be here, listening to this man's laughter. They should not be here, together in such an indelicate situation. He should have opened the door when she demanded it. But she was capable of opening the door herself, wasn't she? He put the book down on the table beside his hat, freeing his hands for other more dangerous pursuits. His gaze met hers, warm, questing. She felt an answering heat spreading through her stomach. That was all the cue she needed to end this now. Mary took a step around him, heading toward the door to the hallway, seeking solace from her own apparent propensity for folly. She reached a hand toward the door, but froze as she caught the faint sound of voices outside, hushed and furtive. Her mouth went dry. Oh, but could this night get any worse? A scratch came at the door. She opened her mouth, but without warning, the scoundrel's hand, good heavens, was it possible she still didn't know his name, closed over her upper arm and pulled her behind the nearby drapes, yanking them closed, dust motes stirring 
Before she could so much as gasp in outrage, he'd pulled her flush against his very solid chest, her back pressing against his front, one large, capable hand clapped over her mouth. That was when she realized he might be young and stupid, but he was also very strong. And this night could definitely get worse. Good God, the woman was going to get them discovered. Was she really so naive as to think that calling out, identifying their unchaperoned presence behind a closed library door was a good thing? Bloody hell, this was why West never dealt with innocence. They were so damnably innocent. She might know her way around a library and be able to rattle off an impressive-sounding list of books, but it was clear she knew nothing of how the world, or, more terrifyingly, London society, worked. If they were seen together like this, there would be hell itself to pay. The scratch on the door came again. West well recognised it, given that he and Grant had used such signals on more occasions than he could count. Another couple wanted to use the library for a clandestine tryst, but didn't want to risk their own discovery. Whoever they were, they were growing bolder for the lack of an answer. A faint knock came next, followed by a man's low voice, murmuring to someone in the hallway. In spite of their sticky predicament, West grinned. This could be interesting. Was his poor mouse from the garden going to be forced to listen to another pair coupling? That, surely, would be an even greater horror to her sensibilities than witnessing the harmless desecration of a rose bush, which had probably benefited from his generous fertilization. He drew his hand away from her mouth, letting a finger rest against her lips, the warning clear. Not a sound. She twisted around to face him. She smelled like lemons. He sniffed, the scent tickling at his nostrils. Perhaps she used a scented soap, or perhaps she sucked on them to give her mouth that decidedly prudish pucker. A knock came again, and a rattle of the door latch. He pulled the drapes more tightly around them, then tightened one hand about her waist, giving her both a warning to stay quiet and a salacious sort of squeeze. Be still, he warned in a soft whisper. Don't touch me like that, she choked out. I will scream. He permitted himself a chuckle. Oh, love. He lifted the offending hand to trail a finger against the curve of her cheek. I confess I'd like to make you scream. He paused, one finger lingering at the point of her chin, then gently tipped her head back until she was staring up at him, her brown eyes wide with something other than fear. But I promise, he added, you would do so in pleasure, not fear. Her slowly indrawn breath pleased him, teased him with other possibilities. Perhaps she wasn't as much of a prude as he'd imagined. But he could scarcely tell her the direction of his thoughts. He couldn't say another word, because the door was opening, and someone, several someones, in fact, were moving into the room, multiple voices melding into a low hum of whispers. His grin returned as he caught the timber of two male voices and two lighter female tones. Ah, four of them, was it? That was an even more delicious outrage to a mousy virgin than listening to a single pair tup themselves senseless against her precious bookshelves. The woman in his arms seemed to think so too. Her chest rose in indignation, and that tempting mouth opened in panic. It was clear she was about to do something imprudent.
He didn't have time to think, only to act. He needed to silence her immediately. The danger of discovery was far more real now that the room had been claimed by others, and now that she turned to face him, he was no longer positioned to clap a warning hand over her mouth again. And so he kissed her, muffling her squeak of outrage with a generous sweep of his tongue. She began to struggle against him, her protest muffled against his lips. What was that? came one of the male voices. She quieted, her mouth going still beneath his, submitting to the invasion with surprising rapidity. She went almost limp in his arms, letting him do what he would. Smart woman, to finally recognize the danger. But was it too late? Footsteps echoed, too close for comfort. West kept his mouth pressed to hers, not even daring to exhale. He could feel the tension in her body coil tighter, until it seemed as though she might shatter beneath his lips. But she didn't pull away, she didn't so much as twitch. Is someone there? A female voice whispered, inches from where they breathed. There's no one. The second woman's faint laugh echoed. Just a mouse, I think. The footsteps retreated toward the center of the room. The voices shifted, low murmurs and an occasional husky female laugh. Despite the surge of relief he felt to have escaped discovery, West didn't relinquish his control of her lips. Yes, it was a mouse. A very tempting mouse, frozen in his arms. She surprised him. He'd thought, perhaps, that she'd have some bite to her kiss, given the way she'd sniped at him, but this was a sweet surrender. He slowly lifted his mouth, thinking perhaps she might need to breathe. Her eyes seemed huge in the gathering darkness, her lips swollen from their recent good use. She lifted a finger to her mouth, running a fingertip, along her lower lip. And then, with a small hitch of breath, her arms snaked up around his neck, and West found himself pulled back into another kiss, this one far more real than the first. Chapter 5 What, oh, what, was she doing? The buzz of impending danger hummed in Mary's head, but it couldn't drown out the rush of her pulse or the low, building heat in her womb. No matter how or why it was happening, this was her first real kiss not experienced between the pages of a book. And she wasn't yet ready for it to end. Later, she would burn in humiliation to think her first kiss had been delivered at the hands of an utter scoundrel, a man who had not even told her his name, a man whose hand had gripped her bum and pulled her too tightly against him, letting her feel his hard, unforgiving body, a man whose tongue had done wild, wicked things in her mouth and tangled her already vivid imagination into a great hopeless knot. But at present, she wasn't thinking of how she would feel later. She was thinking only of how she felt now. She had no experience with such things, but something told her he was a very good kisser. She opened her lips, wanting to feel the sweep of his tongue inside her mouth again, and he obliged as if he could read her mind. It felt so deliciously depraved to kiss in such a manner. Had any of the books she'd read through the years gotten it right? She didn't recall reading anything about kisses beyond lips fervently and quickly pressed together. But this was a different experience entirely, warm and wet and wicked, an invasion of her very soul. Her fingers wrapped tightly about his neck, pulling him closer. He tasted of whiskey and salt and utter sin, 
and in a startled burst of awareness, she realized she felt his hand, warm and sure, against her breast. He paused there, his mouth still doing head-spinning things to hers, but his hand asking permission for something she didn't even understand. She only knew that she liked the feel of his palm there, and so when his hand dipped into the top of her bodice, and she felt the shocking warmth of his skin against hers, she didn't, couldn't, push him away. His fingers dipped lower, questing, promising, but then his hand stilled, going no lower, a wish only half fulfilled. The voices outside the curtains remained muffled by the pounding of her pulse in her ears, but she caught a few distinct phrases. Did anyone see you? No, I came in after everyone took their seats. Through the haze of pleasure, she understood that the man with his mouth currently fastened over hers was no longer focused on their kiss. Instead, he was listening intently to the conversation taking place outside the heavy drapery. She tried to listen as well. Constitution. An odd thing to hear whispered, certainly. Then again, what did she know of love words? Nothing beyond what was offered in books, unfortunately. She caught another word. This one whispered loud enough to set her heart pounding in a different direction. Assassinate. She tore her mouth away to suck in a silent, startled breath of air. Whatever else she'd imagined was happening outside their curtains, this was not it. Her scoundrel had frozen too, his body stiff beneath her palms. She wanted to ask if he'd heard that terrible, unmistakable word as well, but she gulped down the question as he set her away from him. He lifted a finger to his lips, warning her to stay silent, then turned and separated a sliver of drapes with one finger. Ear, I think, Mary heard one of the men say, his whispered dialect identifying him as a commoner. There was a rustling of paper. That's the location to do it right enough, but when? The date has not been set yet, a second male voice answered, his crisp addiction and more authoritative whisper suggesting a more aristocratic upbringing. As soon as the end of June perhaps. Mary craned her neck, trying in vain to see over her scoundrel's shoulder into the darkness beyond the safety of their curtains. Given the uncertainty with dates, you must deliver the funds as soon as possible, she heard the second man say. These men are not so committed to their grand cause. They will not abandon the plan for lack of payment. Must it be me that delivers the money, Your Grace? came one of the women's voices, a faint fog of worry threading her words. We've been over this a dozen times at least. A second woman spoke up, her voice more impatient. No one will question your association, but ours would raise too much concern. And never forget, you are being paid well for your trouble. When it's all over, we'll have a handy scapegoat to pin it upon, and we shall all be free from scrutiny came the strong male voice again. I shall see the money is delivered to St. Paul's Cathedral on Sunday, but then you must see it on. I will, said the first woman, though she sounded none too happy for it. There was a rustling, as if papers were being rolled up, shoes shuffling toward the door. Mary bit her lip, praying for their departure, bursting with questions, and no small degree of fear. But then the first woman's voice came, faint and suspicious. Are you forgetting your topper? There was a moment's pause, where Mary was quite sure the room's occupants must be able to hear her heartbeat. Oh, no. She could see in her mind, all too clearly, her scoundrel setting his top hat down on the table, as if coming to a decision to stay and torment her further. He seemed to remember it, too, his body strung tight as a bow beside her, quivering with barely suppressed energy. Just an hat that belongs to one of the hospital's physicians, surely.
came the first male voice, so low as to be nearly inaudible. There was a pause, as if they were all considering what to do with it. The second man spoke. Although, I would imagine whoever owns it could come back at any moment to claim it. A muffled curse came next, an expletive that made Mary's ears burn. We shouldn't be seen together, said the second woman. There is too much at stake. We need to be more careful. The rustling in the room intensified, footfalls heading toward the door. The door latch clicked again. Silence filled her ears. And then her scoundrel, whoever he was, was pulling her out of the tangled velvet drapery and into the very room where she had just overheard the murky details of an assassination plot. Though his erection was still one for the record books, West had never felt more impotent. Stumbling out into the dark room, he bumped into a chair. Cursing beneath his breath, he pulled a match from the case in his jacket pocket and lit a lamp on a reading table. With more light to guide the path for his agitation, he began to pace, trying to sort out what to do next. Assassinate. Constitution. They were damning words, but what on earth was he supposed to do with this information? The second man's voice had sounded vaguely familiar, no matter that it had been delivered in nothing more distinct than a hoarse whisper. But despite that niggling sense of familiarity, he had no idea who the traitors were, or who their intended target might be. He couldn't even say what they looked like, the room had been dark as pitch with the drapes closed. He had a sickening suspicion, though. One of the women had clearly said, Your Grace. It was a terrible suspicion to hold of a duke, but if West's interpretation of the conversation was anything close to accurate, someone very high within London society was plotting an assassination. What are we going to do? came a trembling voice. West jerked around and stared at the woman who had asked the question. She was still here, and, unfortunately, she was the smaller of his two problems. He felt jerked back in time to that day on board ship when it had all gone to shite and the decisions he made, good or bad, became irrevocable stamps of fate. He would not be responsible for more deaths. Not if he had anything to say about it. We aren't going to do anything. He pointed to the door. You are going to leave and return to the pleasantries of Mr. Dickens. But even as he issued the order, his gaze insisted on lingering on her swollen lips. Damn it, he shouldn't have kissed her, and he certainly shouldn't have kissed her like that. She was a mature woman, old enough to know her own mind and take her own risks, Yet, in spite of the fact that she was a few years older than he was, he'd tasted the inexperience on her lips, felt the quickening beneath her skin. This was why he didn't dabble with innocence. He'd kissed her, and now she looked close to crying. But he couldn't deal with affronted feelings right now, the trembling lips, the claims of bruised feelings. For God's sake, there was treason afoot. We need to tell someone. Her small voice made him want to snarl. She even sounded innocent. Did you not hear what they said? I heard them. He needed to think, to form a plan. Who had they been? Who were they targeting? And what could he do about it, given that he had no proof in hand beyond what he had heard? All pertinent questions none of which could be properly answered with her looking up at him with other unanswered questions shimmering in her eyes. Out you go now. He took her by one elbow, intending to escort her outside himself. She jerked away, surprising him. If you hurt them, then you must realise the gravity of the situation, she said, sounding decidedly less innocent of a sudden. What are we going to do? It occurred to West that her voice might be small, but her spine held a bit of starch. 
He looked down at the image she presented, her hair mussed up by their adventure behind the drapes, a delectable slice of nipple peeking out above the rucked blue bodice. Had he thought the shadows suited her? It turned out Miss Mouse looked equally well in lamplight. I'm not going to do anything, he told her. At least he wasn't going to do anything more where this girl was concerned. The odd attraction he felt toward her was disconcerting. The sooner she left, the better. Please just go now before you make it any worse. Please don't tell me you are a coward as well as a scoundrel. Her eyes looked huge, mooning up at him against her pale cheeks. Because I don't think I could bear to know I just kissed a man who was both. That gave him a start. He'd long been called a scoundrel, but she was calling him a coward now, too. West raised a brow. Then perhaps you ought to be a bit more careful about who you kiss. She gasped, but the sound died on her lips as the latch on the library door rattled, jerking both of their attentions to the door. Miss Channing, are you in here? A woman's worried voice called out from the hallway. Don't, he began, only to be summarily cut off. Yes, I'm in here, she cried out, shooting him an irritated glare. West clenched his fists. After all he'd gone through to protect her, she had just instantly, injudiciously thrown her carcass to the wolves. Good Christ, he felt like throwing up his hands. He was reminded, again, that she was an innocent, apparently unaware of the danger this situation posed to her reputation. Unfortunately, he himself was all too aware. After all, he flirted with the brink of propriety on a regular enough basis to recognize that razor's edge, the need to protect oneself from the fall. But no matter her idiocy, Perhaps it wasn't a fatal mistake, because he recognized the voice on the other side of the door. It belonged to West's oldest sister, Claire, though how she knew the woman he'd just kissed was anyone's guess. He had a name to identify his mystery woman now, no longer Miss Mouse. Miss Channing. It suited her, he supposed had a bland, mouse-like ring to it. He stood fast as the door swung open, hoping for the best. Surely his sister would not make a fuss, would recognize the danger, the need to protect Miss Channing. At least, he hoped she wouldn't make a fuss. In spite of having scandalously wed a mere doctor, Claire could be rigid about some aspects of propriety. But as the doorway opened, he realized the situation might not be in Claire's control. His sister had not come alone. Geoffrey, Claire hissed, her eyes wide with horror. Her gaze darted between Miss Channing and himself, while behind her, an eager group of authors crowded in, Mr. Dickens himself at the forefront of the gathering crowd. What on earth is going on here? Beside him, Miss Channing gave a small, desperate squeak. I, that is, we... His explanation trailed off. Because what was he supposed to say? Miss Channing was well and truly ruined. And the truth was, he hadn't even touched her properly. Miss Channing, Claire said in a desperate tone. She motioned in the area of her own properly buttoned bodice. You might want to, uh, cover yourself. Miss Channing looked down at the hint of a coral nipple peeking out above her bodice. Her squeak evolved into more of a squawk. She began to pant, tugging at her neckline to cover the offending bit of flesh. But then her attentions shifted elsewhere. Her face turned White, and she clawed at her sides before going limp, sliding against West in a dead faint.
He caught her, one-armed, and then lowered her carefully to the floor, cradling her head in his hand. He crouched beside her and stared down at her pale face, smoothing strands of dark hair from her forehead. Miss Channing was the fainting type. It figured, went with her mouse-like demeanour, although she certainly hadn't fainted when he'd kissed her. Somebody call a doctor, one of the authors cried out. No need. West reached into his jacket pocket, pulling out a vial of smelling salts. He uncorked it and waved it beneath Miss Channing's nose. After a moment, she began to sputter, her head thrashing from side to side. Claire pushed him aside, falling to her knees beside the girl. For God's sake, Geoffrey! she snapped, putting a hand beneath Miss Channing's head and helping her to a sitting position. Her eyes narrowed suspiciously in his direction. Why are you carrying smelling salts around in your jacket anyway? Haven't you heard? Women are always pitching over in dead faints around me, he shrugged. I find it better to be prepared. He eyed the milling group of authors, the whispers behind cupped hands. He tried on an apologetic grin, hoping he looked charming instead of rakish. Must be the Westmore charm. Claire helped Miss Channing gain her feet. The poor girl was swaying, almost as if she had too much drink, and Claire led her toward two uncomfortable-looking chairs that several of the authors had hastily pushed together to make a sort of bed. Seeing that she was being cared for, West let his thoughts pull to the dilemma even more concerning than what to do with her. In spite of the drama unfolding in front of him, he could not forget the conversation he'd just overheard in this room. Assassinate. Constitution. Those were not words used in jest. He ought to know. He'd done enough jesting in his life. As soon as he could... He pulled Claire to one side, leaving the others to tend to the situation. Listen, Claire, I think you ought to know. This business with Miss Channing, put it aside for a minute. We have just overheard an assassination plot. There was a moment of silence, clearly laced with disbelief. An assassination plot. Claire raised a dubious brow. Involving whom? I don't know, not yet. Oh, for heaven's sake! Claire smacked him, hard against the ear. Stop trying to distract me with your incessant games, she fumed, letting her anger wind up the way she used to when they were children and he'd done something terrible to vex her. I've never heard of such a ridiculous thing, an assassination plot. Anyone with eyes in their head can see what you've been doing with Miss Channing behind closed doors. She lowered her voice. Her breast was exposed. What were you thinking, Geoffrey? This isn't a game. West rubbed his ear. And don't call me Geoffrey as if I'm still a child. It is always a game with you. And if you don't want to be called a child's name, stop acting like a child. Guilt swirled, hot and thick, but so did resentment. But just as quickly as the anger rose up, his shoulders wanted to slump. Claire was right. Miss Channing wasn't exactly a problem he could ignore. But, perchance, she was a problem he could pass off, at least until he could collect his thoughts. Look. He flashed his sister a hopeful smile. This is all just a misunderstanding, and things will look better tomorrow. But could you, ah, uh, help her home? Can't you see? Claire hissed, eyeing the group of authors who were all clucking over Miss Channing like a brood of agitated chickens. I have to see her home. I am her chaperone. West blinked. You are Miss Channing's chaperone? At his sister's terse nod, he groaned. Miss Mouse was a woman whose pristine reputation required a chaperone? Christ above, there was definitely going to be a fuss. Claire's eyes narrowed back at him.
You've been sidestepping your responsibilities ever since you returned from Crimea, acting more like the thirteen-year-old you once were than the grown man you ought to have become. She crossed her arms. I am sick of it all, and if I find out you forced yourself on her, so help me God. Shame coursed through West. He wasn't a man who coerced unwilling women, but she hadn't been unwilling. Precisely, she had kissed him back. In the wake of his silence, Claire glanced toward the gaggle of authors who were bent over Miss Channing's form, murmuring false sympathies. She frowned in that big sisterly way that had always set him on edge when they were children. It's not only about Miss Channing, though that ought to be enough to bring you around to the right decision. She warned, "If you do not fix this, you will harm my and Daniel's reputation as well." West flinched. His brother-in-law, Doctor Daniel Merrill, was a good man, someone who had always believed in West's potential and encouraged him against poor behaviour. If there had ever been anything good in West. It was only there because it had been noticed and encouraged by Daniel. The thought of disappointing his brother-in-law was definitely enough to make him cringe. I would not purposefully do anything to harm either of you, he began. Purposeful or not, you know we depend on the good will of those influential in society to keep Saint Bartholomew's in enough funds to operate the charity ward here. It's been a lean year. Which is why we held tonight's salon to raise more funds. If we are forced to close the charity ward because of this, you will be directly responsible for people's deaths, Geoffrey. West remained silent. Better that than to confess to his sister they wouldn't be the first. She drew a deep breath. You've really stepped in it this time. And you can't brush this away the way you do your other indiscretions. This isn't some willing widow or a doxy who understands the rules of the game. This is the sister of the Earl of Haversham, one of Daniel's dearest friends. What? And she is the sister of Lord Ashington's new wife as well. West reared back, feeling nearly as if his sister had struck him again. Ten feet away. A group of very famous authors were hovering over one very fragile girl, no doubt spinning stories in their mind, even as they pretended to care. A girl with apparently excellent connections, one who ostensibly moved in circles more lofty than his own. Bugger me, blue! He groaned. Claire rolled her eyes. That particular sin might not have gotten you in as much trouble. From the diary of Miss Mary Channing, June the second, eighteen fifty-eight. So this is how it feels to be ruined. It is almost a relief to turn myself over to it. All those years of imagining it, reading about it, and now it has happened. I am ruined, and nothing worse can happen to me. Eleanor, of course, was horrified, and spent all morning begging my forgiveness for forcing me to attend last night's salon. My scoundrel's name is Mister Geoffrey Westmore, apparently, the future Viscount Cardwell. Missus Merrill said she will ensure her brother does the right thing, whatever that may be. Well, I must do the right thing as well. I am humiliated, of course, but I am far less frightened of my newly blemished reputation than by what I overheard in the library last night. I've read enough books to recognize a nefarious plot when I hear one. If Mister Westmore doesn't plan to do something about it, I fear I will be forced to take matters into my own hands. If only I was brave enough to step. Outside. Chapter Six. West sat at the Cardwell breakfast table, his head cradled in his hands, though he'd not had a drop to drink. In fact, after the debacle in the library, he'd come straight home, an uncharacteristic diversion from his usual nocturnal patterns. <laughs> 
He'd paced his carpet into the wee hours of the morning, studying both of his dilemmas from every possible angle. And finally, he'd reached an unpalatable decision, nearly as unpalatable as his breakfast. After such a long night, he ought to be ravenous, but the sight of eggs and toast this morning made his stomach turn. The only good thing he could imagine doing with his fork this morning was sticking it in his eye. You are up early today, Geoffrey. His father observed from across the table, rattling his morning paper. Yes, it is good to see you up for a change, and on a Wednesday, no less. Mother chimed in, as if the day of the week made a difference. She lifted a cup of chocolate to her lips. Though you've shadows beneath your eyes, are you getting enough sleep, dear? Mmph, West replied, capable of little else. His parents might think his appearance this morning at the breakfast table was a good sign, but they didn't know the truth. He was only here because he'd been unable to sleep, and because he had a sour bit of business to tend to this morning. He stared down at the eggs on his plate, contemplating whether he could choke them down. Relief from that decision came in the sound of shoes clicking against the floorboards. His gaze pulled toward the dining room door to see Wilson appear, a smile replacing the servant's usual scowl. "You've a visitor, Lord Cardwell," he announced, sounding happy for once. "A visitor." Father nudged his spectacles farther up the bridge of his nose. "It is scarcely nine o'clock in the morning." He looked down at his plate. And we already finished all the eggs, thanks to Geoffrey's unexpected appearance at breakfast. Claire appeared at Wilson's side. Fortunately, it is a visitor who doesn't expect to be fed. She announced, looking crisp and polished as she sailed into the room. She slid seamlessly into the chair where she'd always sat growing up and beamed up at the butler. Thank you for announcing me so formally, Wilson. My life is so different now. Sometimes I forget what it is like to have a lovely friend of a butler greet you at the door. Claire's smile shifted to their parents. Mother, father, it is good to see you all. Well, I must say this is a lovely surprise, mother exclaimed. Just like old times when we'd gather every morning for a family breakfast, she sighed almost wistfully. If only Lucy and Lydia were here too, though there are times I enjoy the quiet. I miss having my children in the house again. Jeffrey's hardly ever up in time for breakfast any more. Oh, I don't think we want Lucy and Lydia to hear what I have come to discuss just yet. Claire's smile faltered, and she pulled a folded-up bit of newsprint from her reticule and placed it in front of her. It's a bit delicate, actually. His mother put down her cup of chocolate. Has something happened to you, or Daniel? Her hand fluttered near her throat. Or one of the children? No, no, the children are fine and already at their lessons for the day. As for whether something has happened to me or Daniel, I think that depends on Jeffrey's decisions this morning. We'll be fine, I think, if he comes up to scratch. His sister looked at him, her hazel eyes narrowing. Has he told you about what happened last night, Claire? West warned. Surely this was the sort of conversation best had in private. What has he done now? Mother asked, sounding resigned. Is it worse than last year when he took out an advertisement in the London Times and advertised Cardwell House for sale? West winced. That had been blown entirely out of proportion, a bit of fun intended to make his father sweat after threatening to cut off his monthly allowance for some small transgression. The advertisement had offered the house and its furnishings, including several Ming Dynasty vases and the gold-plated china, for two hundred pounds. There'd been a line of agitated buyers a half mile long, wrapping around Grosvenor Square, all desperate to purchase such a valuable property for such a paltry price. His father had certainly been surprised.
So had West when the authorities had knocked on the door and accused him of fraudulent advertising. Claire shook her head. Worse. Is it worse than that time he let the rats loose in the room of that bully at Harrow? Wilson chuckled. The pounding in West's head got worse. However well intentioned, that had been an adolescent prank that had miscarried. Although the rats were intended to terrorize Peter Wetford, the son of the Duke of Southingham, a brutish young man who liked to pummel those with lesser titles, and who, thanks to room assignments based on alphabetical order, occupied the room next door to him at Harrow, the rats showed no allegiance to worthy causes. They had chewed beneath the walls and found their way back to West's room. He still woke up sometimes at night, drenched in sweat, the sensation of rats climbing over him all too real and in all too delicate of places. It is worse than Harrow, Claire said firmly. The serving maid giggled. Surely it isn't worse than the time he snuck into the Duke of Southingham's house. The girl's cheeks pinked up. My friend told me about that one. She told me the entire household was in an uproar when he was caught with the Duchess's maid. West slumped in his chair. Bloody wonderful. Now, now even the downstairs crowd was spreading tales of his exploits, and ones scarcely suitable for his mother's ears. I feel quite sure it must be worse than his inflated bladder on the stairwell routine, his father interjected. Stepped on that one this morning, nearly scared the living daylights out of me. He looked sternly over the top of his spectacles. Honestly, Geoffrey, you need to find another place to put it. Frightening people on the stairs could have dire consequences. You wouldn't want someone to fall. It is worse than any of it, I promise you. Claire leveled a look at him, a look he knew all too well from growing up with a shrew for a sister. I suppose he'll claim it's all a misunderstanding, as he only did it to thwart an assassination plot, she said, bringing a round of laughter from family and servants alike. West looked down at his eggs again, his gaze lingering on the glistening mess. Thanks to Claire, they'd never believe him if he told them what he'd heard now, would presume it was just another one of his infamous tricks. Come to think of it, the authorities probably would think it another one of his practical jokes as well. He knew all too well there was a two-inch thick file with his name on it in the local constable's office, overlooked only because of his father's generous contribution to the Fund for Constabulary Widows and Orphans. How was he to convince someone to take his worries seriously if they all refused to believe he was capable of anything more than an elaborately planned hoax? Claire slid the folded bit of newsprint across the table to their mother. His newest sin is ruining Miss Mary Channing, the Earl of Havisham's sister. It happened last night, and the gossip columns have all covered it quite thoroughly this morning, even going so far as to identify the poor woman by name. She leaned back in her chair, not needing to say the rest of it. And I've come this morning to ensure he makes amends. West's mother unfolded the gossip column, her lips moving silently as she read. West waited in stiff silence. It was usually considered quite a badge of honour to hold a featured spot in the daily rags, but this morning it felt far less a badge than a noose. Geoffrey, his mother gasped, looking up through rounded eyes. Is this horrible bit of gossip true? Yes. He met and held his parents' shocked gazes. They might not believe an excuse of a treasonous plot, but his past romantic adventures and rumours of his exploits about town ensured they would believe this about him. I simply hadn't had a chance to say anything yet. I had planned to tell you both. And he had. This was no simple rig to be swept under a rug. He wasn't at school, where expulsion was the worst he could expect, or on board a ship, where a half-dozen lashes with a cat of nines would set things straight.
He could feel the weight of his sister's disappointment and the desperation that had brought her here running below the surface of this conversation. He couldn't ruin his family. Claire's and Daniel's hard work was the only thing holding the hospital together. And he couldn't leave Miss Channing to face the gossip alone either. He'd picked the worst woman possible to follow into the library. No matter the wild nature of his randy exploits, he'd never before, not even once, been linked to the ruin of an innocent. This was all new territory, and he felt as if he was floundering, coming up for air only to find he was destined for a life below water. He glared at Claire, irritated she'd not had enough faith in him to let him do the right thing without coercion for telling their parents before he'd found a chance to do it himself. He wasn't skirting his duties. He'd known his path from the moment that library door had opened last night and he'd discovered a crowd of gaping eyes instead of just his sister. Even if news of this misadventure hadn't gotten printed in the gossip columns, he would have still done it. Father, he said, looking up with a grimace, I must ask you to put in a good word for me with the Archbishop this morning. The Archbishop? Lord Cardwell asked in confusion. But why? Isn't it obvious? West pushed his untouched plate away, nearly, in that moment, hating his life. Mother was just wishing for children at the breakfast table again. Well, it seems she shall have her wish, because I'm bringing home a bride. Look on the bright side, Mary suggested. It's done, and I can't be ruined twice. She glanced down at her lap, at the small but disastrous column that was printed in the morning's gossip rag. She traced a finger over the caricature someone had drawn of her, her nipple bared to the room, a sea of shocked faces peering in from all sides. It wasn't even a good likeness of Mr. Westmore. He hadn't had quite such a leering expression on his face last night. Though I am a bit affronted, my downfall has been chronicled in a gossip rag instead of a good book, she added, trying to lighten the mood. Why would her sister even subscribe to a scandal sheet like this? There were so many more interesting things one could read. How can you joke about this? Eleanor moaned, rubbing her eyes. The circles under her eyes had grown darker since yesterday, and as Mary remembered Dr. Merrill's warning, she eyed her sister with unease. Patrick and Julianne are going to have my very skin, Eleanor added, sounding distraught. I promised them I would keep you safe on this trip to London, and instead I have orchestrated your ruin. Mary sighed. Could we not talk about something else? Yes, she was ruined. Humiliated, mortified, shamed, disgraced, any word would do. Eleanor and the gossip rag seemed to have used all of them ad nauseum. But as Mary had never had any actual prospects to disappoint, surely this definition of ruin was a matter of semantics. And now that it was done, she was having trouble understanding why everyone was so upset, why it was portrayed as such a tragedy in the books she had read. As altered as she was supposed to be, on the inside she felt much the same person she had been yesterday, albeit now with a heated memory of a kiss that kept returning at the oddest moments. She was really rather impressed with her fortitude, Perhaps she was more suited for adventure than her family believed, and besides, there was a far bigger matter at stake than what to do about her reputation. Someone was plotting an assassination. It had been a devastating thing to overhear last night. Worse still, to contemplate this morning. The urge to tell Eleanor itched beneath her skin. About last night, Mary tossed the gossip rag to one side and leaned forward. I overheard something important when I was in the library. Was it the sound of your reputation shattering? 
Eleanor asked sharply. Because I am surprised I didn't hear it in my sleep. Mary flinched to hear her sister's harsh words. No, it was a plot. A plot? Eleanor clutched a hand to her swollen abdomen. A plot? She breathed in through her nose. Mary, you need to stop it. Yes, exactly. That's what I am trying to do. No. Eleanor snapped, the smudges beneath her eyes looking more like bruises now. Stop inventing excuses. Stop imagining things. Just stop. Mary gaped at her sister. You don't understand. At the end. The end? Eleanor was nearly shouting now, her words raw and trembling. The only ending you ought to be worried about is your own. How can you sit there, nattering on about an imaginary plot? This isn't one of your novels, Mary. This time it's real. Do you realize your life is now ruined? Any hope you might have held for meeting a nice gentleman during your time here in London, of finding the husband that just yesterday you confessed you wanted, is now moot. Mary cringed. Not because it was all true, but because she could see, then, her sister didn't believe her about the assassination plot she had overheard. Or rather, wouldn't believe her. And perhaps that was a good thing. Eleanor was growing more agitated by the second, piling additional horrors like assassination plots on top of her scandal might well force her sister into an early delivery. Dr. Mariel had issued a stern warning for her sister to avoid any and all excitement, and as her companion during this confinement, it was supposed to be Mary's responsibility to ensure it. Instead, she'd invited dark circles and drama into her sister's life. What had she been thinking, trying to talk to Eleanor? She couldn't talk to anyone about this. Anyone that was, except her villain. The thought of him made Mary's cheeks heat in a most unfortunate fashion. Mr. Westmore. Not that she needed to say his name to think of him. Every time she closed her eyes, she saw the face of a perfect scoundrel. On the matter of suitors, she said weakly, deciding that perhaps a change of subject was in order. Perhaps hope isn't entirely lost. Mr. Westmore could still call on me, you know. Mr. Westmore, Eleanor retorted, rolling her eyes. You should not admit him if he did. She shook her finger at Mary. I want you to stay far, far away from that man. Mary recoiled from the venom in her sister's tone. Clearly, she ought to have chosen her new topic with greater care. I should think keeping far, far away is going to be a bit difficult, given that he is one of your neighbours, she said cautiously. What have you heard about him? That is, beyond what was printed in the scandal sheet this morning. What haven't I heard about him? He's not to be trusted. He's a... a... scoundrel? A delicious shiver ran up Mary's spine to finally say it out loud. Degenerate! Eleanor declared. This isn't the first time he's been in the gossip rags, and it won't be the last. His antics are legendary. He and his friend, Mr. Grant, are no better than drunkards, and he always seems to be in the thick of any controversy. So he is high-spirited. Mary thought back on her various interactions with the man. Though he'd certainly confirmed her sister's claims that morning in the garden, he hadn't seemed drunk last night, not even close. His lips had closed over hers with straight assurance. Surely a drunk man would have slobbered. High-spirited! For heaven's sake, he's not a horse! Eleanor snapped. Though, judging by the rumours, he's as randy as a stallion, chasing after women twice his own age. She sat up straighter, then looked from right to left, as if searching for servants who might overhear what she was about to say. They say he once had relations with his sister's governess.
Mary's imagination immediately conjured a vision of an adolescent boy peeking under his grey haired tutor's skirts. Mr. Westmore seemed young, perhaps even a year or two younger than herself, although perhaps he was an early bloomer. And who on earth was this they Eleanor was talking about? Surely her sister didn't believe everything she heard or read. Hearing a bit of gossip does not necessarily mean it is true, Mary argued weakly, though she could scarcely countenance the urge she felt to defend the man. She gestured to the discarded gossip rag, knowing that the details of last night's shameful encounter had been grossly exaggerated. For example, only one of her nipples had been exposed. The cartoonist had gleefully drawn two. I generally prefer to believe things I see myself, she added, not a rumour someone has overheard. Eleanor flushed. Well then, you should know I saw him engage in entirely disreputable behaviour with my own eyes just last month at the opening of the new Royal Opera House. You saw him? Everyone saw him. He was with his friend Mr. Grant and a red-haired prostitute in the Cardwell Opera Box. Mary's cheeks burned. In fact, her whole body felt feverishly hot, and an odd fluttering had started up in her stomach. What did you see? Her ears burned in anticipation. Eleanor finally had the grace to look less sure of herself. Well, I kept my eyes focused on the stage, as any proper lady would, but from the corner of my eye I could see the woman's feet thrashing about. One of her slippers came off and went sailing over the balcony railing. She appeared to be quite enjoying herself. With two men. Mary closed her mouth, which had somehow popped open in astonishment. Good heavens! How would that even work? Oh, it gets worse than that. Eleanor leaned forward. Ashington told me that he heard Westmore once had four women at one time, and two of them were sisters. Mary squeaked. Four women at once? She'd never heard of such a twisted, unnatural thing. She wished suddenly she could go back to Mr. Westmore's transgressions only being about an ageing governess. At least there had only been one of her. Well... As long as they weren't married women, she laughed weakly, striving for a joke. Oh, I am quite sure he considers married women fair game as well, and most of the matrons in town seem all too indulgent of his carnal appetites. He's already caused one duel, thanks to his philandering nature. But I thought duels were no longer strictly legal, Mary protested. Well, I don't think legalities mean much to a man like Mr. Westmore, because there are also rumours he once had intimate relations with a corpse, Eleanor said tartly. Mary gasped, forgetting for the moment about the rumoured duel. A corpse? Her cheeks were now so hot they ought to blister. It was worse, far worse, than anything she'd ever read in the pages of a novel. She'd been kissed by a man who'd done unspeakable things to a dead body. And then, and really, this was the most mortifying piece of it, she'd kissed him back. Not that it's hampered his appeal in any way, mind you, Eleanor said, sounding disgusted. The society cows are all a flutter whenever he walks by. Why, women practically knock themselves over in the stampede to earn a chance in his bed. And he cavorts about, basking in their adoration. Can you imagine? she demanded, her voice going shrill. The utter egotism of the man! Mary could believe it too well. She recalled Mr. Westmore's words from last night, how he'd claimed that most women begged him for a kiss. He certainly had a unique confidence in his abilities. Mary looked down at her ink-stained hands. She was beginning to imagine something else as well, something beyond a belief in Mr. Westmore's arrogance and willingness to consort with corpses.
Could he really be that exemplary, so skilled as a lover, that women might truly elbow their way to the front of the line for a chance in his bed? That was an entirely different notion of ruin than the one she was facing at present, and in spite of it all, it hardly seemed fair to get the short end of that stick. Chapter Seven. West was shown to Lord Ashington's drawing room with an apology from the butler that Lady Ashington regretted being indisposed due to her condition, and was therefore unable to rip into him herself. Not that he didn't deserve the sentiment, given what had occurred with the woman's sister, but still, perhaps a lack of decorum ran in her family. Bloody wonderful. Any children resulting from this terrible plan would almost certainly be laughing stocks, given that a lack of decorum most definitely ran in his own. He shifted from foot to foot as he waited to see if he would be received, as if such a mindless movement could redistribute the embarrassment of his morning and the weight of the special license sitting in his pocket. He caught sight of the clock on the mantel. Realized it was already half past three. Normally he would just be shaking himself from bed about now, heading to White's to meet Grant for a glass or five, throwing himself into a ripping good game of billiards, plotting his next rig. Instead, he'd been up since dawn and had spent a useless few hours at Scotland Yard, where he'd first tried to lodge his complaint. The uniformed officer pretending to take his statement had sniggered, especially when West couldn't give an actual name as to whom the plot might be directed against. The man had shooed him out, waving the gossip rag in his face, snorting about past jokes and the like. A reputation with the ladies was all well and good, but it seemed West's legend in those areas was proving a poor inducement for constabulary action. Miss Channing appeared in the drawing room doorway so quietly his initial misnomer was brought to mind, Miss Mouse. She looked it today too, clad in a hideous mud-coloured dress, her dark hair pulled back into a braid wound about her head, her nose lacking only whiskers for the full mousy effect. He thought back to their first meeting when he'd teased her over the sodden rosebush. That, he suspected, was the real Miss Channing, not the kiss-seeking siren who had given him a cockstand in St. Bartholomew's Medical Library last night. Today there was no tempting nipple in sight, nor hint of rounded bosom either. She must be wearing one of those utilitarian corsets beneath all that wool, the ugly sort women wore when they weren't trying to tempt a man. That was the first request he'd make as her husband. Miss Channing should wear only French lingerie, something scandalous underneath to brighten up the bland exterior of their future lives. A grey-haired housekeeper hovered a few steps behind, no doubt intended to serve a chaperone. Perhaps Miss Channing was suffering an ill-timed return to respectable behaviour. Unfortunately, it was little too late for that. She stepped into the drawing room. Her hands laced in front of her plain wool skirts. He cleared his throat, suddenly nervous, though he'd known what his path must be from the moment Claire had revealed who exactly this woman was. Miss Channing, he began, before his nerves utterly failed him. I have come to make amends. She said nothing in response; merely raised a brow. He summoned the words he'd practiced no less than a dozen times on the way here. Given the unfortunate events of last evening, I am prepared to marry you with all due haste. Plain brown eyes assessed him, as unexceptional as her hair. She wasn't his usual sort at all, which was to say she was neither overtly attractive nor skilled in ways that mattered. And good God, was that ink he spied staining her hands? He was doing her a favour, coming up to scratch like this. He could have any woman he wanted in London, and frequently did. She ought to be very glad he was a man who owned up to his mistakes. She lifted her chin, and then she said, 
No. And not a whisper of a word either, but an emphatically delivered syllable that bounced about in his skull before falling into a final state of understanding. Was she deranged? Deluded? But you have to, he protested. Your reputation, my reputation, is hardly the concern of a man who hasn't a care for his own. West stopped. Good God, she had him there. His only concern for his own hide at present was that he feared it was about to be shackled to her. Nonetheless, I must beg you. Begging does not suit you, Mr. Westmore. You will not change my mind. I will not marry you. Honestly, I do not even like you. West gaped at her, still trying to wrap his head around the fact that she had refused him. For God's sake, did the woman not understand her starring role in the morning's gossip rags? I am not sure liking me has much to do with marriage, he muttered. His vision felt blurred at the absurdity of this conversation. She had refused him. His ego was positively twitching. Usually, women knocked themselves silly for a chance in his bed, emboldened by the rumours of his exploits, wanting to count him among their conquests. He'd never had a woman refuse him before, at least not since that trip to Florence, when he and Grant had been nineteen and utterly full of themselves. That trip had inspired his early academic interest in architecture, but it had also inspired some memorable misbehaviour. Grant had dared him to proposition a pretty but devout nun for a kiss in the vestibule of the Cathedral de Santa Maria del Fiore. Never one to back out on a dare, West had turned on the charm. The nun had said no, too, in much the same tone. West had regrouped, dusted off his self-esteem, and chosen his targets more carefully in the future. But Miss Channing didn't seem interested in being his latest target. In fact, she was pinching her lips into a straight line that bespoke a great irritation rather than any great attraction. She cut a pointed look toward the housekeeper. Would you please give us a moment alone, Mrs. Greaves? It seems Mr. Westmore needs a bit more convincing of my feelings on this matter. I would spare him the humiliation of another public refusal. The housekeeper did as she was told, and Miss Channing closed the door firmly behind the woman. As she turned back to face him, West glanced uneasily at the closed door. What in the devil? I, that is, shouldn't we leave the door open? She lifted her chin. No. He was beginning to hate the word, no matter that this morning he'd felt like shouting it himself as he'd considered his limited options to fix this mess. The single syllable flowed off her lips like melted butter, but it scalded like molten lead on impact. Isn't this a little too close to the situation that got us into this trouble last night, he pointed out. Her brows rose, mocking him. I shut the door this time, which means it was my decision, not yours. She moved toward him, her mouth losing some of its pinched shape. And there is the small matter that no one in this room is plotting an assassination. Good Christ! You don't mince words, do you, Miss Channing? On the contrary, I just minced them for Mrs. Greaves. She advanced on him. But I didn't want an audience for this discussion, not until we have a proper plan in place. I don't know who to trust, and the servants are prone to gossip. Well, trusting me is a poor idea. God knew he didn't trust himself, especially not around her. Do you know, that is just what my sister said. She took another step toward him, sparking a feeling in his gut the very opposite of unpleasant. But I have to, you see. There is no one else. I tried talking to my sister, but she didn't believe me, and I... Well, she is expecting... She winced. Such unpleasantness could be harmful for her and the baby. She came to a stop within touching distance, but not, he noticed, within kissing distance. As he had last night, he caught the lovely, titillating scent of sugared lemons floating off her skin. Did she bathe in the stuff?
Perhaps she intended to ward off suitors and vampires. So tell me, Mr. Westmore, her chin lifted, what are we going to do about what we heard in the library? As I said last night, Miss Channing, he ground out, we aren't going to do anything. This isn't a matter you should concern yourself with. Though, maddeningly, it wasn't a matter anyone else seemed willing to concern themselves with either. The peelers at Scotland Yard ought to have at least written his statement down, looked into things, humoured him. Well, I am concerned. Someone is plotting to kill someone important by the sounds of things, and, if I may be frank, this business of trying to swoop in like a white knight to save my reputation with a marriage proposal is a distraction we don't need right now. We have to do something. Given that my sister doesn't believe me, it falls to you. She hesitated. Have you told anyone? West's jaw grew tighter. She might have a mousy exterior, but she seemed to know just how to poke at him, stir his agitation. He was well tested in battle, but the voices from the library belonged to a nameless, faceless sort of enemy. And no matter Miss Channing's enthusiasm for the topic, he was the wrong man for the job. I tried to talk to my sister about it, he admitted. She doesn't believe me. No one in my family will. They all believe it is a joke of some kind. I am afraid I have a bit of a reputation for such things. Yes, I've received quite an earful this morning about your reputation. In spite of the gravity of the situation, West's lips twitched. So, Miss Channing had heard something of his reputation, had she? And she was still standing in front of him, close enough to touch. That was... interesting. She tapped a finger against her lips. Then I suppose we must go to Scotland Yard. They will know what to do. I've already tried this morning, West confessed. I'm afraid they didn't believe me either. Her eyes narrowed. Why ever not? I am on a list. What sort of a list? He shifted uncomfortably. This morning's experience with the police had been illuminating. It was going to be an impossible task getting someone to listen. Thanks to the gossip rag confirming their little adventure last night and his own less than stellar history, no one in a position of authority would believe either of them. They could tell the unvarnished, God's honest truth, and everyone would presume it was a distraction they had invented to divert attention from their own scandal. Worse, facing Miss Channing's question reminded him how he'd dug this hole for himself since his return from Crimea. He might have a goddamned Victoria Cross gathering dust on top of his bureau, but he wasn't a man people should trust, and for arguably good reason. Apparently I've caused them to waste too much time of late, he admitted. Her mouth rounded in surprise. Scotland Yard has you on a watch list. Yes, they tend to do that after you play a joke on the bride of a duke. She gaped at him, her mouth open in a perfect O oh of surprise. West shrugged. It was harmless, really, just a bit of fun. And perhaps a bit of revenge. When West had returned from Crimea, he and Grant sought distractions at every turn, be they bottles, barmaids, or bullies. When he'd heard Peter Wetford had come into his title as the new Duke of Southingham, he and Grant had hatched a proper prank, one for the record books. Stealing a kiss from the Duke's new bride seemed the perfect lark, sure to needle the man into an attack of apoplexy, and, in truth, Grant hated Southingham every bit as much as West did. My friend Grant and I dressed as chambermaids and tried to sneak into the Duke of Southingham's house on the night of his wedding. Our goal was to reach the bedchamber of his new bride before Southingham did and steal a kiss, or three, he admitted. But my ruse was found out too soon. Her eyes widened. What gave you away? He wiped a hand across his chin. Apparently it isn't acceptable for a chambermaid to have beard stubble, he grinned. Or, for that matter, a proper pair of stones. Mary's cheeks flamed with heat.
Surely he just hadn't said that word, a word so embarrassing, so crude, she couldn't even repeat it. But how would they know you had a pair of... Well, how would they know that? she asked, her throat tight. Weren't you wearing skirts? Honestly, what sort of practical jokester doesn't even know how to do that? I was wearing skirts at the start of the adventure, he admitted sheepishly. But I was distracted by the Duchess's uncommonly pretty maid. And then one thing led to another, he chuckled. Suffice it to say, we were discovered in flagrante delicto, and I never was able to steal that kiss I was after. Mary couldn't help it. She rolled her eyes. Eleanor had given her a dozen good reasons to vigorously distrust Mr. Westmore. She had her own reasons after the disastrous kiss behind the curtain last night. And now he was openly admitting he'd seduced a maid while dressed as a woman and plotting to kiss someone's brand new bride. She tried to summon the appropriate degree of disgust, but it was difficult to sort out the proper degree of outrage she ought to feel when he delivered the story with such a saucy grin. He didn't look like a man who might enjoy relations with four women, or a governess, or a corpse. No, drat it all, he looked like a hero from the pages of one of her books, earnest and faithful and unerringly handsome. But that was neither here nor there. His bedroom habits and his penchant for saying and doing scandalous things were not her primary concern. Someone was plotting an assassination attempt, and her imagination was insisting the target must be terribly influential to require four people, a clandestine meeting, and the future exchange of a large sum of money. Britain's reach was vast, India, the Orient. She imagined the world thrown into chaos, wars potentially lost. Beyond the political cost, though, lay something sharper, a fierce understanding that if not her, if not them, then who would act? If Scotland Yard would not help, if neither of them were to be believed by sceptical family members, then that meant they were the only ones who possessed the ability to do something here. Ever since she'd heard those dreadful words from behind the library curtain, she'd felt jerked back in time, unpleasant memories crowding out the embarrassment of her ruin. So many years ago, when her brother and father had been killed, she'd been a helpless child, reeling in the face of that unimaginable loss. On more occasions than she could count, she'd wished for the ability to go back in time, to do something that might change the new, terrifying course of her life. Well, here she was, on the cusp of another tragedy. Only this time, she was a woman grown. She was here, in London, supposedly tasked with rediscovering her spark. She had been miraculously unsheathed from her usual timidity, thanks to a gossip rag and a bit of embarrassment. And this time, she was not going to shrink into herself and let this terrible thing happen without at least trying to do something to stop it. Well, if Scotland Yard will not help, we must track them down ourselves, she said, determined to be brave. She extracted the list she'd made earlier from her sleeve and opened it with a flourish. I took the liberty of compiling a list of likely targets so we might organise our thoughts. She smoothed a finger over the three names she had written down. Number one, the Prime Minister. She received only a pointed silence in response. She looked up, wondering if perhaps he had become distracted by something shiny. But no... He was gaping at her. She lifted a hand to her temple, wondering if perhaps he was staring because her hair was coming down. It was still anchored firmly in its braid. Mr. Westmore, she said sharply, I need you to focus. She handed him the list to read himself, then began to pace the length of the drawing room, avoiding the freshly cut flowers sitting in a vase on the mantel. The smell reminded her too much, that Mr. Westmore was a scoundrel in whom she was being forced to place some measure of trust. Read on, if you please. Number two, 
he said weakly, looking down at the piece of paper she'd thrust into his hands. A foreign diplomat or spy? He rubbed his forehead. Actually, that suggestion makes a good deal of sense. Of course, she rolled her eyes. What do you think of number three? There was a moment's hesitation as he glanced down once more. The queen, he said, his voice tightening. I put her as number three because I was trying to give the other ideas due merit, but I really think she is the most likely target, don't you? After all, there have been several past assassination attempts. He folded the paper, his face unreadable. None of which were successful, just the rambling efforts of madmen. A good point, she conceded. We should probably consult with the staff at Bedlam. We could see if anyone has been released recently, someone who might harbour political ill will toward the crown. His gaze lifted, and she felt the impact of his doubt like a sharp pinch to her arm. I hardly think a visit to Bedlam will help, Miss Channing. Why not? she asked, growing irritated by his lack of enthusiasm. Because those who are admitted to Bedlam rarely come out, particularly not if they've been spouting nonsense about killing the Queen. Suffice it to say, I feel sure Scotland Yard would take their word far more seriously than they seem inclined to take my own. She glared at him. But perhaps someone on staff there might offer us guidance as to the sort of person we ought to be looking for, the kind of man who might do such a thing. Presumably, they have a good deal of experience with madmen. He inclined his head, studying her as though she had two heads. Which she didn't. She only had one. But it was quite a useful head, thank you very much. And she wasn't inclined to pretend it wasn't, just because his proximity made her squirm like a fish on a hook. It seems you have given this matter a good deal of serious thought. He shoved the folded list into his pocket, and his lips twitched upward. Tell me, Miss Channing. He spread his hands in front of his body. Did you lie awake in bed last night, thinking of all of this? The suggestion in his voice was unmistakable. It was not at all proper for a gentleman to say such things to an unmarried woman, and worse, his words were too close to the truth for comfort. Well, I certainly didn't lie awake last night thinking of you, she retorted, hoping he couldn't see through her bravado to the lie lurking beneath. In truth, she'd taken it upon herself to make the list last night because she had required a noble distraction. She couldn't otherwise stop thinking about him. Even now, her thoughts kept drifting insistently toward the kiss they had shared, the way his hand had felt pressed against her breast, the way she had felt kissing him back. Her face heated, and she pressed a hand against the side of her cheek. Drat it all. Now she was most definitely thinking about him. And she couldn't distract herself with lists at the present moment, not when the list that wanted to materialize in her mind started with Number one, close the distance between them. Number two, press her lips against his one more time. Are you ill, Miss Channing? He smirked at her, and in that moment she could have sworn he could see through her thoughts and her dress to what lay beneath. She shook her head impatiently. No. He might be smirking, but at least he wasn't laughing at her yet. Then again, he wasn't yet aware of her very active imagination and the long history of teasing from family and friends that came with that. Just impatient. You've not commented on the likelihood of anyone on my list beyond the Queen. Very well, then. His smirk fell away, and he sounded nearly pained by her insistence on a proper analysis. Why the Prime Minister? Lord Derby is newly appointed. Surely it is too soon for him to have developed such motivated political enemies. The men in the library mentioned the word constitution, she said, taking a cautious step toward him. That seems to imply some connection to a government, and Lord Derby is presently the most powerful political figure in Britain. Except you are forgetting the fact that Britain doesn't have a proper constitution. He shrugged. Although I suppose it could be the Americans.
They are always going on about theirs, as if it is necessary to have a piece of paper and a handful of signatures to establish a nation's civility. Another idea took hold. Could they mean Constitution Hill? She thought of the popular open road that led from Buckingham Palace to Hyde Park. Important figures travelled the route with predictable regularity. Weren't shots fired from there during one of the Queen's previous assassination attempts? He lifted a brow. You know your history, Miss Channing. I do possess the ability to read. It was in all the papers. Ah, yes, reading. His lips quirked. Not surprising you might enjoy such a pedestrian activity. We did, after all, first meet in a library. Drat the man for reminding her of that when she was trying so hard to forget. Though to hear him denigrate the one activity at which she actually excelled made it a bit easier to hate him in this moment. Actually, I believe we first met in a garden, she pointed out. You were urinating on a rose bush. The problem, he said, not seeming the least bit bothered by the reminder of what should have been a shameful encounter, is that the word constitution could refer to so many things. They might have been referring to the character of some organization, or they could have simply been describing their chosen assassin's specific constitution for drawing blood, he shrugged. It is better not to speculate, lest it lead us down a wrong path. Mary looked at him. Her gaze wanted to linger a little too long on the angular planes of his face, not an impulse one wanted to suffer with a man one didn't intend to marry. Irritated with herself for such weakness, and angry with Mr. Westmore for posing such a singular distraction, she straightened her shoulders. We must speculate as to the meaning. The word constitution is one of our only clues, and we need to follow it. He snorted. It is to be we, is it? Mary hesitated. She would be the first to admit she wasn't exactly a good choice for this adventure. She still hadn't conjured enough bravery to venture back out into the flower garden, and Eleanor needed her here in case the baby came early. Still, that burning desire to act, to do something, would not leave her be. I only meant... She started, but stopped when she saw his upraised hands. You are forgetting, he said, that I have other clues. She resented, a bit, how easily he'd substituted the word I. Such as? One of the women in the library called one of the plotters your grace. There are only a few dozen men who can claim a ducal title in Britain. Excitement began to buzz in her head. It was very close to the way Mary felt when she was reading a delicious new book, and the hero managed to surprise her. Why hadn't she thought of that? Probably because she spent very little time in the company of dukes. Or, for that matter, future viscounts. And they made plans to meet this Sunday at St. Paul's Cathedral, she exclaimed, her enthusiasm drumming louder now. She took a step closer, forgetting, for the moment, that Mr. Westmore was supposed to be dangerous, and that she was supposed to find him abhorrent. He was now close enough to touch, and her fingers nearly twitched with the temptation of that thought. So, we must go to service in St. Paul's this Sunday, she said, and see which dukes are in attendance. Westmore's hand came up to chuck her under the chin, even as he flushed her another smirk. To quote a woman of my very recent acquaintance, he drawled, no. He turned away and headed toward the drawing room door, his voice trailing over his shoulder. I will provide the legs for this investigation. You will stay out of this and leave the matter to those who can handle a bit of danger without fainting dead away. But I want to come, she protested, resenting the way his hand was already reaching for the door. As odd as the sentiment was, given that she'd practically had to be dragged to last night's literary salon, she found that in this moment she wanted to be involved. And in truth, she'd only fainted last night because of the unnatural, vice-like grip of Eleanor's borrowed corset. She'd found it impossible to breathe when she'd most needed to.
But wearing her own front lacing corset, surely she'd be able to. He glared at her over his shoulder, severing that line of thought. This is far too dangerous a mission for you, and I'll be damned if I will be held responsible for your ruin and your death, Miss Channing. I will attend services myself on Sunday. Identify and stop the traitors if I can. And if you are unsuccessful in that endeavour, she retorted. She ought to be glad he seemed poised to do something, but instead she felt hurt. He was planning to exclude her when it had been her own idea to attend Sunday services to look for them. How could he? She was every bit as much a part of this as he was. More so, in fact. She had sacrificed her reputation, furtive, fledgling thing that it had been, to uncover this plot. He'd done nothing more noteworthy than kiss her behind some curtains and then give her a fumbled proposal of marriage. His face turned grim. Then at least I will have more information on which to make an informed decision, and you shall be safely at home where you belong. From the Diary of Miss Mary Channing, June the 4th, 1858 When did my life become so reminiscent of the plot of a torrid novel? Even my situation with the gossip rag has a ring of gothic tragedy to it, tinged with a touch of comedy. Perhaps it is an unfortunate side effect of being ruined, but it seems as if I no longer have anything to lose. I ought to be terrified, hiding in my room, reading my precious books. But instead, I am angry that Mr. Westmore has dismissed me from his plans. Eleanor congratulated me on turning Mr. Westmore down in his offer of marriage and assured me I have made the correct choice. But a betrothal would have forced Mr. Westmore to take me seriously. At the very least, he would have had to take me along with him this coming Sunday, which means, I am sorry to say, I am no longer sure I did the right thing. Chapter 8 West woke up in sweat-soaked sheets, his arms thrashing, lungs working like a bellows. Damn it all, the nightmares were back. He'd begun to imagine he'd outrun them. In the months after his return from Crimea, they'd come close to consuming him. Their determination to creep into his nocturnal thoughts was part of the reason he preferred late nights in strangers' beds. A dreamless sleep was a hard-fought luxury in his world, most commonly achieved with a potent combination of strong spirits and the distraction of sweet, feminine flesh. But in the past few days, those nightmares had returned with a vengeance, and strong spirits and sweet, feminine flesh had been sorely lacking in his world. He scrubbed his forehead, slick with sweat, Miss Channing had been in this dream, which was a terrifying departure from the usual script. He ought to be relieved she'd refused his offer of marriage so neatly, releasing him from any obligation of propriety. Ought to be forgetting all about her, instead of dreaming about her at importune times. And what cause had a mouse-like virgin to be gallivanting about his battle scenes? In this nightmare, she'd been in grave danger— held at the point of a traitor's gun. No doubt that was why he felt strung as tightly as a bow. He was convinced now, more than ever, of his rightness in dismissing her earnest attempts to help track down the traitors. She might be a bookish miss with a few good ideas, but Miss Channing was also an innocent. He couldn't apply his mind to the problem at hand if he was constantly worrying about her safety. And, if nothing else, this morning's dream was a vivid enough reminder of why she shouldn't be involved in this. He forced his body to unclench, though he still felt the thump of readiness in his veins. Thoughts of danger and mousy virgins receded to their proper shadows, and he turned an ear to the house outside his door. Had he awakened the house with his shouts this time? He didn't hear anyone stirring about, but then when he'd come back from Crimea, he'd asked for a room on the little-used west wing of the house, because he'd known his nightmares would cause worry if others heard him. 
If Wilson had any idea that he sometimes still slept poorly, or that his nocturnal demons had returned, the servant would probably launch into yet another ill-timed lecture. The nightmares were almost preferable. He dragged a hand through his sweat-dampened hair. Outside his window, the light was just warming. He well knew this time of day. Usually, he'd just be stumbling home from his evening's exploits. It was too bloody early to be getting out of bed. Perhaps that was the trouble here. Since the business with the assassination plot, he'd been... distracted. His parents had been nearly relieved when he told them Miss Channing had very sensibly refused his honourable offer, but he'd felt a lingering sense of unease. Not because he wanted to marry her, he didn't, but something about the notion that she didn't want to marry him sat poorly in his gut. He'd spent the past few days pursuing the leads on Miss Channing's rather well-thought-out list. In spite of his claims to the contrary, he'd even made inquiries at Bedlam, not knowing what else to do. Unfortunately, the officials there had taken his inquiries about as seriously as the authorities at Scotland Yard, and he'd come to the conclusion that escape and lucid plotting were probably beyond the capabilities of anyone fortunate enough to survive a stay there. So he'd returned to Scotland Yard, trying to argue his case again. This time, he'd come close to smashing the nose of the snivelling constable who, once again, refused to take his statement. Since that memorable failure, he'd been waiting for Sunday, restless and relentless. He'd come to the irrevocable conclusion he needed to find the traitors himself, if only so he could descend back into a welcome oblivion. And while his quarry may have eluded him so far, he was determined to end it today. Which was why ten o'clock that Sunday morning saw the birth of a proper miracle. West, up properly dressed, and stepping through the doors of St. Paul's Cathedral. In a past life, he would have come here with his family on a Sunday just to ogle the gorgeous, swooping lines of the high, arched ceiling. But his taste for unique architecture had dulled since his return from Crimea, and today he pushed inside without looking up. God, how long had it been since he'd attended church— for one, these days he was rarely up early enough on Sunday mornings to drag his still inebriated arse to a pew, and for another, he found it difficult to truly regret the various lust fueled sins he was expected to repent. He half wished Wilson could see him now. Then again, he'd probably just earn a lecture from the old servant for having missed so many Sundays in the past. The day was hot and bound to get hotter. The crowd seemed lighter than usual, no doubt thanks to the smell rolling in through the open doors at the rear of the cathedral. The overheated Thames had blanketed the city with its stench for nigh on a week now and seemed to only be getting worse. Many families who usually stayed through the end of the season had already packed their things and retreated to the cooler countryside. There was even talk of ending the current parliamentary session early, and it looked as though many of the pews were empty today. West was glad to see it. Fewer dukes to sort out. Those who had braved the stench were just settling into their seats. As he lurked near the centre of the outer vestibule, studying those in attendance, he considered again whether the traitor he sought might be someone he knew. Though the voice he remembered from the library had seemed vaguely familiar, he couldn't quite put his finger on where he'd heard it before. And, unfortunately, West knew an awful lot of dukes. To his right, he could see the Duke of Rothsey, his bulk spreading across the bench. West discounted the man almost immediately— that night in the library, his view had been hampered by darkness, but he'd at least gotten a glimpse of the men's profiles. Rothsay's girth was too large to match either of the men from the library. The Duke of Strathern shuffled past, and West considered whether the stooped old man might be a viable candidate for treason.
But the voice he'd overheard in the library, while delivered as a terse whisper, had struck him as belonging to someone younger. Strathern was seventy, if he was a day. Unfortunately, discounting two dukes didn't even scratch the surface of the possibilities. He stared out across the rows of benches, discarding some ideas, turning over others. He didn't particularly like dukes, although he could allow there were a few out there that weren't so dodgy. The thought of bringing at least one of them down a peg or two gave him a devilish sort of pleasure. He thought back to his experience at Harrow and the endless torture he and Grant had endured at the hands of Peter Wetford, the eldest son of the Duke of Southingham. The boy had used his superior standing as a formidable shield against retaliation. The one time West had even tried to physically defend himself, he'd found himself dragged before the headmaster, threatened with expulsion. It had been a lesson he'd long remembered. One didn't go about striking peers of a superior rank, no matter what they did to you. Truly, the rats had been his only option for teaching the arrogant sod a lesson. West was startled from those unwelcome memories by the sudden scent of lemons, nicely pushing out the eau de Thames. The realization of what that meant made his hands curl to fists. He turned his head and caught Miss Channing's slender profile marching by. Bloody hell, it was the woman who'd refused to marry him. He stared at her as she passed by, his mouth open in surprise. Had she come to church because she'd changed her mind on that front? Perhaps she wished to accept his offer after all. For some bizarre reason, the idea didn't seem to carry quite the same degree of dread today as it had only a few days ago. And the sight of her felt like a punch to the gut. She was wearing brown wool again, and she was walking beside the same stern-looking housekeeper who had served as a chaperone during their drawing-room conversation. She did not glance toward him or give any sign that she recognized him. In fact, they sailed right by him, as if he was beneath their notice. But then Miss Channing suddenly stopped, reached into her reticule, pulled out a handkerchief and clutched it to her nose. Oh, Mrs. Greaves, he heard her gasp. What is that terrible smell? Tis the Thames, miss. The older woman frowned. They've got the doors open on account of the heat. Is it bothering you too much to stay? No, we can't leave when we've come all this way. I... I think I'll be all right. Miss Channing waved the older woman on. Do go claim our seat down at the front. I just need to stand here a moment and adjust before I sit down. Are you sure? The housekeeper asked dubiously. Yes, quickly now, before someone takes our row. But as soon as the older woman headed down the aisle and settled her bum onto a pew, Miss Channing rounded on him, her brown eyes close to sparkling. She grabbed him by the arm and dragged him behind a large marble column until they were hidden from the view of her somewhat useless chaperone. All right, Westmore, what is our plan? And that was when it hit him. He was not entirely beneath her notice. She had plotted this come to church to vex him. And while irritation twitched through him, so too did admiration. Worse, it occurred to him that in spite of the worry that spiked through him, he was not averse to seeing her again. Damn it, Miss Channing, he growled. What are you doing here? I should think it would be obvious, she shrugged. I'm attending church. But why? Coy brown eyes met his own. To pray for your depraved soul, of course. It seems you could pray for me just as well from the safety of your home. It is a public service here, is it not? I should think my attendance would be expected, mandatory even, considering the tatters of my reputation. Her lips quirked upward. I have amends to make with God. She waited a beat, and then added, Not to mention Mr. Dickens. West choked on the laugh that wanted to escape him.
He'd imagined her many times this week, wondering if she was regretting her refusal of his offer of marriage. In spite of what ought to have been his sense of relief, he remained worried for her, what their scandal might mean to her future. He'd imagined her sad, worried, but he hadn't imagined her smiling. She quite caught him by surprise. You should be home, he warned, shaking his head, where you are safe. She rolled her eyes. I am not convinced I am any safer at home, Mr. Westmore. There are villains, you see, just outside the flower garden. Perhaps you've seen them. Heaven knows, I have, though it's an image I've tried to scrub from my mind. This time, he couldn't contain the bark of laughter that shot out of him, echoing against the high, arched ceiling. A few people in the pews across the way turned around to glare at them, but he ignored them. So, she wanted to spar, did she? Well, she'd picked the wrong gentleman for that. He'd honed his debate skills with his sisters, each of whom could reduce grown men to tears with their verbal fortitude. She didn't stand a chance. I'll tell you what I've seen, Miss Channing, he said, lowering his voice. I've seen you faint dead away, and over something as small as a bit of flesh inadvertently exposed to the literary world. Infants have more courage, resisting their afternoon naps. Drunken goldfish could navigate these waters better than you. His gaze drifted over the pretty pink curve of her lips, and in spite of himself, he had to admit her plain brown gown nicely offset the hue. Admit it, he said, more softly now. You don't have the fortitude for this. She lifted a hand to the rows of benches leading to the front of the cathedral. For church, she scoffed. I hardly think the service will be that extraordinary. In spite of himself, West chuckled. He couldn't help but approve of her grit. And, damn it all, her eyes were definitely sparkling. This was a side of her he'd not seen before. I think you've had ample time to adjust to the smell of the Thames now. He gestured to the front of the church, where most people had taken their seats. Your pew and your entirely too obedient chaperone are waiting. Not just yet, she bit her lip. Have you, uh, looked for the traitors this week? West opened his mouth, shut it again. Good Lord, the woman was trouble in a brown dress, and she really needed to lower her voice. He demonstrated the way forward, shifting his voice to more of a guttural growl. I'm considering a few possibilities. Who are you considering? those who might have cause to target one of the people from your list. She gifted him with a full-blown smile, the first he had seen from her. He sucked in a breath as the force of that smile hit him like a runaway carriage. It transformed her face from something mouse-like to something that had a hope of stirring his fantasies. Bugger it all. If she wore a smile and nothing else... He could see how she might be beautiful. Then tell me, Mr. Westmore. She stepped closer until her skirts brushed indecently against his trousers. Who are your primary suspects? I really don't think... She looped her arm through his and pulled him deeper into the vestibule, even farther out of sight of her gullible chaperone. Stop dismissing me, Mr. Westmore. I am here now, and you are not doing this without me. Now, I've read a few mystery novels, and I know how this needs to be done. She peered around a marble column, looked to the left, then to the right. We should split up, she told him, loosening her hold on his arm. Cover more ground. Ask people questions regarding their whereabouts on the evening of June 1st. West gaped at her. Was this even the same woman who had fainted in the library? Good God, woman, you can't believe that reading a mystery novel in any way prepares you to deal with tracking a real-life traitor. The woman was going to get herself injured, or worse. This was why he'd pushed her away, why he'd insisted on doing this alone.
Did she really think you could just walk up to a duke and ask if he was plotting murder? And there is no way in hell we are splitting up, he added. Now that she was here, she almost had to be a bona fide thorn in his side. He couldn't risk letting her go off half-cocked today. Any hint of their knowledge, and the man might bolt, go underground, and then they would have lost the opportunity. She put her hands on her hips. Well, if you don't like my plan, Mr. Westmore, she huffed, perhaps you might be so good as to share yours. Worse than a drunken goldfish, was she? It seemed like she wasn't the only one with a vivid imagination. But as she waited for his answer, his colourful observation gave her pause. He wasn't that far off the mark, at least not that far off her usual mark. Mary couldn't help but wonder a little herself at her seeming lack of unease. Usually she'd be hugging the walls in a place like this, avoiding eye contact, keeping her head down. But her usual reaction to strange situations seemed held at bay. Was it because she'd spent days plotting this foray, stewing in her stuffy room? Or was it because now that she was ruined, she no longer had anything to lose? Whatever the reason, she couldn't bring herself to second-guess her behaviour. She was finally doing something, not sitting back, letting life slide by, living vicariously through the pages of a book. She was going to turn her own page for once. Well, she said, growing impatient with his silence. If you must know, I was planning to stand here and listen for the voices we heard the other night. That isn't a plan. Mary felt a bit annoyed that he'd put so little thought into it when he'd all but promised her he would take care of the problem. She herself had lain awake for hours, turning over matters in her mind, scribbling thoughts down on paper. Especially given the fact that we only heard the men speak in whispers that night. Relying on your memory to identify them is relying on little more than chance. And yet, sometimes, chance has a way of working out. Take our first meeting, for example. His voice deepened. If I hadn't chanced to piss on Ashington's rose bushes that morning, we wouldn't be here now. In spite of her twitching irritation, Mary smothered the laugh that tried to bolt out of her at that. I suspect, sir, your propensity for drink and boorish behaviour means there was more than a mere chance that poor, pathetic rosebush would be your target that unfortunate morning. Her gaze really shouldn't be lingering on the smooth swoop of nose, the way his forehead wrinkled when he laughed. She needed to remember she was here for a serious reason. But somehow, the shape of his lips quite scattered her wits. She felt out of her depth, but not on account of her usual shyness. No, she felt out of her depth here today because she was coming to feel at ease in his presence. She didn't know quite what to make of it. But very well then, she finally conceded, cocking an ear toward the rustling pews. Let's pretend for a moment that yours is a good idea. She stood, listening. There are an awful lot of voices to sort through. She gestured toward the half-filled pews. Wouldn't it be better to sit down to listen? I doubt an exchange of money this important will occur out in the open like that. More likely it will occur somewhere back here. That is why I chose this particular location, Miss Channing. Oh. That really made quite a lot of sense. In fact, she should have thought of it herself. She reached into her reticule and pulled out a folded sheet of paper. While we listen, have a look at this. He took up the paper. What is this, Miss Channing? He teased, his grin returning. Have you written me a love letter? Hardly, she snorted. Honestly, did his ego know no bounds? In case our pursuit of this duke comes to naught, I have compiled a list of potential villains I think we should investigate. Another list. The smile slid from his lips. You have been busy these past few days. She shrugged. 
A woman without prospects tends to have free time on her hands. He had the good grace to look chagrined. I did offer you marriage, and I refused with good reason. Marrying you would be a nightmare. There was a moment's pause. Take it from someone who suffers nightmares, Miss Channing. You misuse the word. Either that, or you sorely misunderstand the pleasures to be found in my bed. Her cheeks heated. Good gracious, the man appeared to just say whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. Had he never had a moment's discretion? The list, Mr. Westmore. She gestured to it, annoyed with herself for reacting to his bold taunts. I did not compile it merely for my health. He looked down at the paper and unfolded it. Number one, the Orsinians. His eyes narrowed. That is actually an excellent suspicion. I thought it was important to consider the possibility after that recent assassination business in Paris this past January. He cocked his head. You know something of international politics. I read the newspapers, of course, and we sometimes discuss politics over the dinner table at my brother's home. Though, oddly, she had been thinking about that home in Yorkshire less and less, thanks to the distraction she'd been tossed into here in London. The Orsinians involved in the Paris plot this year were British citizens, so it could fit. And, by my understanding, the business with Italian unification and the extremists is nowhere close to finished. Westmore nodded. It is a good thought. We... He stopped himself. Started again. That is, I could make some subtle inquiries. See if anyone has heard rumblings of further discord on that front. He looked down at the list again. Number two, the Fenians. His mouth quirked upward on one side. Honestly, Miss Channing, the Irish? They have a reputation for ruthlessness, Mary argued, knowing this one was a bit far-fetched, and they are gaining ground in their demands for independence. Nonetheless, the Irish nationalists are poorly organised at present, and none of the people we overheard had any hint of an Irish brogue, more likely for it to be a British aristocrat who wants to pin it on the Fenians. Exactly, she nodded, glad to hear him thinking, which brings us to number three. He looked down again. She could hear the paper crinkling beneath the grip of his fingers. The Prime Minister, he asked, followed by a slightly dismissive laugh. Come now, Miss Channing, I thought he was on your list of possible targets. I mean the former Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston. He made a strangled sound. For a moment, she was tempted to whump him on the back, dislodge whatever was making his face turn pale like that, but no, whomping would involve touching him, and touching him seemed too... tempting. Best to keep her whomps to herself. That is a very serious charge, Miss Channing, he finally choked out. One that could get us both in a good deal of trouble. Lord Palmerston's resignation was forced in the wake of the Orsini affair, so it seems he has every reason to hate those in power. She ploughed on, having been over this a dozen times in her head, and inventing an enemy in the Irish could help him regain favour. And then, of course, there's number four. He pinched the bridge of his nose, looked down warily. The Russians, he asked. Truly? Haven't we reached a proper accord with them by now? I know this one may seem less likely, given that the war has been over for some time, but it stands to reason there are some people who might still harbour ill will over the embarrassment of Crimea. An embarrassment, is it? Blue eyes lifted to meet her own. Is that what you think of that business in Crimea, Miss Channing? She hesitated. She'd read of the terrible accounts from the field, the detailed coverage in the papers, the unconscionable deaths of good men due to illness and injuries, simply due to a lack of medical supplies and trained doctors. I think the men who fought were very brave, she said slowly, but I think the men who sent our young men to that war did not always give the consequences due consideration. Westmore stood, still as stone, 
the rigid slant of his shoulders, telling her very little about his mindset, other than the fact that he, too, had an opinion about such things. And then he folded up the paper and shoved it in his trouser pocket. She stared at the small motion, irritation twitching through her. Did he not agree with her reasoning? She'd put a good deal of thought into that list. They were good ideas. She felt it in her bones. And then she felt something else in her bones. A prickle of awareness. Up front, the service had started, the organ music going silent, which only made the noises around her seem more acute. She caught an urgent whisper, a rustle of silk. Westmore, she began. I hear them, he said tersely. She clutched at his arm and was relieved to feel his hand cover her own. A light squeeze, warning her to stay silent, but she didn't need the reminder. Together, they stepped around the column, eyes and ears straining toward the farthest edge of the vestibule. Mary could see a woman dressed in yellow silk, her hair tucked under a straw bonnet. She was speaking to a man who was too deep in the shadows to discern. The thought that it could be their duke made her pulse bound in her ears. They inched closer, until gradually the whispers became more distinct. Why did he not come himself? the woman asked, sounding almost angry. Mary gasped to recognize that the voice sounded the same as one of the women's from the library. He sent me instead. It was one of the men's voices from the library, the one with the harsher accent. Mary leaned forward, trying to hear. That wasn't part of the plan. Plans change, and you're to change with them. He says for you to deliver the money promptly and then wait for his word. Oh, he does, does he? The woman sounded irritated. Well, we must do as he says, mustn't we? Deliver the money, kill the queen. A chill rippled down Mary's spine. Oh, God. It wasn't the Prime Minister. It was the Queen. For the first time in her life, her wild imaginings had come true. But being right had never felt so horribly wrong. If the traitors succeeded in killing Queen Victoria, there would be political hell to pay. Alliances would be shattered. Fragile holds on peace dissolved. Worse, there were children involved, princes and princesses, who would be left without a mother. And Mary rather liked the Queen, who proved, by her very rule, that women should not be discounted in this world of suffering male politics. A basket was passed, the sort that might rest on the arm of any woman on market day. The woman in yellow turned, moved. Head down, she hurried past them, toward the open doors of the cathedral, the basket full of money looped over her arm. Stay here, Westmore snarled. From his pocket, he pulled out a pistol. Mary gasped, her heart thudding against her chest. The sight of that pistol was every bit as terrifying as the transaction they had just witnessed. Westmore, you can't shoot a woman! I am not going after her. I am going after the man, given that our duke was too much of a coward to show up himself. He glared down at her. Stay right here and do not move a bloody inch, not even if the queen herself shows up screaming at the door. Mary cast a wild glance toward the woman, who was just disappearing through the cathedral doors. The sight of the pistol in West's hand made her stomach swirl, but so, too, did the thought of losing the woman who was such a significant clue. But your promise, Miss Channing. But instead of waiting for an answer, he pressed a shocking, sudden kiss against her lips. And then he was off, sprinting toward the edge of the vestibule. She could do nothing but watch, her heart clawing its way up into her throat. She waited, every nerve stinging, terrified by the possibility of hearing a shot ring out, seeing him slump to the ground, blood spreading out around him. But, miraculously, no such sound reached her ears. The sermon droned on, punctuated by the occasional rattling snore from the congregation.
The smell from the Thames outside swirled around her, just the same as before. And eventually, Westmore returned, more slowly this time, his revolver close to his leg and pointing down toward the marble tile. Did you recognize him? she demanded, trying not to look at his gun as he drew closer. But her eyes kept pulling toward it, fear skittering through her chest. She decided that for once it was safer to stare at his sinfully shaped mouth. No. Westmore didn't even sound winded, though the pace he'd set in pursuit was impressive. But I got a good look before he escaped. Dark hair, scar on his face. I would know him again if I saw him, but whoever he is, he's gone. In spite of her resolve, Mary's eyes drifted back down to follow the glint of steel sliding back into his pocket. Somehow, knowing Westmore came to St. Paul's Cathedral armed made the situation seem more frightening, not less. Guns had never meant good things in her life. Was that in your trousers the entire time? she asked weakly. Yes. Bemusement eased the tension in his jaw. If you continue to make a habit of consorting with me, you will find that I am always prepared. Do you even know how to use it? Though he had very much looked as though he did. Miss Channing. He leaned one shoulder against a marble column, almost casually, drat the man. I'll have you know, I know how to use everything in my trousers. Her cheeks heated, as he must have known they would. She was beginning to have the sense that he said these things just to garner some reaction from her, some outward sign of discomfort. But now was not the time to ponder his purpose, and so she pushed those thoughts aside to deal with the notion at hand, which was more intriguing and frightening than what Mr. Westmore may or may not be hiding in his trousers. Did you hear what they said? she whispered. The corners of his mouth slid south. I heard. You are correct, it seems. It's the Queen. He dragged a hand through his hair. Not that having a target in mind is going to help anyone believe us, mind you. I need proof I can take before Scotland Yard. A piece of paper, a witness who can be trusted. Either that or someone in our custody offering a confession. She glanced toward the edge of the vestibule where the man had disappeared. Westmore might have had a very good chance of catching the suspect if he hadn't been distracted by making sure she was safe. I am sorry if I slowed you down. Slow me down? What on earth are you talking about? If you hadn't paused to, uh, argue with me, you might have been able to catch him. Now we have lost them both. He reached out a hand. I didn't pause to argue with you, Miss Channing. He dragged a gloved finger across her lower lip, making something other than fear bloom inside her. I paused to kiss you, two very different things. So if we have lost him, the fault is mine. Oh, she breathed. He stared down at her, as if working through a mathematical formula. Besides, we may have lost our clue to the Duke, but we have gained another. I recognized the woman. Surprise slid through her. You did? Her name is Vivian. She works at a nearby brothel. Mary's ears burned with something that might have been envy. If anyone would recognize such a woman, she supposed, of course, it would be Westmore. She ought to be glad he possessed such knowledge, if it helped them track a traitor. And she was. She was. However he'd acquired this knowledge, he was using it for the crown. If we find this woman, Mary said, we might be able to halt the flow of money and extract the confession we need. Precisely. He offered her a grudging smile. The only question is, are you going to follow me there, too? Chapter 9 Madam Xavier's looked different enough in the daylight that West's feet hesitated on the front steps.
With its red shutters and crimson brick walls, the three-story building seemed less like a brothel and more like a respectable home. He'd been here on enough occasions to be well acquainted with the establishment, but always at night, always with Grant, and always deep into his cups. But daylight revealed surprising new distractions. The building boasted a Palladian architecture, its pediments and symmetry on clear display. Should one have the wherewithal to look, West ran a finger along one column, remembering that old dusty piece of his life, a time when he'd been eager to attend classes at university, when he imagined a future creating things more memorable than a good prank. Perhaps therein lay the problem. Had he ever really looked at this house, all the women who worked here? He generally spent his time here, sitting in the receiving room, while Grant busied himself above stairs. He belted out bawdy tunes on the pianoforte and teased the scantily clad women until they blushed like schoolgirls. But he'd never lingered on the front steps with enough sobriety and presence of mind to pay attention to the shape of the columns. Perhaps he ought to have, especially given that he wasn't particularly interested in the more carnal offerings on the menu. Scarlet, the one woman at Madame Xavier's with whom he could claim a prior acquaintance, had sought him out, not the other way around. He treated her like a proper gentleman, even taking her to the opera, but the distraction she offered had ended weeks ago. Not that Scarlet seemed to understand it was over. With his hand against Miss Channing's elbow, they stepped through the front door. No matter the Palladian exterior, upon stepping inside, Westmore was reminded that he was taking Miss Channing to a place that was anything but respectable. The house's red colour scheme had been extended inside to include the floor covers and the drapery. The rich proliferation of red somehow seemed more obscene in sunlight. Pink shadows spinning across the floor. Miss Channing's eyes were as wide as saucers, her head swivelling to take it all in. I can't believe I've come from St Paul's Cathedral to a brothel, all in the space of an hour. She breathed. It's like falling straight from heaven to hell. West chuckled. Some might say it's the other way around. He'd have liked to say more, to explain that Madame Xavier's brothel was legendary, that some of the girls were cultured, even educated, and more than one of them could spend an evening engaging a gentleman in political discourse as easily as bed sport. But explaining any of this to Miss Channing, who had clearly already formed a strong opinion of his character and this place, based on the oppressive line of her lips, seemed like a waste of breath. Bald truths would be unlikely to win him any favour where she was concerned. Better to keep his knowledge of the place under wraps. And besides, standing here in daylight, he was no longer sure he'd properly considered all the reasons a woman might choose to work in this place. The notion that someone like Vivian might lead a double life—what other secrets were hidden here? Please don't say anything of that nature to the women who work here," he told her as he pulled a red velvet rope. The sound of a tinkling bell rang out, alerting the house to their arrival. Let me handle the conversation, as long as conversation is all you are planning to handle. She glowered at him, crossing her arms over her buttoned-up chest. Within a minute, Madame Xavier herself glided into the parlour, clad in a tea dress that left little to the imagination. He thought perhaps it was meant to have a gown beneath it, but the brothel owner wore only the outer robe portion of the ensemble, and you could see all the way through the sheer fabric. Miss Channing gawked at the woman, and then promptly attached herself to his arm with what felt like talons. Westmore, Madame Xavier purred as she drew to a stop in front of him, her painted lips curving into a feline smile. It is so good to see you again. Her gaze shifted to Miss Channing, and her eyes flickered with undisguised interest.
You know, we don't usually open for business until evening, though for such an old friend, I feel sure we can make an exception. Is your friend Mr. Grant not accompanying you today? Er,、uh, no. West hesitated, not yet sure how much to reveal. What if Madame Xavier knew of Vivian's treachery? Perhaps she was even involved in the plot. After all, there had been two women in the library, and he only knew the identity of one of them at present. Discretion was needed until they knew more. Inspiration came in the form of Miss Channing's fingernails digging through his jacket hard enough to draw blood. My, ah,、uh, companion and I were hoping to see one of your girls. Madame Xavier's gaze drifted across Miss Channing's face. Her finger reached out to touch Miss Channing's chin and tilted it up, as if considering her like a horse at auction. Then, without warning, the brothel owner dipped her head and pressed those painted red lips against Miss Channing's flattened pink ones. It was mercifully quick, just a peck, but the squeak that escaped Miss Channing. Was priceless. As the brothel owner stepped back, West burst out laughing at the expression of confusion on Miss Channing's face, the smear of red paint now trailing across her lips. Madame Xavier turned to West with a low, seductive laugh of her own. Now that I've had a taste of her, if you've come for a threesome, I think you'll need to add someone to the mix who can balance out this ones. Innocence. Who are you thinking? Perhaps Scarlet. The girl still talks about that night you took her to the opera like a proper gentleman. Beside him, Miss Channing squeaked again, and then wiped a sleeve across her mouth, which unfortunately just smeared the paint across her chin. The prudish Miss Mouse was back in force. It seemed. He liked the juxtaposition of innocence draped in shifting pink shadows, her mouth bearing the remnants of another woman's kiss. Whether or not they left here with a traitor, Miss Channing would leave with an education. Of that he had no doubt. No, he told Madame Xavier, not Scarlet. We are interested in one of your other girls today, the blonde woman called Vivian. Madame Xavier inclined her head, her eyes widening in surprise. I thought it was your friend, Mister Grant, who enjoyed Vivian's company. West felt guilty, remembering how Grant had waxed poetic on the woman's various assets. But he was here to track a traitor, not poach on his friend's public territory. What Mister Grant doesn't know won't hurt him. He gave the brothel owner a winning smile, the sort that usually had women tripping over themselves to please him. May I count on your discretion? As you know, our establishment is built upon tightly closed lips. Madame Xavier laughed softly. Unless, that is, the gentleman prefers our lips open. She raised a groomed brow, and of course, it all depends on whether Vivian is interested in you. West pulled a five-pound banknote from his pocket. Well, surely there is no harm in us simply asking her. Madame Xavier plucked the banknote from his fingers and tucked it between the generous swell of her breasts. Vivian's door is just upstairs, fourth door on the left. Her eyes drifted back toward Miss Channing and lingered over long. I'll admit, though I really don't do such things any more. I would consider giving you both a go myself. Show this little one here how to have a little fun. She's really quite delightful. Her soft laughter trailed them as they headed for the stairs. But she seems a little stiff. Remember, West, that's supposed to be your role. And judging by what Scarlet has told me, you do it exceedingly well. As she set her silk slipper on the red carpet runner leading up the stairs, Mary's ears rang with embarrassment. She just survived her second kiss of the day, and in spite of her vivid imagination, in spite of the very many books she'd read on all matter of topics, good and bad, no heroine of her memory had ever experienced anything quite like it. Are you coming along?
Westmore asked, the rumble of his voice tangling with her distracted thoughts. She looked to realize he was waiting for her. She placed her gloved hand in his, and then up the stairs they went, her palm growing more damp with each step. Not because of where they were, or where they were going, or who they were here to meet, but because she was holding Westmore's hand, and even through her gloves, his palm felt warm and solid against her own. It quite stretched the limits of her imagination. And she had a very good imagination. Did you know I can feel you sweating through your gloves, he observed, as they reached the top of the stairs. It isn't polite for a gentleman to notice such things. Her fingers curled against his, slick with perspiration beneath the thin leather. I... I am just nervous about what we may find inside the fourth door on the left. Pity. He glanced back at her, one wicked brow shifting upward. I was thinking, perhaps, that it might be because you are here with me. She shook her head. No. He turned to face her as they reached the upper landing. That word again, Miss Channing, I do believe it is your favourite word in all of the English language. No, it isn't. She flushed, realising that in spite of her protest, she had said it again. She was beginning to suspect she had another favourite word, and that word was perhaps, because that was what she felt when he looked at her this way. Not no, and not yes, but perhaps. Perhaps there was something more to him than the gossip, and perhaps there was something more to them than this business of causing a scandal or hunting a traitor. Miss Channing, his smile tipped upward. You've said it again. Are you teasing me? No, her cheeks warmed as he laughed out loud, and she willed herself to say anything but no. I, ah, uh, think, given our partnership, it might be appropriate to call me Mary, she improvised, though she'd never once in her life had an opportunity to invite a gentleman to do so. It was a day of several firsts, it seemed. Miss Channing sounds so formal, spinsterish. And in this moment, in this garish hallway that smelled of perfume and smoke and things she couldn't even contemplate, she didn't want to feel like a spinster any more. Not with him. His hand gripped hers, and she found herself pulled closer to him. A delicious shiver claimed her spine as her front met his chest and his mouth dipped toward her ear. Mary, then. At her indrawn breath, he chuckled again. Are you sure I don't make you nervous? She shook her head. But you should be nervous. His lips brushed against one of her ears, leaving behind a searing sort of pleasure that sent wisps of want curling through her abdomen. You should be very, very nervous. His finger came up to brush against her lower lip, once, twice, lingering. Because being here with you, and seeing that appalling red paint on your innocent little mouth, makes me want to pull you into one of these rooms, and do unspeakable things to you. Mary gasped. Had she just heard him correctly? A declaration of desire from the man who had given her a proposal of marriage, with the sort of muted enthusiasm one expected of a man facing a firing squad. He claimed he wanted to do unspeakable things to her. That night, at the literary salon, he had done unspeakable things to her, though her conscience insisted on reminding her she'd been every bit as much a party to that kiss as he had, at least in the end. And now they were standing, drunk on the cusp of another ill-advised kiss, his fingers humming against her skin. She pursed her lips. Oh, good heavens, did she really have red lip paint there? and tried to convince herself to retreat to a safer distance. But she couldn't have escaped with a team of horses at the ready. From the corner of her eye, she could see the long hallway before them, dangerous red doors marching in neat, even rows. She tried to imagine the things that went on behind those doors, the things that he had done behind those doors, the things he wanted to do to her behind those doors. And then... One of those doors opened. 
Westmore? A woman stepped out into the hallway. Beside her, West pulled away, a low curse echoing beneath his breath. He straightened, smiled. Scarlet, he acknowledged. Mary couldn't help but stare. So this was Scarlet. Her mind pieced it all together, and she knew in that moment this was the prostitute her sister had described seeing at the opera. The woman had bright red hair and a gauzy red dressing gown knotted at her slim waist, and, judging by her generous décolletage, she wore little else beneath it. It's been a while, Westmore. Scarlet glided toward them. Yes, well, I am afraid it will need to be a little longer. West cleared his throat. We've come to see Vivian today. Vivian? Scarlet's pretty face crumpled. The seconds stretched by, and Mary gritted her teeth into the silence. Oh, for heaven's sake! They were here for a very important reason, and this hallway distraction was becoming a nuisance they couldn't afford. You really must forgive him, she said, lifting her chin. The request for Vivian is for me. You see, I have very singular tastes. Scarlet's eyes narrowed in Mary's direction, assessing her dismissing her. Then she brushed past them, swinging her hips in an unmistakable invitation. Well, do come and see me when you are finished, she drawled over one creamy shoulder. I'll help you forget all about both of them. Mary rolled her eyes as she watched Scarlet's red head disappear down the stairs. Honestly, that woman needs to wear more clothes, she muttered. She realized then that West was grinning down at her. Why are you smiling at me like that? He shrugged. It is only you have managed to surprise me again. His praise made her skin tingle in anticipation, and that only served to irritate her more. Had they really just been standing in the hallway, about to kiss? Good heavens, she wasn't supposed to like him. She reminded herself of his reputation, his experience, his depravities. And yet, the flush creeping down her neck would not be tamed. She drew a deep breath. Right then, fourth door on the left. We ought to hurry, don't you think? I imagine Mrs. Greaves is starting to panic about my disappearance from St. Paul's Cathedral right about now. And if my sister goes to Scotland Yard to report my disappearance, I suspect they'll be more than willing to believe the worst of you in that regard. He laughed again, but didn't disagree. Together they approached the fourth door on the left. Mary placed her ear against the red-painted wood, straining to hear anything inside. She could hear nothing but her own pulse pounding in her ears. It's quiet, she whispered back at Westmore. Too quiet. Her imagination helpfully supplied a few opinions on what might be waiting for them behind that door. A blonde woman, prone on the bed, a scarf wrapped around her neck, her voice silenced forever. Or a dead body, not even cold, blood seeping onto the floor from the knife wound in the chest. Good heavens, she really needed to choose less macabre reading material. And truly, a murder wouldn't make sense. The traitors needed Vivian to pass on the money, and one tended to need a live body for such things. Westmore pulled the revolver from his pocket. Mary cringed. She'd imagined they would go in and talk to the prostitute, not threaten her. And this was the second time today she'd seen a gun. Truly, she'd rather suffer another one of Madame Xavier's kisses. West, she hissed, you will frighten the girl to death. If, that was, she wasn't already dead. This is a woman who is plotting to kill the Queen, he whispered back. I imagine she will be all too prepared to defend herself. He reached out a hand, knocked once. Vivian, he called, purposefully slurring his words, as if he had been drinking. It's Westmore. I'm a friend of Grant's. Madame Xavier sent me up, he called out, scratching a finger against the wood. There was no answer. Holding the revolver up with both hands, West motioned with his chin for Mary to turn the latch on the door. She obliged, her heart a hammer against her ribs.
The door slowly swung open on creaking hinges to reveal an empty room. Her breath whooshed out of her in a disappointed gasp. She stepped inside, hoping she was wrong, but the empty corners confirmed the worst. But the room hadn't been empty long. The yellow dress they'd seen this morning lay bunched on the floor. The window sash was open, the curtains fluttering in the foul breeze drifting in from the street. She imagined she could catch the faint edge of their quarry's perfume lingering in the air. West dashed to the window and leaned over, searching the street below. God damn it! He slammed a hand against the window frame. There's a tree outside. She must have gone down it. We've missed her. Mary began to pull open the drawers of the bureau, searching for some sort of clue, but they were all tellingly empty. She stooped down, picked a lone silk stocking up from the floor. Wherever she's gone, she left in a hurry. West pulled a hand across his face, clearly frustrated. I don't understand. She can't have known we were coming. We came straight here. Perhaps she was planning to leave all along, Mary mused. Though the specifics of the prostitute's hurried disappearance hardly mattered. The woman was gone. The money as well. Judging by the bare wardrobe, Mary had a notion she wasn't coming back. And they hadn't any more clues to follow. Chapter 10 West stomped down the stairs, Mary's hand gripped tightly in his, growing more frustrated with every footfall. He was frustrated with Mary for making him forget himself at critical moments, frustrated with Scarlet for costing them precious seconds in the hallway, frustrated with the woman Vivian, if that was even her real name, for leaving in such a hurry, taking the trail along with her and most of all, frustrated with himself for being so foolish as to involve Miss Mary Channing in this business in the first place. If they'd not dallied in the hallway, would the outcome have been different? It was time to face the facts. Mary was like a breath of fresh air in his sordid life, and he'd wanted to nurture the spark he'd seen growing in her eyes. Even the feeling of her gloved hand gripping his felt oddly right. He wasn't a man given to flights of fancy or archaic courtship rituals. But here he was, holding this woman's hand. She was an undeniable distraction. And he couldn't afford distractions now, not with so much at stake. Before they could reach the front door, Scarlet stepped out of the first floor receiving room. Westmore! She positioned herself in the hallway, blocking their egress. Finished so soon? That isn't like you at all. Vivian wasn't there, he said grimly, and all her things are gone. It appears as though she has left for good. Do you know where she might have gone? Scarlet stepped closer. No, as you know, the girls here are free to come and go, no questions asked. Perhaps she found a proper protector. Her lips shifted from a practised smile to more of a pout. You know, I had thought you might make me a similar offer. Well then, I am sorry to have disappointed you. Though, to his recollection, he'd made Scarlet no promises on that front. Theirs had been little more than a two-week fling and a single, forgettable trip to the opera. If you'll excuse us now. She didn't move. Was there something you wanted? he asked warily. The prostitute stood up on her toes, her peaked nipples brushing against him beneath her red silk robe. You know there is. He gritted his teeth. Now is not a good time. He felt Scarlet's lips brush his cheek. Later then. Her breath rustled against his ear. Tonight, after you've discarded your baggage... West hesitated. Though Scarlet once held his attention quite effectively, today her charm seemed too obvious. Was it because he had come to prefer a softer sort of voice and a pair of sparkling brown eyes? Or was it because he was losing his mind?
He gave Scarlet a stiff nod, then stepped around her and pulled Mary toward the safety of the door. He had no intention of taking Scarlet up on her offer, but he knew from long experience she was not easily deflected. A nod would be the quickest way to get Mary to the door. As he pulled Mary onto the street and raised his hand to summon a hack, he fought back a snarl of frustration. Damn it, they'd been so close. But close was not enough to save the Queen. Their only real lead, St. Paul's Cathedral, had yielded no clue as to the identity of their duke. The prostitute, Vivian, had flown the coop, and there were at least a dozen young, arrogant dukes gadding about London, any one of them whom could be the man identified as Your Grace from the library. Then there was the new list demanding his consideration. It would take weeks to investigate any one of the groups Mary had written down on that piece of paper. Perhaps he should go back and try the detectives at Scotland Yard again. With a known target in the Queen, perhaps they might take him more seriously this time. God knew, Her Majesty was a frequent enough target of assassination plots that someone there ought to take him seriously. But he knew it was impossible. Who in their right mind would ever believe he'd come to a brothel intent only on tracking down a traitor? Or believe he'd brought with him the woman he'd so famously groped in St. Bartholomew's library with no other purpose in mind but to kindle the excitement he'd seen sparkling in her eyes? Mary sat quietly all the way back to Grosvenor Square. She'd heard what the beautiful prostitute had whispered in West's ear. Would he really go back to Madame Xavier's? She stole a sideways glance at him as the hackney coach pulled onto the square, the steady clop of shod hooves slowing as they drew in front of her sister's townhouse. Of course he would. He was that damned Westmore, the man, the legend and he couldn't get her home fast enough. He bustled her up the steps, his hand firm against her elbow. But she pulled away from his touch as the front door loomed near. In you go, then, he said, adopting a wide stance. Something akin to envy flashed through her as she thought of why he was in such a hurry to be done with her. Why don't you come in? she asked irritably. Have a cup of tea? She exhaled. We could plan our next steps. He stared down at her, the set of his jaw hiding the direction of his thoughts. Did he think her silly? Tea, unfortunately, was all she could offer him. It was far less than Scarlet had whispered loudly in his ear, but Mary was loath to let him go without offering him something. He reached out a hand and pressed his thumb to the corner of her mouth, rubbing gently then turned it around to show her a smear of red lip paint. Mouse, he told her, and her shoulders stiffened to hear the insult, though, in truth, at times it seemed he said it like an endearment. I don't know how I can say this more plainly. There are no next steps. But I think I've caused enough trouble with you today, and that was just going to church— who knows what sort of disaster we would cause over tea? He took a step away. No, I think it is better if we plan to have you stay safely here at number 29 Grosvenor Square from now on. He hesitated. Be well, Miss Channing. A smirk claimed his handsome face. And do not try to kiss any more prostitutes. He shoved his hands in his pockets and tucked himself down the steps, heading down the street. Mary stood a moment, fuming. The man was even whistling, the merry tune trailing behind him. He seemed to not have a care in the world. And why would he? He'd taken her home, and now he was free to pursue other pleasures. Drat the man and his... his appetites! She turned back to her own door and put her irritation into a sharp rap on the door, then forced a smile at the housekeeper who opened it. 
Oh, there you are, Mrs. Greaves, she exclaimed with false brightness. I declare, I sat on that dusty pew for ages waiting for you. I wonder, did you sit on the wrong one? Mrs. Greaves sagged against the door frame, one hand fluttering about her throat. Oh, my goodness, the wrong pew, did you say? She shook her head. I suppose I must have done. Don't worry. Mary said, patting the woman on the shoulder. I will explain everything to my sister. It was my fault, not yours. Oh, miss your sister. She's not well. I was out of my head with worry losing you that way. Lady Ashington was nearly frantic when I told her I'd misplaced you, and then her pain started coming. Her hand lowered, fluttering about her heart. The doctor's upstairs with her now. Fear and worry collided in Mary's chest, making it hard to breathe. Oh, no. Is she all right? She gasped, looking up to see a grim faced Dr. Merrill coming down the stairs. She hadn't thought about the consequences of her actions today, just charged into everything, really. But she'd never be able to forgive herself if, by her lack of foresight and planning, she'd done something to harm her sister or the baby. Dr. Mariel drew to a halt in front of her. As well as can be expected, false labour, I should say, brought on by the excitement of the morning. He frowned, shaking his head. I hope I don't need to remind you she is supposed to be resting quietly. Mary placed a relieved hand over her heart. Eleanor was all right. For now. How could she have made such a mistake, forgotten her sister's delicate state, even for a moment? I, that is, it was simply a small mix up with the pews, she lied. After I stepped out for a breath of fresh air, the Thames, you know, there was a terrible smell in the church. A small lie, a falsehood that hurt no one, and the part about the Thames was indisputable. But how could she tell the entire truth when it promised to hurt someone she loved? Can I see her now? she asked, feeling awful about causing her sister distress. Dr. Mariel nodded. I am sure she will be glad to know you are home. Mary lifted her skirts and began to hurry up the stairs. Oh, and Miss Channing? he called up after her. She stopped and looked over her shoulder. Yes? Dr. Mariel's mouth twitched as though he was trying to hide a smile. He tapped a finger to his lips. Do stop by your washstand and mirror before popping in to see your sister. You might want to remove that lip paint first. West headed straight for the only person he could think of who might yield answers. Though it was a Sunday afternoon, and early at that, West found Grant slouched over the usual table in the back of White's, staring into an empty glass. Likely not the first of the day. For the first time in memory, West wondered if perhaps they both spent too much time here. White's was the most exclusive gentleman's club in London, a cheerful male domain, without a flounce or ribbon or throw pillow in sight. In the corners of these hallowed walls, wages were placed on the oddest of whims, and White's infamous betting book was considered close to sacred among their set. When the drinks were flowing freely, he and Grant would laugh and smoke and avoid any semblance of a serious conversation, usually because serious conversations tended to send Grant into a foul mood. But today, the sound of billiard balls knocking about on a Sunday afternoon and the thought of sliding into a table with a glass of something in his hand seemed unnatural particularly after a morning spent chasing criminals in the company of the effervescent Miss Mary Channing. West slid into the seat opposite his friend. Started early today, I see. Grant's eyes lifted to assess him for a long, drawn-out moment. West started to fidget in his seat. He was unused to such scrutiny from Grant. They'd been friends since Harrow and knew each other inside and out.
Undue scrutiny was not really a part of their friendship, unless one counted scrutiny of a good drop of whiskey. Preferably of the fine, smuggled variety, the sort that could burn holes through wooden tables and lurked in Grant's always ready flask. Grant opened his mouth, finally breaking the stretched-out silence. It's never too early, as you well know. Although, speaking of starting early... He leaned back almost casually in his chair. I stopped by Cardwell House today, thinking to collect your absent ass and see if we could get up to some fun. But your butler told me you'd gone to church. He snorted. Church? You couldn't get me to church on a Sunday with a bloody team of horses. Was it devotion or curiosity that dragged you there this morning? West shifted uneasily in his seat. Grant was speaking too loudly, slurring his words, drawing attention from the other patrons. It is complicated. Ah, a woman then, I should have guessed. To whom do we owe this sudden fit of pious devotion? Grant's eyes narrowed. The infamous Miss Channing, perhaps? West was startled. How did you know about her? For God's sake, the broadsheets have all gleefully chronicled your misadventures, and I haven't seen or heard a word from you since the night you dangled your prick in literary waters. Ah, that, West grimaced. I've been, uh, busy. Well, now, there's a good deal of interpretation that can be afforded a word like busy. Grant's voice sounded faintly accusing. Did you at least shag her for all your trouble? Please tell me you didn't toss it all away for a kiss and a peek at her bubbies. West fought back a snarl. Have a care. Miss Channing is a proper lady. A proper lady? Grant slumped in his chair. It's worse than I thought if you won't hear a word against her. So have you succumbed to the demands for your head? Slapped a ring on her finger? He lifted a fist above his head in a parody of a hanging. Tied the old marital noose about your neck? West scowled at his friend. No. Though he'd certainly tried. Well, there's a good bit of news. Grant straightened, looking suddenly more hopeful. You didn't offer for the woman after all that. You've got... Bollocks, West. I'll hand you that. Ruined women are fearsome creatures, out for blood, and whatever else you are hiding. He shuddered. Of course, I hear she's a bit long in the tooth. He tapped a finger against his head. Possibly adult-brained, hiding away in Yorkshire so long. Didn't even have a season. You should count yourself lucky to have made your escape. West clenched his fists. In his experience, Miss Channing was the opposite of adult brained It felt as if he could scarcely keep up with her endless lists and ideas. You've got it all wrong, he said slowly. I offered for her, but she wouldn't have me. Grant burst out laughing. Are you sure she isn't adult brained Rocked in the head. You've got half the women in London with their skirts in a twist, eager for a chance with you. If she doesn't want you, I say she's got coddled eggs for brains. He leaned forward. Though, tell me, the rags don't always get it right, but the cartoonist drew her like this. He cupped two hands about his chest, roughly the size of oranges. Which is all well and good, but did you happen to get a peek? At her feet. West narrowly resisted the urge to smash a fist in his friend's face. Normally, Grant's raucous teasing made him laugh, but he didn't feel like laughing at the moment. He didn't like hearing Grant denigrate the woman he'd spent the morning with. Not one bit. I didn't come here to talk about Miss Channing's feet. West lowered his voice. A warning should Grant only care to pull his head out of his arse long enough to take stock. Good.
Grant lifted his empty glass to signal the wait staff to bring him another. Because I was getting worried, you'd succumb to madness. But all's well that ends well. You've come to the right place to forget your troubles. Now, are you drinking whiskey or brandy today? Neither. West waved the apron staff member away from his side of the table, then leaned forward. I came to ask you something. As long as it isn't a request to stand up with you at your wedding, you've my undivided attention. Have you seen Vivian, the prostitute from Madame Xavier's, of late? Why do you ask? Grant looked suddenly uncomfortable. Look, this isn't anything to do with that business with Scarlet and the opera, is it? What? West blinked, confused. What on earth was Grant blabbering on about? Grant frowned. I understand you might be miffed, but I would prefer not to share Vivian as penance. West nearly choked on his tongue. Good God! Surely Grant didn't think he wanted Vivian for himself. You've got it all wrong. I am not interested in her that way. West looked from left to right, then turned himself over to it. That night at Saint Bartholomew's, I stumbled into a bit of trouble at the literary salon. Vivian was there. Vivian. Grant's eyes narrowed in suspicion. At a literary salon, what joke are you playing now? To my knowledge, she doesn't even know how to read. West leaned in. It felt good to at last be relating this tale to someone who was bound by friendship to believe him. He probably should have told Grant about it days ago, but he'd not found time to come to White's, what with his madcap visits to Bedlam and church. Besides, finding a moment when they were both sober enough to have a logical discussion was a challenge he hadn't felt up to. Even now, the empty glass in Grant's hand told him his timing might be off, but there was no help for it. Miss Channing and I overheard someone plotting to assassinate the Queen. West lowered his voice, hoping Grant was sober enough to understand what he was saying. And your prostitute, Vivian, is tied up in it. There was a moment of perforating silence. Vivian, Grant finally asked, she of the lovely feet, the very same. And Vivian is the only one involved in this dastardly plot. No. West frowned, remembering the other voices, both familiar and unfamiliar. There is a duke as well, and two other people, but I don't know who any of them are yet. For a moment, Grant looked perplexed, even pensive, but then he burst out laughing. Oh, I see. He didn't just laugh; he whooped out loud, leaning so far back in his chair, West was afraid he was going to tip it over. Oh, but this is fecking ingenious! As his friend dissolved into convulsive laughter, irritation twitched through West. Judging by the redness of Grant's face, this wasn't going to go the way he had hoped. Grant leaned forward suddenly, the front legs of his chair crashing down with a thump. All right, he wheezed. What's my role this time? I might be the duke. Do you want me to stand as lookout? Pretend to pull the trigger. Mayhap I could dress as a chambermaid and sneak into the queen's bedroom this time. Or do you mean for that role to belong to Vivian? West gritted his teeth. I am not joking, Grant. Of course you are. You are always joking, and it's one of the things we all enjoy most about you. Grant tapped the side of his nose. When do we sally forth? Mum's the word. Until then, just let me know when you are ready to go through with it. Vivian seems like a good sport. I suspect we would have to pay her, though. Grant. West placed both palms down on the table and leaned forward, enunciating clearly so there could be no mistake. This is not a joke. Vivian is involved in a plot to kill the Queen. She's disappeared from Madame Xavier's and taken all her things with her. Do you know where she might have gone? Why would I know where she's gone? 
I hardly know her. She was just a lark, a lovely lark, to be sure. Well, as we speak, your lovely lark is delivering funds to someone, funds that will be used to kill the queen. West told him, and there isn't going to be anything pleasurable about it if I fail to stop it. Grant sobered, regarded him a long, unreadable moment. Right then, he murmured. He staggered to his feet and turned, heading toward the back of the room. Where are you going? West called out in exasperation. He shouldn't have told Grant. He could see that now. But even if it was fueled by drink, his friend's refusal to believe him stung. Grant, above everyone else, was supposed to be the one who understood him. They'd been through brothels and benders together, survived more bottles than he could remember, and won unfortunate battle he still struggled to forget. Why couldn't Grant understand this? He wasn't joking, not even close. I need to find the betting book. Grant's laughter howled behind him. Because I'm laying a wager, you're losing your mind. From the diary of Miss Mary Channing, June the seventh, eighteen fifty-eight. Westmore is up to something. When he dropped me off, he did not head toward his house. No, drat the man. He headed south toward heaven knows what, probably to take Scarlet up on her dreadful offer. How can he be so unconcerned? Someone is plotting to kill the queen, and every day that slips through our hands is one the traitors gain for their cause. But regardless of where the scoundrel is passing his time, it finally struck me that, in spite of the day's failures, I at least still have one clue worth considering. If one of the parties we seek is a duke, I simply must go where dukes congregate. Now, to find the perfect invitation. Chapter Eleven. While I am glad to hear you want to get out of the house, Eleanor said dubiously, "I am afraid a proper social event will be difficult to manage after your inauspicious debut in the scandal sheets." Mary did not disagree. No, it would not be easy. Yes, her life was an absolute muck, but so were the potential consequences for England if she didn't find a way to get out of this house and begin questioning those who had cause to hate the Queen. The end of June, the traitors had said that night in the library. Time was marching by, and she felt the backward slide of each day acutely. All the more reason to look for a second chance to impress everyone. Mary forced a smile. Surely there is something in the post—an invitation to a musicale, perhaps. I really don't understand this sudden change in mood. Ellen amused, shaking her head. One would think, after what happened, you would not be so eager to go out and face the censure of society. They will not be kind, Mary. Cruelty is the specialty of the Tun. She cupped a hand absently around her abdomen. "You must trust me on this." "I know," Mary said, more sure than ever that her sister's whirlwind October wedding had been an event born of necessity rather than marital enthusiasm. And I know this request seems a bit out of character for me. She thought of her earlier fears for her trip to London, how she had written in her diary about being snubbed by the popular crowd or whispered about behind lace fans. Those worries seemed almost amusing now. Certainly, nothing to fear. I want to do this, Eleanor," she said softly. "The worst has already happened to me, and I survived. And now I can go out and enjoy myself because I no longer need to worry about what people may think. But aren't you afraid? Eleanor asked of what they might say to you. Mary hesitated. How to explain to her sister that the events of the past week had been some of the most exhilarating of her life, that the thought of stepping out into a crowded room and speaking with strangers no longer made her want to curl into a ball? No, 
I am not afraid. It is freeing somehow to have the veil of propriety ripped so cleanly away. She offered her sister a conciliatory smile. And you did invite me here to London for this very purpose, to find that spark you claim has gone missing from my life. Yes, well, I must admit, you do seem more cheerful of late, Eleanor admitted, grudgingly, more like the old you. A sigh escaped her lips. I suppose a small outing might not be the most terrible thing in the world. She glanced down at the silver tray lying beside her on the bed, her fingers sorting through the tangle of letters and correspondence. Unfortunately, the invitations haven't exactly been flooding in. She looked up, her eyes assessing. Although, perhaps you might consider a visit to the new opera house. Ashington purchased a box for me as a wedding present, you know. He really is the dearest man. Mary shook her head, though in her opinion, the dearest man in question probably ought to be making his way back to London soon. No, not the opera. Attending an opera would only make her think of him, drat his rogue's heart. Besides the question of what else she might be forced to watch beyond the performance on the stage, an outing like that required one to sit in the darkness and be silent, which wouldn't suit her needs at all. What about a dinner party? Mary asked, although that idea didn't quite fit either. Dinner parties limited one's conversation to those seated in close proximity. She needed to be able to speak to dozens of people, all of them dukes. Eleanor eyed the tray again. I am afraid it doesn't look promising. Mary swallowed a groan of frustration. She had offered to help Eleanor answer her correspondence this afternoon, a task on which her sister was helplessly behind, with the intention of wielding an eye for prospects. The thought of what she was planning made her stomach twist in nervous knots, but those knots were neither so tight nor complicated she would be dissuaded from her course. Surely the perfect invitation was lurking somewhere in that pile of correspondence. What about something with dancing? she asked. Eleanor looked up, her eyes wide with surprise. You? Dancing? You can't be serious. Mary shrugged. You yourself pointed out that I never had a proper debut, and I thought, while I am here in London, I may as well dance, she finished, a bit lamely. You never had a debut because you refused the season Patrick and Julianne provided us, Eleanor pointed out. On account of, let me see if I can recall the exact words you used at the time, that horrid dancing. You said you'd rather stay home and read a book. Mary's cheeks heated. Yes, she could recall saying those very words, and how her family had wrung their hands over her refusal to do the usual thing. But thanks to their mother's passing and the requisite period of mourning, she and Eleanor had been older than was ideal by the time their come-out had been arranged. Old enough, in fact, that she had been of age by the time the opportunity arose, which meant Mary had been able to refuse to participate, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. Well... Perhaps I have had a change of heart, now that I've seen something of London, she murmured. It wasn't that she didn't know how to dance. They'd both been forced to learn a variety of dances through the years, but Eleanor was the only one who had actually used the skills they had practised. To Mary, the idea of being held by a stranger on a dance floor made her feel prickly. Being forced to speak to someone, the conversation stilted and false, everyone's eyes on you, she couldn't think of anything she'd rather do less. Except nothing. She couldn't do nothing. She leaned over the bed and plucked a letter from her sister's tray. This particular invitation, with its bold wax seal and beautiful looped penmanship, had definite possibilities. Even the weight of the paper screamed, Duke. What about this one? She scanned the contents quickly, and then handed the invitation to her sister. It is for a ball this Saturday. 
The Duke of Harrington's engagement ball? Eleanor asked, her voice going a few notes higher. No, I don't think that is a good idea at all. Why not? In fact, it was perfect. Where else would a duke be seen but at another duke's ball? Goodness, the traitor might even be the Duke of Harrington. Excitement coursed through her. The Duke will be announcing his engagement to the daughter of an Italian countess, and everyone will want to be there for their first glimpse of her. Eleanor sounded worried now. It will be a frightful crush. Mary nodded, hoping she looked convincing. Yes, with dancing. She smiled bravely, though, in truth, the thought of dancing with strangers was a bit nauseating. But now was not the time to turn herself over to timidity. There was too much at stake here to let hesitancy dictate her actions, the way she had nearly her entire life. And her ears perked up, homing in on her sister's words. The Duke was marrying the daughter of an Italian countess. Thoughts of Orsinian plots swirled in her head. Eleanor's forehead wrinkled with worry. Mary, I don't think this is a good idea at all. Besides your disastrous visit to the literary salon and that one unfortunate outing to church, you've not even set foot outside the house while you've been here in London. You've not gone walking in Hyde Park once, nor asked to go shopping on Bond Street. For heaven's sake, I've never even seen you take a turn about the garden. And now you are proposing going to a ball? Her voice turned tart. Have you lost your mind? Mary worried her lower lip. Perhaps she had lost her mind. She considered for a moment, trying once more to confess the real reason she was doing this, trying to explain to Eleanor the details of the conversation she had overheard in the library at the literary salon. But the words died on her tongue before they could be formed. She remembered all too well how her sister had panicked the last time she tried to broach the topic of the plot, the complete and utter disbelief, the firm admonishment to stop letting her imagination run wild. Eleanor looked more exhausted with each passing day, and at the moment her forehead was puckered with worry. And that was simply from the thought that Mary wanted to attend a ball. Imagine how much strain Eleanor would feel if she discerned the real reason for her sister's sudden new interest in dancing. She couldn't tell her sister. Not now, with so much at stake. She plucked the invitation back from her sister's hands, then smiled, hoping it looked sincere. You are right, of course. I don't know what I was thinking. The scandal sheets, you know. Probably best to let the gossip die down first. It is really for the best. Eleanor sounded relieved. Maybe next month things might be more settled, and you could venture out with less worry. Mary brandished her pen. Shall I pen a note expressing our regrets? Though she was going to do nothing of the sort. Eleanor nodded. Yes, of course. She glanced down at her tray, running a hand across the remaining letters. After a pensive moment, she looked back up. On the matter of regrets, have you heard anything more from Mr. Westmore? Mary squirmed as she scribbled her acceptance. Good heavens! The mere mention of the man's name made her blush like an adolescent schoolgirl, which was a remarkable feat given that she was six and twenty and hardly besotted with him. Or was she? With nothing more than a rakish smile, he had made her feel as though she was the only person in an entire room, or a brothel hallway. She wanted to see him again with a desperation that shocked her. But the scoundrel was preoccupied with things that had nothing to do with her or the security of the country. She knew this to be true because she had watched for him from her window every dreadful night. He gathered himself up and set off down Grosvenor Square about ten o'clock every evening, just when the lights in Cardwell House were starting to go out. And, drat the man, he usually didn't return until morning. No, 
she answered, her fingers tightening miserably over the silver pen. I haven't heard from him. And that, of course, was the crux of the whole problem. The Duke of Harrington's engagement ball was the sort of affair designed to bring out the hunting instinct in a man like West. Everywhere he looked, there were women, wealthy widows and tittering debutantes, all sad to see the most eligible Duke of Harrington removed from the marriage mart, all seeking solace from their disappointment. Normally, he would be ready to relieve their suffering, ready to offer a conciliatory kiss or more. But tonight, West kept to the periphery of the action, hunting for a different sort of prey. And the women swirling in his line of sight, attractive and available though they may be, didn't interest him nearly as much as the mouse of a virgin he hoped was sitting safely in her bedroom, reading some obscure novel by lamplight. Grant sauntered toward him, a glass of lemonade in each hand. He held one of the glasses out. You look parched, my friend. I've brought you a peace offering, given that you seem to want to have nothing to do with me of late. West's fingers closed gratefully about the glass. Parched. Yes, that was the perfect word to describe how he felt, at least where Miss Channing was concerned. He felt stripped of sensation, every nerve centred on something he could not have and should not want. Worse, there was a blurriness to his thoughts and vision that did not bode well for the sort of singular concentration tonight's hunt required. He'd not been sleeping well, and when he did find his bed, more often than not, his sleep was plagued by nightmares. In between subtle inquiries about Fenian uprisings and Orsinian plots, delicate conversations to broach anywhere, but especially amidst drunken peers, he'd surreptitiously watched the courtyard garden three doors down from Cardwell House, hoping for some glimpse of her— a small sighting to ease the hopeless itch she'd conjured beneath his skin. He told himself his curiosity was because he wanted to make sure she was safely at home, instead of trying to stir up trouble. But he suspected he was lying to himself. West took a sip of the lemonade, choked as it slid fitfully down his throat. Good God, he wheezed, what did you put in it? Just a little something I had smuggled down from the north. Takes the skin off one's throat, doesn't it? Grant grinned as he pulled his flask from his evening jacket and added more to his own glass. You seemed a bit... distracted tonight. I thought some whiskey might help. West gritted his teeth, the taste of lemons and whiskey lingering on his lips, sharp and head-spinning, a combination that reminded him too much of the potent Miss Channing. I don't need your help. And he certainly didn't need more of Grant's smuggled whiskey. Look, are you still miffed because of that business with the betting books? Grant sighed. I didn't actually place the wager you were losing your mind, you know. He poured another finger of light amber liquid into his glass until it was more whiskey than lemonade. Although, speaking of wagers, you seem to be spending a good deal of time watching the crowd tonight. I would wager you're looking for someone in particular. His grin was sudden and the opposite of infectious. The infamous Miss Channing, perhaps. Why does it matter? West's shoulders tensed. I find myself curious, Grant shrugged. You've not been acting yourself of late. I would introduce myself to the woman who's knocked you off your perch and sent you off babbling about assassination plots and the like. She's not knocked me anywhere, West said, feeling cross. And I am not babbling. Besides, she won't be here. She prefers libraries to ballrooms and books over dance cards. But even as he offered this factual statement, his eye pulled to a flash of blue silk. Recognition knifed through him, and his glass hit the floor, shattering to pieces. Murmured speculations about his state of inebriation began to run around the room like a surge of electricity, but he could scarcely take the time to worry about it. Because his mouse of a virgin wasn't at home, reading some obscure novel by lamplight, 
No, she had just walked through the ballroom doors, lacking her biddable chaperone and all good sense. He glowered in her direction, watching as she gave her shawl to a footman and revealed the entire trajectory of her sinfully cut dress. He wanted to skewer the men who turned to leer at her as she passed, wanted to protect her from the narrow-eyed women who bunched in her wake, whispering behind their poisonous fans. For God's sake, what was Mary doing here? Didn't she realize that thanks to the gossip rags she was now a walking, talking scandal? And where was her usual brown dress, the one that approximated the color of mud on a dull winter's day? For once, he would have preferred to see her in it. Because, unfortunately, tonight she was wearing the blue gown again, the same one that had lured him like a siren that night of the literary salon. It clung to her scant curves, as if applied by an artist's brush, highlighting her slender waist and long, elegant neck. And her hair, God in heaven, her hair was tumbling down the back of her neck like a lover's caress, the thick tresses shining beneath the gaslights of Harrington's ballroom. Against the sea of quaffed elegance, she alone looked ready for a tumble. Or, to put it another way, she looked close to having already been tumbled. And that, of course, sent his thoughts straight there, to that carnal place he'd sworn to avoid where this woman was concerned. She was not for him. She was supposed to be untouchable, innocence wrapped in steel, off-limits, to apply a proper military term. His limits, however, were stretching to the breaking point. "'Shall I fetch you another lemonade, then?' Grant asked, swiping at the glass shards with his shoe. "'Or would you rather just take my flask and bolt it down?' "'No, thank you.' West was craning his neck now, trying to see what Mary was up to. He felt a frisson of alarm as he watched her approach the Duke of Salisbury and engage the man directly in conversation— a terrible faux pas for anyone, but for a woman so recently featured in the gossip rags, it was another unforgivable nail in her social coffin. For Christ's sake, the woman needed a handler. And the parts of her he'd like to personally handle were on too ready display tonight. The aging duke had noticed those lovely, tempting parts too. His grace couldn't quite seem to keep his eyes on Mary's face, and in spite of the Duke's senility, in spite of Miss Channing's own incautious role in her downfall, West was afraid he was going to embarrass himself tonight, defending her unravelling honour. Grant's shoulder nudged into him. Who is that woman you're ogling? West swore beneath his breath. He hadn't realised he was staring in such an obvious fashion. No one of importance. No one of importance, hmm? Grant offered him a roguish smile. Then you won't mind if I introduce myself. Bugger it all. That was not happening, tonight or any other night for that matter. There was no telling what Grant might say to her, or worse, what she might say back. There is no need, West said tersely. It is Miss Channing. Grant squinted in her direction took a sip directly from his flask. Oh, oh, I think I am beginning to understand the distraction. At least one of us does. Because to West's mind, understanding had just fled the ballroom. He was supposed to be here with one purpose in mind, but that purpose had disintegrated to little more than dust the moment Mary walked through the door. A servant materialised to clean up the mess on the floor, and so West seized the opportunity to extract himself from Grant's ribbing. "'Would you excuse me?' he said, shaking the clinging droplets and bits of glass from his shoe. "'I've things to do.' "'Interesting choice of words. Well, have fun with your... things.' Grant waved him on with a grin. "'But meet me later, at White's.' West nodded, if only to put an end to his friend's badgering. As he moved through the crowd, he watched Mary from the corner of his eye. 
Though he was coming to know the exquisite detail of her face, the way her eyes sparkled when she was excited, the way she lifted her chin when making a point, she nonetheless remained something of an enigma to him. For example, he never would have predicted her showing up here tonight, not in a hundred years. It was becoming a problem the way she kept him off kilter. He couldn't get a proper read on her, and that was damned disconcerting to such a dedicated connoisseur of the female sex. He took up residence in an offset hallway where he could watch her without fear of further harassment from Grant. He watched her approach a half dozen different gentlemen, and grew increasingly unsettled. In spite of the recent gossip, or perhaps because of it, the men all seemed eager enough to speak with her. He couldn't quite identify the emotion coursing through him, as he watched her speak with so many of them. It wasn't only worry for her, the thought she might say the wrong thing to the wrong man. He didn't like the way the men looked at her, the things he imagined running through their minds. Was he jealous? It was a startling notion. What cause had he to be jealous? She didn't belong to him. She had refused his offer of marriage, emphatically, but tonight the memory of that refusal stung for reasons that were far more complex than his wounded pride. When at last she drifted close enough that he could hear what she was saying, this time to the Duke of Rothsey, his blood ran hot with irritation instead of envy. "Tell me, your grace," she said, smiling up at the Duke. Did you perchance attend the literary salon at Saint Bartholomew's on June the first? West groaned beneath his breath. Was that what she was asking everyone and their brother? Good God! Did the woman not understand the need for subtlety? He emerged from his hiding spot to take her by the arm. A squeak escaped her lips, but he pulled her ruthlessly toward him. Ah,、oh, Miss Channing, there you are. His words might be civil, but his tone held a curt warning. Would you please excuse us, Your Grace? Miss Channing is an acquaintance of my sister's, and I have an urgent message for her about, uh, books. Without waiting for an answer, he spun her deeper into the hallway, grateful for the fact that the wall sconces here flickered with a less glaring light. Once they were out of sight of the ballroom, he let his anger fly. Well," he demanded, loosening his hold on her arm. The chit was going to get them both killed asking questions like that, but she wasn't asking questions now. In fact, she was almost mutinous in her silence. "You've been running your mouth all evening to every peer within earshot," he ground out. "Do you have nothing to say to me?" One gloved hand fluttered near her throat. "You, ah,、uh, you have startled me." Mouse, that's nothing compared to what you are doing to me," he glowered down at her. "Don't you know how dangerous it is to draw attention to yourself like that?" That seemed to unpluck whatever was tangling her tongue. "Stop calling me that." West bit back the impulse to tell her he called her that so he wouldn't think of her in more dangerous, desirous ways. "What are you doing here, questioning everyone and their uncle?" I think the more pertinent question is, what aren't you doing? She lifted her chin. I'd imagined you as a hero, you know, coming in, sword drawn, determined to save the day, just like a hero from the pages of one of my books. She bit her lip, her gaze wavering. And yet, you aren't doing any of the things a proper hero would. He stiffened against the hurt accusation in her voice. She expected him to act like a hero in one of her bloody books. Good Christ! Had this woman any notion of how the world actually worked? Well, now there's your first mistake," he snarled, feeling her lack of faith like a sword to the chest. No matter that, as her anti-hero, he lacked the damn sword itself. The characters in those bloody books you are always blathering on about aren't real. Her cheeks went pink. I know they aren't real. I am not a simpleton.
But while you seem perfectly able to ignore the things we heard that night, I cannot, not when the fate of a country hangs in the balance. So while you lurk in hallways like a bogeyman, I have been out asking the questions that might lead us to our traitors, something you don't seem to have the... the... The delicate flush staining her cheeks intensified. The stones to do. West cocked his head. She'd called him a coward, and in this, at least, she very nearly had him pegged. But she was wrong about one thing. And so he leaned in, his hands splayed against the wall on either side of her, until she was pinned against the wall, her body trembling against his, in a manner that brought nothing of fear to mind. Let me be the first to assure you, Mouse, I've got stones enough to get the job done. He leaned in closer, until the very parts of his body in discussion pressed indelicately against her. His hips flexed, and a soft gasp escaped her lips. He bent his head, his lips brushing against her quivering earlobe. Any job you wish. Here, of course, was where a sensible woman should slap him. He was all but mounting her in the hallway outside of the Duke of Harrington's engagement ball. Instead, she stilled. And then, miracle of miracles, was she leaning back into him? He pushed away from her and dragged a hand through his hair. Surely her capacity to surprise him should no longer come as such a, well, surprise. She ought to be shrieking, slapping him silly, fainting again. Instead, she was staring up at him with those wide brown eyes, her plump, pink lips almost begging for a kiss. This woman twisted him in knots with her damning combination of innocence and determination. But the very traits that made the blood roar in his ears might actually get her killed. I beg of you, Mary, you must forget we ever heard anything in that library. You expect me to just forget what we heard? Let them proceed without trying to stop them? Her eyes narrowed. Risk the life of our queen. West gritted his teeth. She was a distraction he couldn't afford, and he felt guilty as hell for involving her as much as he already had. Better than risking our own lives, he lied, wanting her safely at home reading that obscure novel he'd imagined earlier. Someone else can handle it. It must be us, she retorted. There is no one else to do it, thanks to your reputation and my sister's delicate state. West wanted to shout at her, or worse, kiss her, though that was arguably what had landed them in this troubled start. If we overheard them plotting, he ground out, choosing his words carefully, it is likely someone else already has too, someone whom Scotland Yard will believe. No doubt the proper authorities are already on their trail and closing in. Though, if the authorities had heard so much as a whiff of this plot, surely they would have taken his complaint more seriously. The memory of how the detective at the Scotland Yard desk had laughed at him still stung. It was the reason he was here tonight, and why he'd gone out every night this week, listening to conversations, cataloguing voices, his thoughts centred on things less pleasurable than the usual distractions. Not that she needed to know any of that. He took a more prudent step away from her. For Christ's sake, the Duke of Rothsey isn't the man responsible for this plot. Why would you say that? The men I saw in the library were considerably less portly. She pursed her lips. Right then. She dipped her gloved hand into the low-cut bodice of her gown and pulled out a folded piece of paper. I should probably cross him off my list. Oh, for God's sake! He snatched the folded piece of paper from her. Another list? No wonder your fingers were always stained with ink. As he scanned the very thorough list of names, dread pooled like a regrettable night somewhere deep in his gut. How did you even come up with a list like this? he asked, though he shouldn't be surprised any more where this woman and her surprising array of talents were concerned. She'd even included some names here that he'd neglected to consider. De Brett's Peerage, of course. There is a copy in Lord Ashington's library. She waited a beat.
Books can be very instructional, you know. He glared down at her. Do you even realize how stupid it is to ask these sorts of questions? He choked out. To make a list such as this and pull it out of your bosom and consult it in goddamned public? She frowned. I only came to... It seems to me you only came here tonight to yammer that pretty little mouth of yours, he interrupted, giving rein to his darkening mood. Whoever this is, he is not an honorable man. Surprise was our only advantage in this game, and if you've spoken to the wrong man tonight, or said the wrong thing at the wrong time, you've just given it all away. Confusion colored her face. You... that is... You think my mouth is pretty? He snorted. Good God, that was what she took from this conversation. Don't let it go to your head. He was angry with her for making him feel weak, and angry with himself for making it so easy for her. He folded the list and shoved it inside the pocket of his evening jacket. I just think there are better uses you could put those lips to. You need to go home before you do something really stupid. Like bite her lip again. Because, God help him, he couldn't be held responsible for the consequences. Chapter 12 Better uses for her lips. Good heavens, the man was a menace, saying the most outrageous things. And no matter the way West was glowering down at her, no matter how many times he called her... Mouse, Mary didn't want to go home yet. Had he any notion of what it had taken for her to get here? She'd slipped from her sister's house under cover of darkness and walked two terrifying blocks to flag down a hack on Oxford Street. She'd braved brigands and bodily harm and, more importantly, public ridicule. She knew everyone here was whispering about her, knew what they thought of her. If she was brave enough to face the scandal that trailed in her wake, she was brave enough to face West's handsome, hovering frown. And she wasn't leaving until she was ready. This conversation is growing as tiresome as that unimaginative nickname. She stepped around him, lifting her skirts in her hands and aiming for the hum of the crowd in the larger room beyond. I came here tonight to speak with the men on that list she said as a parting shot, not to converse with a coward. She nearly escaped, too. But just as she emerged into the brighter lights of the ballroom, she felt his touch on her arm. No doubt it was her imagination, giving life to things that weren't there, but she could almost believe there was a plea in that touch. She looked down at the shape of his gloves against the bare skin of her upper arm, her anger disintegrating. What do you want, West? she sighed. I want you to dance with me, came his answer. She hesitated. He was a rake and a bore, and she ought to want nothing at all to do with him. More to the point, she hated dancing. But, drat it all, she was already letting him pull her into his arms. Her slippers were on the dance floor. It would be rude to pull away now. As he began to swing her around in large circles, she waited for the prickle of awareness, the fear that too many people were watching. Those dreaded emotions didn't come. Instead, three years of dancing lessons, the preparation for her non-existent come-out, proved useful now. The feel of his hand against the small of her back, guiding her with subtle pressure, made her want to follow wherever he might lead even if it led to her ruin. The earlier flash of anger he'd shown seemed to have been shoved to a distant corner, either that or harnessed and held to a tighter rein. He was playing the perfect gentleman now, if a bit too quiet. Some devil in her made her want to test that restraint. And so, as they began their second rotation around the dance floor, she peeked up at him through her lashes. I've not yet had a chance to speak with the Duke of Harrington. She lowered her voice. Perhaps you could introduce me when this dance is over. I don't think so. Though his tone stayed pleasant, his jaw tightened. 
she thought of the news of the Duke's engagement, announced to an appreciative crowd not even a half hour ago. He's on the top of my list, and he just announced his intentions to marry the daughter of an Italian countess. She countered a little too loudly. She tempered her voice back to a whisper. Who better to have sympathies for the Orsinian cause? West swung her with a bit more force. The Duke of Harrington isn't our man. How would you know that, lurking in hallways as you have been? I know, he told her, because his grace is connected to my family. He comes to dinner at Cardwell House at least once a month. He is an impressively honourable man. Oh. She bit her lip as the room spun by. Drat it all. West had already ruled out the Duke of Harrington as a suspect. She thought of how quickly he'd dismissed her suspicions of the Duke of Rothsey as well, and the list he'd kept, now tucked in the inside pocket of his evening jacket. She'd have to make another one, and the thought of it poked at her. Couldn't he see? This was why they needed to do this together, why they ought to share their plans and suspicions with each other. She shouldn't have to waste her time considering leads that led nowhere. Who else then? She pressed, trying to remember the other names written on the now purloined list. If you've already discounted Harrington and Rothsey, you must have an idea of who else we should be considering. Instead of answering the question, he glowered down at her. Tell me, Miss Channing, why no chaperone this evening? Did poor Mrs. Greaves die in a fit of apoplexy after your visit to the brothel, or has your stubbornness gotten her sacked? Mary sighed in frustration. Why was he refusing to discuss this with her, avoiding the topic as if it might prove a deadly disease? She couldn't help but feel disappointed in his lack of enthusiasm for the chase. During that Sunday visit to the brothel, she'd imagined, well, she'd foolishly imagined him as a white knight riding in on his charger to save the day. But perhaps that was the problem with allowing her imagination free reign. So often, heroes only existed on the pages of books. No, Mrs. Greaves is still alive and gainfully employed. If a bit more suspicious of me now, she replied, not wanting to talk about housekeepers or chaperones or brothels. I claim to have returned to the wrong pew, and she pretended to believe me, rather than consider the less palatable alternative. I think. And why do you care whether or not I have a proper chaperone? I am already ruined. He ought to know, given his starring role in her shame. Although she could perhaps look back on that night and admit that Westmore could not be held entirely responsible for that debacle. Heaven knew she had played her own starring role in that bit of folly. His head lowered toward her own until his lips brushed her ear. Why I care is scarcely the question, Mouse. This time, the sound of that nickname sent a shiver rippling down her spine, one he could no doubt feel through the indecent press of his hand. Drat the man! With his breath warm against her ear, she could almost imagine it was meant as an endearment instead of an insult. The fact is that I do care whether I ought to or not. His words made her head feel fizzy, shaken up inside. Surely it was just the unaccustomed nature of dancing, and not any real meaning behind such dangerously delicious words. He didn't care about her. He couldn't care. He was a man with a reputation, a man who sought only his own pleasure, and didn't give a fig about what others thought or wanted. She needed to remember that, even as her pulse bounded beneath her skin. His head dipped toward her ear again. How did you even come to be here tonight? If you didn't bring a proper chaperone, did you steal Ashington's coach? If you must know, I slipped out of the house after my sister fell asleep and summoned a hackney cab. His fingers tightened against the small of her back. You took a cab here. By yourself, 
I am afraid I lack a fairy godmother to conjure a more spectacular means of conveyance. She hesitated, wondering why his fingers were suddenly gripping her right hand with more ferocity. And I also lacked the pumpkin. She met his gaze, feeling the edges of her mouth wanting to turn up, in spite of her continued annoyance with him. Probably on account of the fact that people have a dreadful habit of urinating through the garden fence, hardly a good location for growing vegetables. West glared down at her, his eyes lingering on the slight upward tilt of her entirely too kissable lips. She was teasing him, clearly. But had she any concept of what could happen to an innocent woman flitting about the streets of London, riding alone in a hackney cab, traipsing darkened streets? Christ! Even this dance floor was dangerous. He could feel the curious eyes on them, the appreciative glances she garnered from too many men, the way women stared at her, jealousy sharpening their claws. He felt an overwhelming need to protect her. He clenched his teeth. It isn't safe to be out in the city after dark. You prowl the streets at night. She shrugged, the motion pulling against the grip he had on her. I see you go out nearly every night. Her admission that she watched for him through her window made his feet stumble a bit. So she spent her evenings peeking out her curtains, did she? It made him feel smug that she had sought a glimpse of him the past week, the same way he had looked for her. But not so smug he could forget the danger. Somewhere on this dance floor might very well be one of the men they sought. The thought that the traitors might be watching them now made his feet begin to slow. The urge to whisk her away, ensure her safety, burned like an ember beneath his skin. What was wrong with him to be reacting in this manner? Speaking of finding one's bed, he started, but then stopped as her lips parted with a soft gasp. He'd only meant to say, perhaps it was time to find hers tonight, but he was loath to correct the misimpression, especially given that her gloved hand had just gone limp in his own. Just to their right, he could see the open doors that led to the front foyer. He steered her toward them and was relieved when she willingly followed him. Perhaps she thought he intended to walk with her outside. Steal a gentle kiss, or three, in Harrington's garden. God, she really was a naive thing. And trust was a matter best reserved for men willing to play the proper gentleman. As they stepped out into the warm summer night, he raised a hand to a waiting footman. Please bring the Cardwell coach around. Surprise shaped her mouth into an O. Are you leaving already? I am sending you home. Her hand went tight again. The warmth in her eyes instantly shuttered. She twisted her hand out of his. I will go home when I am ready, and not a moment before. You can't just send me home as if you own me. West crossed his arms, blocking her way back inside. If she wouldn't have a care for herself, he had no choice but to play the role of chivalrous knight, however tarnished his armour. For a moment, he considered the image she presented, dark waves of hair swinging wildly over one temple, her cheeks the sort of pink a man would gladly die trying to bring out in a woman's skin. In spite of his resolve to stay far, far away, in spite of his determination to see her nowhere but home, lust speared him, sharp and unfortunate. If I owned you he growled, giving himself over to the truth. I'd be a damned sight less frustrated, and your cheeks would be flushed with pleasure instead of annoyance. Chapter 13 Mary gaped up at him. Drat it all, but he always knew just what to say to disarm her. Every word that came out of his mouth was fashioned to send her body into spasms of want. Though, what cause had he to be frustrated? He'd made his intentions toward her painfully clear. 
All week long he had avoided her, or worse, ignored her. Tonight, though, for some reason, he seemed unable to leave her be. A silly hope, to have imagined he was escorting her outside for a kiss. She would not make the same mistake twice. She forced her gaze beyond his shoulders to the bright lights of the ball, waiting just beyond the front door. The music inside had shifted from the sweeping waltz they just shared into something lively. Her chance to dance with another partner and ask more questions was slipping from her hands. She considered barreling around him, returning to the fray. But as if he could read her mind, those handsome lips shifted to a smirk. I don't think so. Time for bed, now. Good heavens, he even managed to make that sound suggestive. Either that, or her mind was flying there itself, urged on by his maddening words and easy smiles. He was a danger to the sanity and sanctity of women everywhere. The Cardwell coach pulled up to the steps. With a small huff of irritation, she turned away from the hand he offered, as if he could play the gentleman now, ha, and yanked open the coach door. Ignoring his offer of assistance, she climbed up in a profusion of skirts and silk. She imagined he would shut the door and instruct the driver to take her straight home. Instead, he surprised her by climbing in and settling on the seat across from her. You are coming too, she asked bitterly. I don't trust you to see yourself all the way home, came his infuriatingly mild reply. He rapped on the roof, and then they were off, spinning through the evening, gas lights flashing by the glass windows in a muddied smear of light. A moment of silence passed, a gasp of time during which Mary tried, in vain, to compose herself. How could she have been so foolish as to imagine he'd only wanted to dance with her, to walk with her in the moonlight, and perhaps kiss her again? Those handsome blue eyes had knocked her sideways, destroyed her ability to think strategically. He had done it to distract her, and then waltzed her right off the dance floor before she knew which end was up. She fixed her eyes on the ceiling of the coach, the door's fine-grained woodwork gleaming in the occasional flash of light from the street. Anywhere but him. You are trembling, he observed. Mary's gaze jerked toward him, though it was dangerous to give her eyes such permission. He was brooding across the seat, one leg stretched out in front of him, brushing against her skirts. I assure you, she retorted, it is not from fear. Naive of you, I'd say, given the danger you stirred up tonight, asking questions of everyone in sight. I am not in danger, she snapped. Good heavens, must you natter on about it so? I only asked a few questions of a few people. It isn't as if I stood drunkenly on the punch table and shouted, Does anyone here want to kill Queen Victoria? He stared at her for an undecipherable moment, then patted the seat next to him. If you aren't afraid, you must be cold then. Come and sit next to me. I know how to keep you warm. I am not cold. In fact... She was incensed. She stripped off her gloves, hoping it might help cool the flush spreading beneath her skin. I am trembling because I am angry, you dolt, with you. There was a moment of silence. She thought, perhaps, he was laughing at her. But in the sudden flash of an outside gaslight, she caught the tension in his jaw. He didn't look to be enjoying himself precisely. Why are you angry? he asked, more softly now. You have no right to treat me this way. There was a beat of hesitation, as if he was considering his answer. Perhaps it isn't a God-given right, he said, as much as concern that makes me take such an imprudent interest in your hide. His voice thickened. But there is no denying I feel responsible for you. Once again, his words spun circles in her ears. She didn't want to believe he felt anything for her but annoyance, but when he said things like that and looked at her like this, she could nearly believe he meant it.
that she meant something to him beyond a thorn in his side. But good heavens, could the man not decide his intentions? One moment he was cold toward her, the next he was too hot. Wasn't a changeable nature supposed to be a woman's purview? It was growing exhausting trying to guess his moods. Then you are fickle, she retorted, shaking her head clear of those dangerous thoughts and hopes, as well as foolish. I'm not the one taking foolish risks, and if you insist on cavorting about town without a chaperone, chasing all manner of ruffians, I will have no choice but to tell Lady Ashington about your adventures. Mary gasped out loud. You wouldn't, wouldn't I? Fear kicked aside the potent combination of anger and attraction he'd kindled, the danger of such a threat all too real. Have you forgotten about my sister's condition? She feels too responsible for my circumstances now, thanks to your insufferable behaviour at the literary salon. She could not withstand the strain of such a surprise. He spread his hands. That would be on your head, not mine. Though it was the truth, his argument stung. She had done all she could to hide the circumstances of this newest adventure from Eleanor, but even as she let herself out of the silent, sleeping house, she had known there was some risk of discovery. She felt remorse in taking such a risk with her sister's health, but she didn't know what else to do. She was trying to help everyone, and lives were at stake on both sides of the equation. If only he showed some sign of taking the threats to the Queen's life seriously, things might be different. But as long as he ignored the looming danger, how could she choose another path? She must not find out, Mary breathed. Promise me, West, that you won't tell her. If it came down to a matter of ensuring your safety, I would have to. He pulled a hand through his hair, though he scarcely needed the help to look any more rakish. Besides, have you considered that someone else might tell her of your evening's adventure? he added. That she might read about you once again in the gossip rags. Everyone saw us dancing. The gossip must even now be flying about the ballroom. She looked down at her hands. Drat it all. He was right. She hadn't thought about that possibility when she'd permitted him to tug her onto the dance floor. The man made every sane thought in her head go straight to mush. Good heavens, could this web of deceit get any thicker? She looked up, anger splicing her shame. You are insufferable, she shot across the few inches that separated them. Why, oh why, had she consented to a dance with him? He had probably known what he was doing from the start, plotting a public downfall, using it to press his advantage. Incorrigible! Her mind flew to a simpler word, one that even someone as thick as he could understand. Selfish! He shrugged. I've been called worse. Indecent! She retorted. Irredeemable! No, I believe cowardly was the term used tonight. She nodded. Craven, pusillanimous. I know how much you like to read, but I've had a few years at university myself. I studied architecture for a time under Philip Hardwick, so you should know that tossing around such large words isn't going to impress me. His smirk plucked at her anger. So, too, did the reminder that he was not as stupid as she liked to imagine. Philip Hardwick was one of London's most distinguished architects, and the thought that this man had once aspired to something more useful than to seduce scores of women sent anger coursing through her. Well, large stones aren't going to impress me. So you admit they are large? Her eyes narrowed. Drat the man. He even managed to boast like a scoundrel. His ego was as enormous as his, well, his stones. You are the most egotistical man, she panted. Supercilious. You forgot large, he taunted. She glared at him through the spinning shadows inside the coach. Not so large, 
a lie, that, because she had felt him well enough when he'd pressed his body against hers tonight, and heaven help her, she'd felt an answering curiosity swirling inside her. In fact, I think diminutive might be a better word choice. Minuscule. Infinitesimal. Have easy with such premature judgments. White teeth flashed in the darkness. You can't really know how large they are until you hold them in your hands. I wouldn't. That is, a lady would never. Her protest trailed off, and her cheeks flamed with unwelcome heat. Truly, she didn't know what a lady might or might not do. He'd no doubt had plenty in his bed through the years. You, sir, she choked out, are no gentleman. Haven't claimed to be, as far as I know, he said, even as the coach pulled to a stop, signalling their arrival at Grosvenor Square. Most ladies prefer a bit of a rogue, truthfully. He glanced out the window, his brow furrowing. Here you are, number 29, Grosvenor Square, safe and sound. Mary hesitated. She might be safe, but she was hardly sound, given that part of her wanted to stay right here in the coach. Fuming at herself now as much as him, she shook herself from her scoundrel-induced stupor and reached a hand toward the door latch, only to find it suddenly trapped beneath his gloved hand. Her pulse started, like a bird flushed from heather. She glared at him. Was there something else you wanted? Would you like to call me Miss Rat now, instead of Mouse? God, no, he choked. A curious shudder ran through him, and her hand absorbed it, though what it meant she had no clue. Then perhaps you might like to come inside and start shouting in the stairwell. Hatch a plan to send my sister into early labour. I assure you, there is no need to pursue additional measures to ensure my compliance. I will not interfere again. The threats you've made are quite sufficient to muzzle any further nocturnal activities I might be considering. Nocturnal activities, hmm? He rose from his seat, nearly predatory over her, his hand still pinning hers to the door. Where must that innocent mind be dwelling to come up with such a specific phrase? Must you always turn a simple conversation into innuendo? she snapped, though she did not try to tug her hand free. My mind is not dwelling on anything but irritation, I assure you, and the driver will neither move nor speculate as to the cause of our delay, she stiffened, because he is familiar with your reputation, because I supplement his salary and he knows to be discreet. Gently, he tugged her hand away from the door latch. She let him, settled back onto her seat, watched, without protest, as he pulled down the shade over the little glass window. Confusion scattered her wits. Apparently West wasn't quite ready for her to go in yet either. The thought made her fingers curl over the silk gloves bunched in her hand. He moved closer, his head bent down. She could smell the fresh soap and cinnamon scent of rum wafting off his skin, the faint, acrid scent of smoke, not at all unpleasant, clinging to his clothes. The melding fragrances were no less potent than the twisted promise in his words. She sank back against the velvet seat. Why would you wish me to stay another moment? You've delivered your threats, hastened me home, nearly trussed and bound— I can't imagine what else you feel we must discuss. Trust and bound. He shook his handsome head. Honestly, Miss Channing, you have a flair for carnal theatrics. He settled on his knees in front of her, his head now level with her own. Can you not even admit you feel it? He tugged the gloves out of her clutched fingers, placed them on the seat beside her. This odd... Alchemy between us. Mary's eyes drifted toward her discarded gloves, feeling the loss of that armour keenly of a sudden. Her heart was spinning on a broken axis.
She had no experience in such things, possessed no standard against which to measure the depth of this folly. He described it as alchemy, but she suspected it came closer to sorcery. And as prettily as the words were delivered, as much as it made her skin flush warm, it was a claim she couldn't, mustn't believe. Hardly odd, she scoffed, lifting her eyes to meet his own, from a man who's had half the eligible women in London. Surely no more than a quarter of them. His words might be infuriating, but something about the timber of his voice was making her stomach turn into an endless loop of want. He chuckled. Though I've admittedly had some of the ineligible ones, too. Drat it all, did he have to remind her? She understood she was sitting in a darkened coach with an insufferable rake. Understood, too, she was here by choice, not duress. She did not need the reminder of her foolishness. Yes, I've heard of your substantial amount of experience in the field of alchemy, she said bitterly. In response, he began to strip the glove from his right hand, loosening the fingers and then sliding it off in a smooth, practiced motion. Mary watched through the darkness, her breath trapped in her throat. Dear heavens, he even undressed like a scoundrel, every move destined to send women into paroxysms of want. She watched as the leather slid free and he dropped the fine kid skin onto the floor of the coach. Perhaps, he said, almost lazily, that substantial experience is how I know this chemistry between us is so odd. The night thickened, the air in the coach stirring with small eddies of possibility. I should think, she breathed, her eyes drifting to the tempting, bare gleam of his hand, that odd is too simple of a word, especially given that her own emotions tilted more in the portentous direction. He removed his other glove, and then his hands were laid bare, though for what reason she couldn't yet guess. Not for any safe, proper purpose, of that she was sure. She thought of how his hand had dipped into her bodice that night in the library. What if he meant to do that again? What if she wanted him to do that again? But no. His fingers were only shifting to dance over her silk-covered knee, the pressure and warmth of his touch shocking even through all the layers. If not odd, perhaps you might choose another word then. His lips shifted into a particularly wicked smile. Incongruous might be more pleasing to your vocabulary. Anomalous. His fingers swirled against her skirts, a silken rhythmic promise. No matter what else you may think of me, you must believe me when I say, this sort of pull between two people, this rubbing along together. He hesitated, as if sorting through the words to apply. It does not happen every day. She refused to believe it, even as she prayed he wouldn't stop. She'd read any number of novels, lost herself in the story on more occasions than she could count. She knew better than most that villains would say nearly anything to have their way with a heroine. It feels more like we are rubbing in opposite directions a good deal of the time, she breathed, though she could not summon the good sense to pull away from his touch. Sometimes the right friction creates the most delicious kind of pleasure. His other hand curled against her opposite calf, shifting her legs apart so he could lean closer, kneeling in front of her. Her skin prickled with awareness. This, this was the proximity her body was craving. His grin shifted to something wicked at her lack of protest, his handsome mouth hovering only inches from her own now. And you must trust me when I say, Mary, that I know exactly where to rub. The faint hint of whiskey on his breath proved her undoing. She imagined if she pressed her tongue to the corner of his mouth, she would taste the spirit there.
In the faint light drifting in from around the edges of the window shade, she stared at the sinful swoop of his upper lip, nearly flush with her own. The feelings he had so expertly evoked that night behind the library curtains, welled up beneath her skin, nearly pushed her forward. I... I should probably leave, she breathed. The coach door is not locked, he murmured softly. You may leave whenever you wish. His touch against her knee lightened. And you probably ought to leave before you do something you will regret. Mary swallowed. He made it sound as if the choice was hers. As he crouched in front of her, his bare hands against her silk-draped skin, she realized that perhaps it was her choice. What would it cost, really, a moment in his arms? The entire city already believed her the worst sort of wanton. The entirety of Mayfair had seen the gossip rags, and moreover had probably seen her leave tonight with the most infamous scoundrel in London tonight. What harm would come of kissing him again when the world believed she'd done worse? That knowledge, more than anything, propelled her to imprudence. She leaned forward and pressed her lips against his, fumbling inexpertly at the mechanics of it, trying to remember the few pieces she had learned that night in the library and again during that fleeting moment in the cathedral. He did taste of whiskey and lemonade as well, and the flavours propelled her onward. Pleasure spiralled in her abdomen, a centrifugal desire centering low. His hands came up to cup the back of her head, loosening the few pins she had ineptly placed there, and her hair gave up its narrow hold on propriety, tumbling down around her shoulders. He offered a small groan of approval against her mouth. His fingers tightened against her scalp, shifting her head, changing the angle of how they met. And just like that, her initial blunder of a kiss shifted to something that nearly made the seat vibrate beneath her. Oh, she breathed, her lips parting, an invitation, naively offered, perhaps, but gladly taken by the rogue who currently held her in his expert hands. His tongue began to move in lazy circles against her own, languorous sweeps inside her mouth. The feel of his thumbs cradling her face loosened a sigh of pleasure from somewhere deep inside her, a place she couldn't name or touch. His mouth played against her own, testing the hot, warm sweep of his tongue melting inside her. Her fingers fisted in his jacket, hauling him closer. Obligingly, his hands swept up and then down her bare arms, raising goose flesh in their wake, and leaving behind a trail of trembling want. His fingers came down to twine into her own, and then he lifted her hands high above her head, pinning them lightly against the velvet backing of the seat, causing her breasts to rise high above her corset and brush against the wool of his evening jacket and then he was licking his way down her neck, branding each inch of skin with small pinches of teeth. Oh, but the man knew what he was doing. Her head lolled back against the soft seat back, the heat in her womb blooming into more of an explosion. Alchemy, he'd called it, more like arson, a flame set to ready tinder. She wished she could resent him for making her want this, want him so very much, but that would require logic and reason, and those necessary pieces of thought had quite flown out of the coach window at the moment. His touch became teasing. Though one hand kept her wrists lifted high, his other hand drifted down the swell of her breast to dip beneath her neckline. Oh, she gasped, as his hand found the magic of her nipple, rolling the needful skin between his fingers. Yes, there. His mouth came back to hers, diving in for a hot, wet, wicked kiss. Now her own hands moved, pulling from his slight grip, lowering about his neck, 
threading through the sinful softness of the hair at his nape. There was a familiarity here, a hint of memory. They'd done this before, behind the curtains, that portentous night. It was nearly a relief to realise this was what she had been missing these heady, frustrating few weeks. But there was newness, too. A rush of air tickled her silk stockings. She felt the slide of her skirts as he inched them upward toward her knees, the silk and crinolines fisted in one hand, even as the other hand played expertly against her breast. His fingers danced, truly, there was no other word for it, against the quivering skin of her thighs, advancing, retreating, evoking a repartee of want and hope, promising more and yet warning her to wait. All the while he kissed her, wreaking havoc on every sense she had, and some she hadn't known she possessed. West slowed his ascent, though every sense he possessed told him to reach his destination faster. Good Christ, what was he doing? He'd only intended to have a little taste of her lips, remind himself of her innocence, of all the reasons they shouldn't do this. But the moment her lips had met his, his restraint went to shite. Even now, as he gently broke away from their kiss, searching her face for clues as to how to apologise for such boorish behaviour, his thoughts retained the blurred consistency of a fever dream. The taste of her lingered on the tongue like the sweetest of drugs, and in spite of his stern admonishment to make his mouth behave, he couldn't help but let his hands linger on the soft rise of her thigh resting beneath his fingers. She didn't tell him, no. He swallowed, almost wishing she would. If there was a reality to be found here, it was hazy, a muddied understanding that, however far she was willing to take this, he would not, could not, go as far as he wanted. But he couldn't quite resist sliding a finger along the ribbon that held up her garter, the knowledge of what the bit of frippery guarded making his fingers tremble. A world of temptation in that ribbon, and a world of temptation in this woman. Odd, he'd called this thing stretching between them. He'd meant it. He could think of no other word that so adequately described the feelings she evoked in him, this sensation of wanting something so desperately, and yet not knowing where he was heading or what he was doing. She'd called him fickle and foolish, and perhaps he was both those things. But it was telling, perhaps, how steadfast he was in those sentiments. No matter how hard he pushed her away, no matter how forcefully he drove himself in the opposite direction, he kept circling back to her. He was an experienced rake. He'd welcomed women more worldly than this one into his bed, and made sure each one left happy. He was not supposed to tremble at the thought of untying a simple silk ribbon, or lowering a wisp of stocking. And yet, here he was, his fingers shaking as the ribbon slid free of its loops, a whisper of silk and sin. As he hooked his fingers about the top of her stocking, he met her gaze. She was staring down at him, eyes wide, her hair a dark curtain of rain about her shoulders, and her sweet swell of chest rising and falling in encouragement. Perhaps, perhaps there was something to be done here. Something beyond a mumbled, false apology. Something that would keep her innocence and his sanity intact, but still thrum the chords of pleasure he could feel vibrating beneath her skin. He slowly began to inch the silk stocking down her leg, all the while watching her face for signs to guide this journey. A small puff of a sigh escaped her lips. Her eyes fluttered closed, and her hands curled against the velvet seat. He hesitated as the stocking rounded her knee. What did that sigh mean?'
He felt out of his depth with uncertainty, wanting her with a ferocity that would have made those who thought they knew him fall down in spasms of laughter. How fast and hard the mighty fall! If she told him no again, which was a word he knew well could fall so easily from those lips, he would stop. Leave them both wanting and unsatisfied, though he knew he had the power to bring at least one of them to completion this night. But no, she was shifting against the velvet seat, slipping out of her shoes, lifting her leg ever so slightly, granting him an undreamed-of permission. A groan of approval slid out of him as he took the advantage she offered. He slid the silk lower over the sweet, rounded curve of her calf, past a trim ankle, and then he turned his attention to the other side, repeating the process, moving by scant inches, until at last her legs were beautifully bared for him. He sank back on his heels, his heart a bloody hammer against his ribs. She had the loveliest legs, begging for the sort of attention he knew how to give. He turned himself over to the pleasure of providing it, pressed his mouth against the sweet curve of skin, inhaled the lemon essence of her, sharply innocent and yet the most seductive fragrance possible. He kissed his way up the length of her leg, lingering on every curve, every hollow. And all the while, his thoughts wrapped greedily around the sound of her pants and moans, filing them away for later dissection and enjoyment. He nipped along the tender skin of her thighs, pushing the wire cage of her crinoline aside with a frustrated hand. Damned modern things, blocking a man's way to a woman's pleasure. His fingers slipped through the opening in her drawers. Brushed her damp curls, searching for her core. When he found it, relief and lust threatened to swamp him. She was slick with promise. At last he could read her, though he doubted she realized she was now an open book. She wanted this, wanted him. His fingers found the place that made her hips lift, pleading toward his hand, the very heart of a woman, the doorway to her desire. He slipped a finger inside her, felt her quim tighten deliciously. Ah, God! But he wanted this woman, wanted to see her undressed, flushed with pleasure beneath him, her eyes wide with the wonder he could show her. But all they had was this stolen moment, crinolines and coach seats, and nighttime shadows. He would make it count for her. He could do nothing else. He took a moment to learn her, focused on her small, breathy size, the way her body twisted toward his fingers. The sounds she made nearly made him spill in his trousers, but this was about her pleasure, not his, and so he forced his mind away from the demands of his own body. She helped him along, her gasps of pleasure like a symphony to his ears. She was twisting beneath him now, her hands roped through his hair, that telltale pressure against his scalp, like a guidebook to her spiralling pleasure. He paid attention to that miraculous touch against his hair, adjusted his approach, added a second finger to her inner exploration, curling his fingers into the heart of her. There, he could tell by the way she drew in a sharp breath. He'd found her, sorted her out. Her breaths became pants, and her hands fisted to the point of near pain against his scalp. He was relentless, driving her toward the cliff he knew awaited her, luring her over the point of hesitation, until he could feel her trembling on the edge. He placed his thumb against her swollen nub, pressed it there, insisting, "Let go." Mary, he breathed, begging her to take the chance. She slid over the abyss, her body rigid, the discovery of her own potential for pleasure, a desperate cry on her lips.
Her body convulsed about his needy fingers, the breath whooshing out of her. He'd never seen a more beautiful sight. And then she was settling back to earth, her eyes closed, her quim rippling about his fingers. He tried to remember if he'd ever delivered a woman's pleasure with no expectation or possibility of finding his own. Couldn't think of a time. The sight of her, tousled and languid, tempted him to dive back in and convince her of the need for another go. But instead, he slowly collected himself, pulled her skirts back down, smoothed a hand down her leg. He couldn't do much about the stockings. Redressing a woman was a skill he'd never needed to learn. He collected the filmy silk underthings from the floorboards, along with her gloves, placed the items on her lap, rocked back on his heels and waited for her to say something, anything. Her eyes fluttered open. That was, uh, quite climactic. He chuckled at her choice of word. Are such things not discussed in those books you are always reading? He teased. You can do that endlessly, as many times and as often as you wish. Men, usually, need a bit of time between goes. Though he suspected that for him, that time would be remarkably short if she was the reward waiting at the end of his recovery. He slipped her shoe back onto her bare feet, trying to sever the lustful nature of his thoughts. It didn't work. He was wound tighter than a clock tower, and relief was not to be found in this coach tonight. He dared to meet her eyes, felt bowled over by the way she looked, her hair falling over her shoulders, her skin dewy in the meagre light. He'd done that to her. He'd done that with her, and God help him, he wanted to do more. Instead, he pushed away from where he was kneeling. She'd crawled under his skin somehow, made him lose his wits every time she walked into a room. Oh, but the things he could show her, if given half a chance. But no matter how delightful this interlude, no matter how passion flared so readily between them, she didn't want him as a husband, had made it abundantly clear. So he stood up as well as he could in the body of the cramped coach, straightened his jacket and turned the latch on the coach door, climbed outside into the streetlight and offered her his hand. She stared down at it, her mouth slightly open, her lips still swollen from his kiss. Come now, let's get you inside quickly now he prompted, before your sister discovers you are gone. That, finally, shook her out of her hesitation. She placed one bare hand in his, her gloves and stockings clutched in the other, and climbed out in a froth of wrinkled skirts and must hair. They walked up the steps in silence. Do you have a key? he asked, as they came to the front door. Yes, I lifted it from Mrs. Greaves' keyring during afternoon tea. She opened the front door, and her gaze met his over her shoulder. I, well, that is, she worried her lip in her teeth. I suppose this is good night, then. He nodded stiffly. Good night, Miss Channing. Sleep well. As the door closed and he heard the sound of the key in the lock, he leaned his forehead against the door, trying to wrestle his emotions under control. He'd long imagined they would be a combustible mix when they finally found a way to do more than spar, and tonight had proven his suspicions true. What were they doing, pursuing this strange, dangerous folly? She'd been correct when she'd pointed out that more often than not they rubbed in opposite directions. He felt like a foolish young man again, panting after that untouchable nun in the vestibule of the Cathedral de Santa Maria del Fiore. Not even two weeks ago this woman had refused his more honourable overtures—
He could ask her to marry him again, but he suspected he would know her answer. No. A thousand times, no. Hell, she'd nearly refused his request tonight for a simple, uncomplicated dance. And could he blame her? She thought him a rake. He'd all but proven it tonight, kissing her in such a manner when he ought to be running in the complete opposite direction. He would be the first to admit he would make a terrible husband. And that meant this simmering thing, stretching between them, could go no further, could end nowhere but these front steps, for her own safety as much as his own sanity. There was no other choice. He himself was as much a danger to her as the damned assassins. From the Diary of Miss Mary Channing, June the 12th, 1858. After all that passed between us tonight, West delivered me to my front door with neither another kiss to say goodbye nor a promise to meet me on the morrow. I had imagined, perhaps, that after sharing such an intimate moment, things had shifted between us, that he considered me a partner, potentially something more. It is embarrassing, really, to think of how easily I fell under his spell tonight. I should be angry with him, but instead I feel a mindless confusion. He isn't doing anything to find the assassins, at least not that I can see. If Westmore would only give me some hint that he has the situation well in hand, I would leave it to him. But he does nothing except drag me from ballrooms and distract me with heart-stopping kisses. And now we have lost another day. Chapter 14 Mary sat up in her bed, blinking in awareness. She could hear the echo of a clock somewhere down the hallway, outside of her locked door. She held her breath, counting. Five chimes. Five o'clock, then. She glanced toward her locked window, the thick air already hinting at the warm day to come. Perhaps she should start sleeping with her window open. After all, she no longer had a need to be afraid of her villain from the garden. He delivered her to her front door with her virtue intact, as though he couldn't wait to be rid of her. And then, through the window, she had watched him saunter off toward the south of Mayfair, in the direction of Madame Xavier's, which was really neither here nor there, where he spent his nights should not be her primary concern. But, drat the man, last night he'd destroyed any chance they'd had to identify the traitors with his possessive performance and his ready distractions. He really was rather good at this business of ruining opportunities and people. Not that she was offering up much by way of a hazard to either enterprise. Confused by her feelings and irritated with herself for succumbing so easily to his charms, Mary reached over to turn up her low-burning lamp. In truth, she was as irritated with herself as she was at West. The debacle behind the library curtains might be debated as to cause and effect, but the responsibility for last night's misadventure could be laid at no feet but her own. But, oh, how he touched her, the sounds she had made, the things she had felt. She supposed she would now be counted amongst the man's many conquests, a number, a notch, on his bedpost. At least she'd accomplished something memorable during this trip to London. She picked up her diary, intending to relieve some of her frustration in another journal entry, but before she could pick up her pen, something fell out into her lap. Reaching down, she lifted up a folded note with a plain, unmarked wax seal. Curious, she broke the seal and opened it. The words swam menacingly toward her. Have a care, Miss Channing. <laughs>
You are asking questions that will get you killed. For a moment, Mary sat frozen, one hand over her mouth, her heart tearing a hole through her chest. The words were printed in a hasty scrawl, the very loops of the letters as threatening as a noose. But the shape and meaning of the words themselves seemed almost irrelevant compared to the inherent threat present in the appearance of the note itself. Someone had placed it in her journal. Someone had been in her room, rifling through her personal effects while she slept, intruding on her innermost thoughts. Panic thickened inside her. She felt powerless, violated, vulnerable. It was as if she was once again that terrified, ten-year-old girl, helpless to protect herself against an unseen danger that seemed determined to snuff out the lives of those most dear to her. But then, with a relieved gasp, she realized who must have left the note. Not just someone, the man ever most present on her mind, that damned Westmore. Just who did he think he was, after everything that had passed between them last night, sneaking a note like that into her private journal? And how had he done it, given that her door and her window had been locked tight? Perhaps he had paid a maid with a key to slip it between the pages, though just what he would have paid the servant with, she didn't want to contemplate probably mind-drugging kisses. It had to be him. She recalled his warnings of the previous evening, his specific choice of words. He claimed she was asking dangerous questions, and she hadn't believed him. He'd decided that last night's threats weren't enough, and was resorting now to a childish prank to make his point. She swung her legs over the side of the bed, snatching up her wrapper. Well, she wasn't going to sit here cowering in her room or allow herself to be bullied. With the note crumpled in her hand, she flew down the stairs and plunged out into the early morning light, aiming for the intimidatingly large manor house three doors down. She rapped on the door knocker, a thousand insults flashing through her mind. But when the door was opened, those insults died on her tongue. An elderly butler stood in the doorway in his nightshirt, holding up a candle and looking as surprised to see her as she was to see him. Drat it all, of course Westmore wouldn't open his own front door at half-past five in the morning. He likely hadn't even come home from the night before. She pulled her wrapper more tightly about her. Is Mr. Westmore home? she asked in a tight, small voice. She lifted her hand with its crumpled paper. I need a word with him. The servant opened the door wider. What has Master Geoffrey done this time? The man said, shaking his balding head. He motioned her forward. Please do come in, miss. If nothing else, you can wait in the drawing room until he stumbles his way home from whatever gutter is occupying his attention at present. To West's mind, the early morning sun peeking over Grosvenor Square seemed clearer than usual, or perhaps that clarity was owed to his unfortunate sobriety. After seeing Mary home, he'd made his way to White's, keeping the earlier promise he'd made to Grant. He'd spent several hours with an untouched drink in one hand, ears tuned to the room's surrounding conversation, watching his friend fall ever deeper into his cups. When Grant had suggested a visit to Madame Xavier's, he'd declined. What would be the point? Vivian was gone, and there were more important matters holding his attention at present— Scarlet and her dubious charms were not chief among them. As Grant had staggered off in search of a splendid frolic, he'd pulled out Mary's list of dukes, running through each one in his mind. Most were far too old. The whispered voice in his head almost certainly belonged to someone young 
and arrogant, but there were enough possibilities to leave him stumped. It looked like Mary was right in her approach, if not her enthusiasm. He needed a more methodical way of sorting through the list than lurking in shadows and trying to match voices to the one in his memory. Not that he would ever admit such a thing to her. Finally, when the staff at White's began straightening the chairs and collecting empty glasses, he'd picked himself up and headed home, the need for sleep muddying his thoughts. But even as he fit his key to the lock, West dreaded the thought of finding his bed and the nightmares he knew would await him there. His gaze drifted down the street, three houses to the left, number 29 Grosvenor Square. Perhaps he ought to find her bed instead. He suspected his dreams would be more pleasant, at any rate. Unexpectedly, the front door jerked open, carrying his key with it. Nice of you to finally come home this evening, Master Geoffrey. Wilson loomed in the doorway, his wrinkled face seeming more in focus than usual. Of course, there was no whiskey involved to take off the sting of the servant's disapproval this morning, though evening no longer seems the appropriate term. West pushed past the butler, the idea of sneaking into Mary's room, withering to nothing but a twitch of want. More than likely, she'd greet him by whacking a bloody book over his head, and then produce a list she'd written of all the reasons why their continued flirtation was a very poor idea. Not now, Wilson, I've had a hell of a night. He pulled a weary hand across his face. I am not in the mood for another one of your lectures. Though it appears you are in the mood for a visitor, Wilson replied calmly. I've placed her in the drawing room, though, given her state of undress, I suppose your bedroom might have been just as appropriate. West stared at the old servant. He'd never, not once in his life, brought a woman home to Cardwell House. This was where his demons lived, where his nightmares stalked him. Who on earth are you talking about? he demanded. Your paramour did not provide her name. I took the liberty of not informing your parents. But I don't have a... West's protest that he didn't have a paramour trailed away. In fact, he hadn't had a single woman since that mouse of a virgin had snuck her way into his life. Which meant it could be only one woman who was waiting for him. He pushed open the door to the drawing room, his heart thumping its eagerness, though just a few hours before he'd berated himself for touching her. She was standing by the front window, her hands clutching the thin white muslin of her night wrapper. Seeing her virginal image so at odds with the siren she had been in his coach last night, he felt a bit as if someone had kicked him in the stomach or the very stones she had accused him of lacking. Miss Channing, he said, deciding that formality was as good a defence as any. To what do I owe the pleasure this morning? Though it might be more correct to say she owed him the pleasure after last night. She regarded him with an intensity he couldn't quite define. I watched you come up the steps, you seem quite steady. You, uh, haven't been out drinking? No. He shook his head. More's the pity. She hesitated. Have you been to see Scarlet? No, I haven't seen Scarlet since our visit to the brothel last Sunday. He took a step toward her, shattering his resolve to keep his distance. You should know that Wilson is under the impression that you are my chosen diversion for the evening. He loosened a low chuckle. Or the morning, as the case may be. Her eyes widened. But why would he think that of me? Probably because he would believe it of me. West stepped closer, until she was standing within an arm's length 
He gave his eyes permission to drift over her body. And you dressed the part. The gentle scent of lemons tickled his nose. He shook his head, trying to clear the buzz she always seemed to cause out of his brain. What do you want, Mouse? he asked, abandoning both his stiff formality and his predatory march. It's been a long, tiring night, and I need to find my bed. And, if he was lucky, a dreamless sort of sleep. Her hand pushed forward, a piece of crumpled paper clasped in it. Not so long or tiring, you couldn't find the time to do this, it seems. He eyed the bit of paper in her hand, wondering why her voice sounded so strained. Another list. He took it from her hand. You might wait until I've had a chance to finish investigating your first three lists. It's not a list, she said, her voice a hard knot, as you well know. He unfolded it and stared down at the paper. His gut clenched as he read the words. Where did you get this? he demanded, finding it hard to breathe. You placed it in my journal. No, I didn't. Why would you think I would do such a thing? And after you lectured me last night about the danger in asking questions, I thought, perhaps, you were trying to teach me a lesson. Her voice trailed off, and her chin started to tremble a bit. It has to have been you, West. You are joking with me now. You just received it, last night. The blood pounded in his ears, very near the same feeling he'd once felt in battle, a battle where men had died in spite of his best efforts. He wasn't properly armed. Not for this. It can't have been me, he said tersely. You saw me come in. When would I have had time to do such a thing? I... that is... she trailed off, uncertain. To hammer home this point, and because God knew he had a trickster's reputation to overcome, he strode to the writing desk on the far side of the drawing room. Opening a drawer with an angry rattle, he pulled out a sheet of paper, scribbled something on it, and then stalked back, shoving it at her. This is my handwriting. See, it doesn't match. The colour drained from her face. But if not you, she whispered, then... You said you found it in your journal, he snarled, grateful that at last she was starting to believe him. Where do you keep it? By my bed, she cried, losing her composure now. I wrote a journal entry before I went to bed last night, and I know it wasn't there then. That meant someone came into my room while I was sleeping, she swallowed. My locked room, West. She began to pant, small beads of perspiration shining against her forehead. The window was locked, too. West crushed the paper in his hand. That means someone used a key. He hesitated. Or else picked the lock. What am I going to do? she cried. West wanted to smash a fist against the wall. Instead, he pulled her into the cage of his arms, determined to protect her even from herself. He told her she was behaving dangerously, but the warning had come too late. He burrowed his nose in the citrus scent of her hair, and his gut clenched with the need to keep her safe. He thought back to last night, how he'd watched her from the hallway, envy making his skin itch. He'd watched her speak to a dozen different people before he'd whisked her home. The traitor must have been one of them. I think the more appropriate question, he said, worry thickening his voice, is what are we going to do? I would not leave you to face this alone. He held her tightly, unwilling to loosen his grip, though his body was responding to such closeness in a very instinctive way, no matter the danger lurking outside their door. He wanted her. But wanting her and having her were not the same thing. And the thought he might lose her to an assassin's bullet made him break out in a cold sweat. Through the pounding of her ears, it occurred to Mary that her face was pressed against an evening jacket that smelled faintly of smoke and spirits. The scent reminded her he was a scoundrel, not to be trusted, 
And yet, somehow, with his arms around her, she felt safer. Though she wanted to burrow closer, climb inside him and curl into a ball, she forced herself to pull back. I am so, so sorry, West, she said, wiping her eyes. I imagined you were just playing another prank, but you were right all along. If I hadn't barged about the ballroom last night, asking those awful questions, stop, he interrupted, his face darker than she'd ever seen it. In a book, a man who looked like that, well, a heroine ought to run fast and furious in the other direction. But the knowledge that his anger was not directed toward her made her want to dive back into the shelter of his arms. It is done, he ground out, and so now we need to focus on removing you from harm's way. Someone within Ashington's household staff must have placed that note, which means you cannot stay there, not any more. He looked toward the door, as if mulling over a decision. You will stay here at Cardwell House until I can sort out who sent this note. It was not posed as a question. But no matter the impropriety of it, his words brought an awareness that heretofore had been lacking. Eleanor! Mary gasped. She lifted a fist to her mouth, thinking of Dr. Merrill's warnings and servants sneaking into locked rooms to leave threatening notes. Oh, West, my sister. She is not in the best health, and Lord Ashington isn't due back for two more weeks. Her knees threatened to buckle. I will never forgive myself if I have brought harm to her or the baby. His jaw tightened. Then Lady Ashington will stay here as well. Mary's heart lurched. He was promising her the impossible. Safety. Shelter. But, no buts, Mary. I need to know you are safe in order to focus my efforts to track down the traitors. I can't do that with you there, unprotected. You are trying to track them down? She gulped, trying to understand. But last night, at the ball, you said that you didn't care any longer, that we should forget what we heard in the library. I only said that because I didn't want you to do anything rash, he growled. I've been working this trail as hard as I can, trying to get enough evidence that Scotland Yard would have to believe me. For God's sake, I even visited Bedlam, and in the evenings I have been attending every possible social event where a duke might be present, listening for that whisper of a voice I can't get out of my head. He exhaled slowly. Why else do you think I have been out so late at night? I had thought, perhaps, you'd been visiting Madame Xavier's. No. What would be the point of returning to the brothel when the trail there has gone cold? He reached toward the bell rope. There is no time to waste. I will send Wilson over to collect your sister. Wait! she cried out, panicked. She clutched at his arm, pulling him away. We can't stay here. Well, you aren't staying there, not with a lunatic on staff in that house. We don't know he is a lunatic. She offered him a tremulous smile. After all, it could still be the Fenians. Be serious, he barked down at her. All right, let's be serious then. The rumours are already rife, thanks to our unfortunate incident at the literary salon, and if this morning's gossip rags really do include mention of our dance, it will be even worse. My sister doesn't trust you, West. She will never agree to let me stay here. Tell her the truth, then. She heaved out a frustrated breath. It was all too tangled, too complicated, and, as her sister grew ever larger, too dangerous. I wasn't lying in the coach last night, telling Eleanor about the plot we overheard, and the fact that someone on her staff is involved might well send her into a disastrous early labour. Dr. Mariel said she is to avoid undue excitement. She pressed her hand against her throat, knowing that, whatever she did, she was posing a danger to her sister. The only question was, which was the least dangerous course? I would do anything to protect her, to shield her from that. Even die? She sucked in a startled breath. I...
That is, this isn't a prank, Mary. It is a threat, and a very explicit one at that. You can't stay there, not until we uncover the traitors and link them to whoever left this. It was hard to understand why this was even a discussion they were having. Mary was in danger, and she needed to find a safer place to stay. Why was she being so bleeding obstinate about this? Would you consider returning home to Yorkshire? West asked, though he was beginning to think anywhere other than Cardwell House was too dangerous. It would be too dangerous for Eleanor to travel all the way to Yorkshire in her advanced state, and I can't leave my sister behind, not when whoever did this is still in the house. She rubbed a finger against her forehead, looking distraught. Could I stay at your sister's house? Dr. Muriel was my family's physician when I was younger. Surely they would be willing to take me in, and while not strictly proper, we cannot ask them. West shook his head. They have three small children, and I don't want to put my niece and nephews in harm's way. He tossed about for other possibilities. His sister Lucy's London house was similarly bursting with children, the youngest not yet even six months old, and Lydia lived in Lincolnshire now, a similarly impossible journey. Is there some reason you are afraid to stay at Cardwell House, beyond the issue of what people may say or think, because truly they already think the worst of us? Can't you see? She looked close to crying. I can't stay here with you, not with your reputation and my weakness. She buried her face in her hands. He stared down at her, agape. Weakness? She was quite possibly the strongest woman he'd ever met, that single, uncharacteristic fainting spell notwithstanding. But at least now he understood the reasons for her hesitancy. She was afraid of whoever placed that note, but she was also afraid to stay here, with him. This thing between them, it was dangerous, but not as dangerous as leaving her to fend for herself. Almost two weeks ago, he'd had to drag himself up the steps of number 29 Grosvenor Square to offer for her, feeling as if he was staring down the barrel of a loaded rifle. But things were different now. She'd received a note threatening her life, and she was worried more about her sister's health than her own life. He respected that, and he would not do this in any way that marred her reputation any further. He reached in his jacket pocket and pulled out a piece of paper. I imagine this would help your sister come around. She couldn't say no to the notion of you staying here, at any rate. She gasped, looking down. But this is a special license, he nodded. It was the very one he'd obtained the morning after the literary salon. He'd taken to carrying it around in his pocket as a reminder to stay far away from her, though the reminder had gotten harder and harder as the days had dragged by. A wedding ceremony would permit us to place an announcement in the Times. Let the world know you have my protection. That should send a stern message to whoever did this. Surely there is another way, she protested, her voice close to a squeak. I cannot see one. And he wanted to make her lean this way, with a ferocity that had only partly to do with the danger. Whatever the reasons, the direction felt right. Little else did at the moment. I swear, Mary, I will do everything in my power to protect you. He stepped closer, taking up her hand. You did say you would do anything to keep your sister safe. But, that is, I would be nothing but a burden to you. Her eyes searched his. You don't want to marry me, she swallowed. Do you? He stepped toward her. Don't I? He turned himself over to the truth he'd been running from since that moment when she'd first told him no. Even if there wasn't an assassin's plot or the danger to your sister, I would want this. He lowered his head until his lips were brushing against her temple. I would want 
you, he murmured against her skin. Oh, she breathed, and as he pulled back, he could see that his gesture had brought a welcome bit of colour to her cheeks. But had it convinced her? I, that is... Her brow pinched, and he didn't, couldn't, say anything, even though his breath was close to bursting from his chest as he waited for her answer. I suppose, she said, her chin lifting up and then down, my answer would be... Yes, then. West wanted to pull her into his arms, to kiss her senseless, and make short work of the thin cotton that lay between them. Instead, he yanked on the bell pull. There was no time to waste, and a dozen things to do. But what if Eleanor still refuses to come here? she asked, wrapping her slender arms about her body. She thinks you are a degenerate. Well, then, we can invent a reason. Something unlikely to cause her harm, but dire enough to force her to seek temporary shelter here at Cardwell House. I suppose we might let loose a few rats in the foyer. Though it was a brilliant suggestion, a shudder worked its way down West's spine. God, no, he choked out. Not rats. Perhaps an infestation of fleas instead. If she is worried about the health of her unborn child, she will do what she must. He grabbed her hand and pulled her toward Wilson, who had materialized at the drawing room door. If he could keep her close, he could keep her safe. She would not die, not on his watch. And he would willingly kill any man or woman who thought otherwise. From the Diary of Miss Mary Channing, June the 13th, 1858. It seems I am to be married. I know, I can scarcely believe it myself. The entire thing feels like a torrid novel, where, in order to escape a villain, the heroine is forced to marry against her will, the circumstances spiralling beyond her control. But it isn't... Exactly against my will. It's something I have brought upon myself, and West is being exceedingly chivalrous to sacrifice himself in this way. I know I would never be his first choice for a wife, but, truth be told, even if the circumstances were different, I would have been tempted to say yes. And that has me worried for a different set of reasons. Chapter 15 Eleanor, for heaven's sake, you are the one who told me I needed to stop reading unrealistic novels and find a husband. My present circumstances have imperiled any future chance for a good match, and so I've decided to do something to erase the scandal hanging over me by the only means possible. What does it matter whom I marry, as long as it is done? But even as she shaped the lie, Mary anxiously watched Eleanor's face for signs of distress, worried that this unwelcome news, while better than word of a possible assassin on the household staff, might still be enough to send her sister into labour. God knew she was already doubting her own agreement to this crazy plan. What was she thinking, agreeing to marry West? The armed footman hovering in the hallway did little to settle her fears, though she was grateful that West had reluctantly agreed to her demand that he not accompany her himself. It was hard enough to have this conversation with Eleanor without giving it all away. The last thing she needed was a handsome, blonde scoundrel glowering over her shoulder. Thankfully, her sister seemed more interested in doubting her capacity for rational thought than succumbing to panic. While I can concede it is important for you to marry someone, and rather quickly at that, whom you marry matters a good deal when the man in question is that damned Westmore, Eleanor retorted. Well, he is the only one who has asked me, Mary pointed out. Eleanor waved a fist, clutching the scandal sheets, which had indeed printed the news of Mary's eventful night out. 
a fact which would not have happened again if you hadn't snuck out last night to dance with the scoundrel. Mary spread her hands. I can admit Westmore isn't the optimum choice for a husband. He's rude and crude and a bit too handsome for his own good. But the point is, I doubt I will receive another offer, particularly now that I've made the scandal sheets a second time. And I do so want to be a wife, a mother, like you. She smiled, hoping she looked at least a little besotted with the man. I cannot help but feel this is my only chance for happiness. A lie, that. Because beneath such a flimsy, fabricated argument ran a ribbon of solid steel. In the end, Mary hadn't hesitated to say yes, hadn't considered whether her answer might be based more on want than need. It might be unfathomable to her sister, but deep in her heart, in a place she didn't care to unlock for further dissection, she wanted to be Mrs. Geoffrey Westmore. Good heavens! No wonder her sister doubted her sanity. Eleanor began to look uncertain. You really like him? she asked dubiously. You do not mind his, er, uh, significant reputation? The blush that claimed Mary's cheeks did not have to be manufactured. Did she like him? She was afraid she might feel more for him than such a bland, simple emotion. But she was terrified, too. He was a man of a certain reputation. He made her feel things, deeply. And as worried as he seemed to be for her safety, she was equally worried for his. They were tracking potential killers, one of them the most powerful of peers. History had taught her that love, whether for a father, a brother, or, she feared, a future husband, could be lost in the space of a moment. And in spite of his assurances that he wanted to marry her, in spite of her own desires, she couldn't shake the feeling she was agreeing to a future heartache. I know he is a bit of a rogue, but perhaps I might yet shape him into a better man, she said softly, wondering if perhaps she was giving too much rein to her imagination once again. After all, heroines might change the men they loved in books, but as she was discovering, things were a bit more difficult when experienced in the flesh. In response to such nonsense, Eleanor gave a soft cry swatting at her arm. Mary looked down as something pinched her wrist as well. She could see a half-dozen fleas jumping across the lace edging of her sleeve and hid a relieved smile to see her future husband was a man who kept his promises, even when they were of the vermin-producing variety. Fleas! she cried, leaping to her feet. Fleas? Eleanor echoed looking dazed. There must be an infestation. But we don't even have a dog or a cat. Inspiration seized Mary. Well, you probably ought to get one, don't you think? Why would you say that? Because if you had a dog or a cat, you probably wouldn't have rats, which is no doubt where the fleas are coming from. As Eleanor turned pale, Mary pulled her sister to her feet. Come on, then. You can't stay here. We'll need to call an expert in to deal with it. She all but dragged Eleanor from the bedroom. But do not worry, you can stay with me tonight. Stay with you? Eleanor asked in confusion. Where? At Cardwell House. After all, where else would I spend my wedding night? Today? West's mother asked, her hand fluttering about her high lace collar. She looked around the drawing room in horror. Here? This evening, he affirmed. Six o'clock. But we've no flowers, his mother protested. And I'll have to send Cook to the market if we are to arrange a wedding luncheon. We do not require flowers. It wasn't as if this was a joyous celebration. Someone had threatened Mary's life 
The more planning that was put into this furtive ceremony, the more delay that was introduced, the more chance there was for something to go wrong. Or a wedding luncheon, he added, seeing his mother's forehead wrinkle in objection. We wish to keep everything simple. To have Mary gone so long from sight made his fingers twitch with worry. He'd accompanied her home, but had been forbidden to stand guard while she spoke with her sister. She'd insisted she needed privacy to convince her sister of this plan, and that his presence would only make things more difficult. Still, he'd dispatched his own footman to stand guard. He didn't trust any of Ashington's staff, and pressed his pistol into the man's hand, warning him to be on guard. He'd dutifully loosened the fleas on his way out, and he'd been on edge every moment since. His father laid a hand on his shoulder. Geoffrey, I can see you are eager to have this done, but could we not even wait until tomorrow? Why such hurry? For heaven's sake, it's a Sunday, and we need time to send an invitation to your sisters. I already sent a footman to Lucy's house a half hour ago, West countered, and Wilson is delivering an invitation to Clare as we speak. I am afraid it is too late to summon Lydia from Lincolnshire, but I will simply have to beg her forgiveness when we see her at Christmas. I have sent a note to Grant, although I suspect it will be a miracle if he wakes in time to read it. They have all been instructed to be here by six o'clock this evening. Never fear, there will be the appropriate number of witnesses. His father took off his glasses and peered myopically at West, as if trying to see his son for the very first time. For God's sake, Geoffrey, it isn't only about witnesses. We've not yet even met Miss Channing. I know you intended to marry the girl after that business with the gossip rags, but I thought she had refused you to our great relief. West bristled. Why should his parents be relieved Mary had initially refused him? And why would they hesitate to wish him well now? When you meet her, you will think she is wonderful, as I do. I'll have you know I feel fortunate to be marrying this woman. At their matching, shocked expressions, he realised then how odd such a thing sounded coming from him, and how odd it felt to realise that it wasn't even a lie. He did think she was wonderful. He was fortunate. The threats delivered by that note may have provided the means to this marriage, but he was by no means averse to the outcome. It isn't that we object to Miss Channing, his mother protested. It's that we haven't had a chance to meet her. You've never shown the slightest interest in a woman before, at least not seriously. She hesitated a telling moment. Does she know what she is getting in you? West realised then that perhaps they weren't worried about him so much as they were worried about her. He was glad, perhaps... <laughs>